Hey everyone, and welcome to the best horror stories of 2021. I'm not going to waste too much time here in the intro, we all know what we're here for. I'm going to say really quick that this list was not easy to put together. <laughs> I feel like this year we had so many good horror stories, so I did my best to rank it from my first favorite all the way to my 25th. I have done this for a number of years now, so I know for a fact I'm going to go to bed tonight and be like, that one story should have been in there, or this one story should have been higher up on the list, but I feel like I did a good job with it, so I hope you all enjoy it. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating as it helps out so much. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated as I post horror stories all of the time and we are going to be doing a lot in 2022. Actually, the very first video of 2022 is a video that has been requested hundreds of times on this channel. I'll let you all wonder what that is. Please be sure to turn on post notifications if you don't want to miss it. With all of that being said, happy holidays and happy new year. I hope you're all staying well. I hope you're all staying safe. And as always... I hope you all have a great night, and I'll see you all next year. Get real, man. This whole Shimmer Witch thing is totally bogus. I remember saying that because it was totally bogus. At least I thought so. Standing on the edge of Harrow Lake in our bare feet, toes in the water, heels on the hard clay bank, a smooth, Flat stone in each of our hands. The August sun was hot on our backs, but the lake was spring-fed and the water was freezing. Besides, we were too old for dumb ghost stories. If only I had known. Dude, come on. Dale pleaded, swatting at a deer fly buzzing around his ear. We've been talking about this since third grade. This'll probably be our last chance. Yeah, William. Johnny added. Please, humor us. This may well be the final time we share each other's company. Johnny wouldn't be starting college for a couple weeks yet, but he was already talking all fancy, calling me William instead of Billy, and wanting us to call him Jonathan. He'd even taken to smoking a pipe. It was annoying, but kind of funny at the same time. He was right, though. Next month, he would be off to his freshman year, and Dale had signed up for the Navy. I was the only one who'd be sticking around. I'd gotten a job as a welder at Cooper Metals Rights out of high school. Graduated on a Thursday afternoon and started working Monday morning. Even as a 19-year-old kid, I could lay down a stack of dimes like nobody's business. So Mr. Cooper paid me well. Most of the other guys my age were still living with their parents, flipping burgers or washing dishes. I was already renting my own apartment a one-bedroom over McKinney's shoe store, and had just bought a truck. It was used, but still cherry. Not a speck of rust. With Dale and Johnny both moving on, though, this would be the last time the three of us would have the chance to summon the Shimmer Witch. Harrow Lake was up in the high woods, a forest that covered the river bluffs overlooking our little berg. It was the source of Bull Run, which flowed downhill and emptied into the... Allegheny River on the eastern side of town. On a map, the lake was just an oblong blue blob with no name. We called it the lake because it was too big to be a pond. I have no idea where the Harrow part came from. There were no roads up there and even on the hottest summer days the spring water was too cold for swimming. So not many people bothered with the hike up to the lake. But there were places along its shore where a guy can reel in as many crappie and smallmouth bass as he can carry. I liked fishing, so Harrow Lake was on my short list of favorite spots. That's how Dale and Johnny tricked me into going up there. They said they wanted to do some fishing. They even brought their rods and tackle boxes. Yeah, fishing for the Shimmer Witch. Dale had laughed. As soon as I realized they were leading me along the trail to Beckoning Rock, a dark... Angular chunk of granite that stuck up from the water surface about 15 yards out. It looked kind of like a crooked finger, motioning for somebody to come closer, which 
I guess is how it got its name. According to the old campfire stories, three friends had to stand on the edge of the lake at Beckoning Rock with their toes in the water and their heels on the bank. Each one, in turn, had to say, Shimmer witch, shimmer witch, I summon thee. Come forth, choose one of three. Then skip their stone across the water three times and hit the rock. If everybody did everything right, the shimmer witch would come and bless one of the three with good health and long life. Me first, Dale began. Shimmer witch, shimmer witch, I summon thee. Come forth, come forth, choose one of three. He threw his stone with a side-armed flick of his wrist. It skipped three times before clacking against the beckoning rock and sinking. Yes, nailed it. Johnny shushed him before making a show of composing himself. Shimmer witch, shimmer witch, I summon thee. He enunciated the words as if he were reciting Shakespeare. Come forth, come forth, choose one of three. Johnny threw his stone. Three skips and a clack, just like clockwork. He turned to me, bowing slightly. I thought about flubbing it, getting the words wrong or missing the rock on purpose just to spite them for tricking me. But we'd been friends since first grade, and this probably would be the last time we were all together. I didn't want to disappoint them. Besides, if I screwed it up, they'd just keep badgering me to do it again and again until I did it right. Maybe, if I got it over with. We could do some actual fishing. What could it hurt? A lot, as it turns out. Everything. Shimmer witch, shimmer witch, I summon thee. Come forth, come forth, choose one of three. I muttered, then flicked my stone at the water. It skipped three times and struck beckoning rock. Bitchin'. Dale pumped his fist. We did it. And now what happens? Johnny asked. Dale shrugged. We wait, I guess. Nothing happens, I said. Maybe a little more harshly than I intended. Seriously, guys, it's a dumb ghost story they used to tell us in Cub Scouts. The Shimmer Witch isn't real. Can we please just go fish? The hair on my arms and the back of my neck stood up. The smell of ozone prickled my nostrils. I could taste the fillings in my teeth. Whoa, dig that, Dale said. Pointing at Johnny, whose fine, blonde hair stood out from his scalp. He looked like a dandelion gone to seed. That's when I knew. Get away from the water, I shouted, jumping back as the sky split open with a deafening crack. A pressure wave slammed me into the ground. Everything went dark. They found me wandering barefoot down the middle of Liberty Stream. The main drag through town, still clutching the charred remains of my rod and reel. I have no memory of hiking down from the high woods or the ambulance ride to the hospital. When I came around enough to speak coherently, I told the ER nurse about Dale and Johnny. She called the sheriff, who sent a couple of deputies up to Harrow Lake for a look around. They found my friends. Dale was floating face down in the lake. Johnny was lying on the shore. Both were dead and badly burned. The coroner conducted autopsies the next day. He ruled their cause of death as a lightning strike. There hadn't been a cloud in the sky. No sign of rain or storm. We buried my friends. It was a small town. Everybody pretty much knew everybody else, so there was a big turnout for both funerals. I got a lot of sympathy, pats on the shoulder, and kind words. That sort of thing. I was too numb to really register any of it. Mr. Cooper gave me three days extra sick leave to recuperate, but I didn't need it. Physically, I had never felt better. Even the dull ache in my shoulder, which I had thrown out pitching high school baseball the year before, was gone. The only effect I suffered from the lightning strike was a flickering in the corner of my eye, kind of like the way heat shimmers off the asphalt at the elementary school playground on hot days. At first, it really bugged me, but the doctor said it would probably go away on its own, so... I did my best to ignore it. Two weeks later, I asked Jenny McGregor out on a date. Jenny was working as a waitress at Carl's Tap and Grill. She was smart and funny. 
and when she smiled her nose would crinkle in a way that made me feel a little loopy. I don't know why I never noticed her when we were in school. Lucky for me, most of the other guys were just as dumb as I was. Carl's was out of my way, but I'd been stopping there every day after work, for whatever the special was and a beer, all summer long. There were definitely better places to eat in town, but none of them had Jenny. I had spent weeks trying to screw up enough courage to ask around. After what happened to Dale and Johnny, seeing how short life can be and all, I figured it was time to piss or get off the pot. If she shot me down, at least I'd have a reason to go someplace with decent food. Hey, listen. I said as I settled my bill at the register, I was thinking about going over to the Starlight this Friday night, catching that space movie everybody is talking about. If you're not doing anything, Jenny stepped back, eyes wide, hand pressed to her chest just below her throat. Why, William Andrew Thompson, the nerve of you, she scolded. A proper girl does not go to a drive-in with a boy on the first day. My mouth dropped open in shock. I stood there stupidly, holding the check and a five-dollar bill in my outstretched hand. Then she grabbed me by the wrist and laughed sounded like music. Her nose crinkled, and I felt like I had been walloped upside my head with a scented feather pillow. Lucky for you, I'm not a proper girl. She giggled and winked. Pick me up at seven? <laughs> yeah, great, was the best I could manage. I'll see you then. With that, I headed for the door. Hey, Billy, she called after me, pointing at the check and money still in my hand. I may not be proper, but you don't get free meals until at least the third day. I practically floated back to my apartment. The rest of the evening was a warm, fuzzy blur. I tried watching TV, but couldn't concentrate. Everything was a rerun anyway. All I could think about was Jenny, her musical laugh and that crinkly nose. But I did notice that flicker in the corner of my eye was gone. Things were really looking up. The next day at work, during morning break, I heard the news. Jenny was dead. She was taking a bath before going to bed and a hairdryer fell into the tub and electrocuted her. They said the fuse never blew, and the current ran through the water until it boiled. Three days later, Jenny's parents buried their daughter. The funeral was closed casket. The flicker was back. It was there when I woke that morning, before I had even heard about Jenny, and that night, I had a sex dream. Of course, I've had sex dreams before, but never like that one. It hurts. I don't remember any details of the dream itself, only the pain. You know, the little shocks of static electricity you get when you walk across a carpet and touch a doorknob. It was like that, but all over my body, moving back and forth across my chest and arms. Down my stomach to my... Well, you get the idea. Over the next couple of weeks, that flicker stayed in the corner of my eye. Sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right, but always there. It almost seemed to have a form, but I could never make it out. About that same time, I started to get a weird tingling sensation in my side when I was in bed. Or sometimes when I was kicked back on the couch just watching TV. It didn't hurt, but it was uncomfortable. So I finally broke down and saw the doctor. Of course, he couldn't find anything wrong. According to him, I was the healthiest person he'd seen in all his years of practice. He suggested, in a roundabout way, that maybe the problem might not be physical. He knew I'd been through some tough times recently and offered to prescribe me some Valium. I turned it down. I couldn't be throwing arcs in the wielding shop with my brain all fuzzed up on that crap. Like the flickering? It was something I'd just have to learn to live with. It was around the middle of October when I asked out Angie de Plaza. She was up from the city, working in the accounting department at Cooper Metals. Dark haired and olive skinned. She was exotic, at least to a small town hick like me. Most of the office workers ate lunch at their desks, but Angie always came down to the break room. The guys toned down the rough language and off-color jokes when she was around, but it never completely went away. It didn't seem to bother her. I guess, growing up in the city, 
She was used to it. We had a few conversations in passing. Then she started sitting with me at my table while she ate. Angie always seemed to mention that she hadn't had any decent pasta since she'd moved here. People had told her Rudy's had the best spaghetti around, but it was too fancy for a girl to eat there alone. It may not be the dullest tool in the shed, but not the sharpest either. It took me a while to get the hint. So, you want to go to Rudy's with me and try the spaghetti? I finally asked. She laughed. Everybody in the break room turned to look. I felt like an idiot, misreading her signals like that. Yeah, she said. I want to go to Rudy's with you and try the spaghetti. Maybe I can teach you how to sweet talk a girl while we're at it. Meet me there Saturday night at 8. Saturday night, I arrived at Rudy's 10 minutes early, wearing the same jacket and tie that I had worn to my high school graduation. They were the only nice clothes I had, and after the dopey way I'd asked her out, I wanted to make a better impression. Angie never showed. It was just after 9 when I finally gave up. I wound up stopping at a Lawson's on the way home for a loaf of bread, a jar of mustard, and a package of chipped ham. A perfect meal for losers that got stood up. Monday morning, Mr. Cooper came out on the floor and made the announcement. Angie had been killed in a freak accident Saturday afternoon. She'd been electrocuted by a short in her curling iron. There was another sex dream. This one worse than before. I woke up screaming. I felt like my chest, shoulders, and groin had been set on fire. As I lay there panting, I felt that familiar tingling sensation on my left side. The side of my bed that was empty. It was like something, or someone, was pressed up against me, snuggling me almost. In the dim light of the clock and radio on the bedside table, I could see the flicker in the lower left corner of my eye. I tried to study it while staring straight up at the ceiling. It's hard to see something without looking directly at it, but I swear, that shimmery flicker was in the shape of a woman. Curled against my side, everything seemed to click together inside my head. Shimmer witch, I whispered. Tiny jolts of static traced a path across my chest, up my neck, and to my lips. I could see the little blue flashes in the dark, but that was crazy. Thinking some sort of electrical witch had attached herself to me and killed any woman I took a shine to, in a fit of jealous rage. Within a few days, I had myself convinced it was just my imagination. Thanksgiving changed all that. The Shimmer Witch, whatever she was, was real, and she didn't want any other woman in my life. Mom always put on a big spread for Thanksgiving, even though it was just the three of us, her, me, and Dad. There was turkey, of course, stuffing, gravy, mashed potatoes, canned yams, and a homemade pecan pie baked special for me. I've never cared much for pumpkins, so she always made me a pecan pie. After we ate, I went to the kitchen to help mom put up the leftovers. More to make sure she packed a drumstick and one of the Tupperware containers she was sending home with me, then out of any desire to be helpful. While I was divvying up the dinner rolls, mom stopped scooping stuffing into a burp and sealed container, turned to me with a tear in her eye, and wrapped me up in a bear hug. I'm so sorry about what happened to your friends, she said into my shoulder. And Jenny, and that girl from work, it's so much to go through and you're still so young. She held the hug until I started shuffling my feet at the awkwardness. Then she let go, put her hands on either side of my face, and stood on her tiptoes to kiss my forehead. I gave her my best lopsided grin. Yeah, I love you too, Mom. Dad yelled for me to hurry up because the game was starting, saving me from the you'll always be my little boy speech that I knew was coming next. Two plays after the kickoff, Mom came into the living room, fists on her hips, scolding us for having the TV up so loud that she couldn't even hear herself think. It was another one of our Thanksgiving traditions. As she bent down to reach for the volume knob, that flicker in the corner of my eye shot across the room and into the TV screen. Mom, no, I yelled. The screen exploded. Mom dropped to the floor, falling heavily on her backside. Oh my, she said. 
Then the blood came. We spent the rest of the afternoon in the emergency room. While the doctor picked shards of glass out of her leg. Dabbing the small cuts with mercury chrome. And suturing the larger ones. At one point, he held up his thumb and forefinger. About half an inch apart, shaking his head. Missed the femoral artery by that much. He said. There was suspicion in my mom's eyes when she looked at me. She tried to hide it, but I saw... Even worse, I saw fear, too. I stayed away from women as much as I could after that. It wasn't hard. People knew I was sweet on Jenny, and it was pretty obvious to everybody in the shop I had a thing for Angie. Mom's accident actually made the local paper. Girls would cross the street when they saw me coming. I was the most ineligible bachelor in the county. Nobody ever accused me of anything outright, but I could tell by the sidelong glances. By the way, conversations would stop abruptly when I entered the break room or the coffee shop that people suspected me of something. Even my own mother was afraid of me. Dad didn't argue when I gave him a lame excuse for not making Christmas. I spent New Year's alone in my apartment, watching Dick Clark with a six-pack of rolling rock. The flicker at the edge of my vision remained ever-present. The tingle against my side when lying in bed or relaxing on the couch became a constant thing, and I still had those painful sex dreams at least twice a week, sometimes more. That spring, I went back to the doctor. I didn't tell him everything, but I told him enough that he offered me another Valium script. This time, I took it. Didn't help. With no better ideas, I went to the library. Maybe I could find some information on the Shimmer Witch, some local legend or old wives' tale that might give me a clue as to how to get rid of her. I forgot Miss Evie was the librarian. Miss Evie was probably the final fantasy of every schoolboy in town. I know she was mine, proximally built with blonde curls cascading over her shoulders. She was the fantasy of most of the men in town too, married or otherwise. Miss Evie was seated behind her desk, slipping sign-out cards back into return books when I walked in. A white silk blouse struggled to contain her ample breasts. Her hair was pulled up into a loose bun with a single stray curl hanging over her forehead. A pair of reading glasses were perched on the end of her Barbie doll nose. She smiled and nodded as I hurried past, headed for the card catalog. It was getting on towards closing time. We were the only two people in the building. I had gone through the SHI and SHO drawer twice with no luck, and was working my way through WIT and WIV when she came up behind me. Can I help you find something? She asked. I spun around, almost dumping the entire drawer of cards on the floor. Oh, uh, maybe. I stammered. I'm looking for... This is going to sound stupid, but I'm looking for anything on the Shimmer Witch. The Shimmer Witch, huh? Miss Evie folded her arms under her breast and tapped a red, lacquered nail on her chin. I tried to look anywhere but at her. She must have been twice my age, but I still found her incredibly attractive. Her blue eyes were a sea a guy could happily drown in. That's a local legend. I don't think anyone has written any books about it. But there might be a newspaper story. If I remember correctly, follow me. She spun on her heel and walked away, hips swaying hypnotically. I tried not to look. God help me, I tried. She led me to a row of microfiche readers at the back of the building. I waited while she went into the storage stacks. A few minutes later, she returned with a tray of film rolls. Try this one, she said, handing me a roll. I think you'll find what you're looking for somewhere in the early to mid-April editions of that year. As she leaned over my shoulder to show me how to load and operate the machine, the side of her breast brushed against my cheek, and I nearly moaned. All those adolescent fantasies came flooding back into my brain. Alrighty then, you're all set. Take your time. I've got to run off a bunch of flyers for the book fair next week, so I'll be closing up late. To my relief, she turned and strode away, her heels echoing on the marble floor. A moment later, I heard the hum and whir of the Xerox machine warming up. Scrolling through the microfiche, 
I tried to think of anything other than Miss Evie. That got easier when I found the headline. Two dead, one injured. After freak lightning strike at Harrow Lake. It ran. The article was dated April 8th, 1936. And described a shopkeeper finding a local teenager wandering down the middle of the streets in a perplexing state of confusion. Muttering the words, Shimmer Witch. When he regained his senses, he told authorities that he and two friends had gone to Harrow Lake to test an old legend. Searchers found the badly burned bodies of the boy's companions, apparently killed by lightning. As I read, I was only partially aware that the flicker was gone from the corner of my eye. I should have been paying more attention. Before I got to the part of the article where they gave the victims names, there was a loud pop and everything went dark. Hello? I called out. Miss Evie? I'm still in here. Carefully making my way through the deep shadows cast by the bookshelves, hoping Miss Evie hadn't forgotten about me and locked me in for the night, I noticed a faint orange glow against the tin ceiling. Coming around the corner of the children's section, I saw Miss Evie lying on the floor, her hand wielded to the frayed 220 volt power cord of the Xerox machine. All the lights were out, so the fuses must have blown, but her body still twitched from the current flowing through it. Sparks shot from the back of the copier, landing on books and loose papers. Licks of fire were already spreading across their worn spines and dry pages. There was an extinguisher hanging from a hook behind the desk. I tried to grab it, but as soon as my fingers touched the metal handle, a jolt of static electricity knocked me off my feet. Completely stunned. I sat there on the floor as Miss Evie's white silk blouse smoldered. Her blonde curls burst into flames. I saw those deep blue eyes explode out of their sockets as her skin blackened and curled away from her skull. I think I might have screamed. The fire spread unnaturally fast. I picked myself up off the floor and stumbled out the front doors, lurching down the stone steps and halfway up the block. I flung myself into a phone booth and called the fire department. They got there fast, but not fast enough. All they could do was keep the flames from spreading to the hardware store next door. That night, I had the most brutal sex dream yet. When I woke, there were tiny burns on my chest and arms, and my pubic hair had been singed down to the skin. There was an investigation into the fire, of course. Both the fire marshal and the county sheriff had a lot of questions for me, but the evidence backed my story. And why wouldn't it? I told them the truth. I just left out any mention of the Shimmer Witch. In my last conversation with the sheriff, he pointed out that a lot of people around me were meeting their unfortunate accidents, and that tended to make folks nervous. He suggested that a fellow with my welding skills could make a good living working at one of the steel mills down in the big city. Everybody needs a fresh start once in a while, he said. I took his advice. There weren't too many people for me to say goodbye to, but I did stop by my parents' place on the way out of town. Dad came out to the driveway to shake my hand. He got a jolt of static for his trouble. Mom waved from the kitchen window. That hurt. I don't blame her, but still. It was the last time I ever saw them. Both died many years later. Dad went first. Mom followed not long after. I didn't go to either funeral, but... I had a good reason not to. You see, that day Dale, Johnny, and I went to the Harrow Lake and summoned the Shimmer Witch was August 20th, 1977. Chronologically, I am 63 years old. Physically, I'm still 19. I have not aged a day since. I can't die either. A few years after I left town, I had a bad motorcycle accident. An oncoming cold truck ran me off the road when the driver took a blind curve too wide. I hit the guardrail and went over an embankment, smashing into every tree on the way down. I wound up at the bottom of a ravine, choking on blood from a punctured lung, with my legs twisted unnaturally beneath me and a bone poking out of my forearm. The truck driver probably never saw me and, on a back road like that, nobody was going to come along anytime soon. I knew I was going to die, so I closed my eyes and waited. When I woke, I was still covered in dirt and blood, but my legs were straight, 
All my bones were back on the inside, and I could breathe just fine. My bike was trash, so I had to walk eight miles to a gas station. Other than that, I was just as fine as frog hair. There have been times since then when I tried to take matters into my own hands. That didn't work out so well. When I tried pills, I woke up in a pool of my own vomit. When I tried hanging myself, I woke up on the floor with frayed bits of a charred rope around my neck. When I tried a gun, I woke up with a melted lump of slag between my feet. The sex dreams, after each attempt, were, well, punishing. It's been 44 years since I've lived like this. No family, no friends, no lovers. She kills any woman I take a liking to. I'm not sure how she'd react to me having guy friends, and I don't want to find out. I've been completely isolated, always on the move from town to town, job to job, trying to stay ahead of the suspicious looks and whispered rumors when I never seem to age. I can't even look at porn without her zapping me in the nads as soon as I fall asleep. The Shimmer Witch wants me all to herself and she just won't let go. This has got to end. I think I may have found a way. If the Shimmer Witch won't let her chosen one go, if she won't even let him die, what happened to the kid before me? The one from the newspaper in 1936. I've been doing a lot of research lately, but not all the records have been computerized. The internet was a dead end, so I had to do it the old-fashioned way. I had to go back to my hometown, to the library. I was looking for obituaries from the end of August 1977. There was a possibility the kid had moved away, just like I did. And there would be no record of him there. But people didn't travel much in those days. It was a long shot, but what did I have to lose? Things have changed some. Harrow Lake and Beckoning Rock are still there, but much of the high woods are gone. Cut back to make room for subdivisions. You know. The kind they name after all the trees they chop down. Willow Grove, Maple Way, Oak Hill Estates, that sort of thing. There are plenty of roads up there now. In town, the old Lawson's was replaced by a Sheets and Cooper's Metals is shuttered and empty. But Carl's Tap and Grill is still there. Go figure. I stopped in for lunch. Couldn't help myself. The food is just as bad as it ever was. Rudy's is still there. But the only thing about the place that hasn't changed is the name. I also saw some familiar faces. Old classmates and neighbors that I recognized despite their age. From the looks I was getting, a few of them thought that I looked familiar too, so I kept my head down and avoided eye contact. The library they'd built to replace the one that had burned down was a soulless brick and a glass block, full of fluorescent lights and stain, resistant carpet, nothing like the stately sandstone castle that vaulted ceilings and marble floors that I remembered. Unfortunately, the town no longer had a hot librarian. There was an older guy, balding, gray-haired, and stoop-shouldered, seated behind the front desk. He was Emery Dawson, according to the nameplates on the counter. I remember little Emmy. He was two grades behind me in school. Emery showed me to the microfiche viewers, apologized for the dust, and got me the film for the June, July, August 1977 editions of the County Bugle. I assured him I knew how to operate the reader. Huh, he said. Well, good for you. Not many young folks know how to work these old machines. Everybody uses computers these days, don't you know? He gave me a curious look. I could tell he was dancing on the edge of recognition, so I smiled, nodded, and turned away, busying myself with loading the reader. It took me a while to find what I was looking for because it wasn't in the obituaries. I ran across the story by accident. When my finger slipped on the scroll knob and I overshot the orbits on page 3 and wound up on page 6, the headline read, Local Hermit, age 40 years overnight. It was just three paragraphs. His name was Henry Werner. Lived in a tar paper shack near Sweet Creek. A dozen or so houses in a gas station clustered around a crossroads about five miles north of town. According to local gossip, his youthful appearance was attributed to having been struck by lightning as a teenager. 
Mr. Werner, had refused to speak to the reporter, but another resident was quoted as saying, Yeah, I seen Henry come into Murphy's garage for cigarettes. It was shocking how he got so old so fast. I asked him about it, but all he'd say is, Damned witch finally left me. The byline was dated August 21st, 1977. It seems the Shimmer Witch won't let me go until she chooses another, so if you're feeling froggy, you go right ahead and jump in. I won't mind. I'm not going to tell you where Harrow Lake is. That would make me complicit, and I'd rather not have that on my conscience. But if you do some poking around, you'll find it. I've left enough clues. Take two friends, stand with your toes in the water and your heels on the bank. Say the words and skip your stones. Make sure they hit beckoning rock. Come on, must be somebody out there who wants to be immortal. I'm a car salesman. Not necessarily by choice. It's something that just kind of fell into place. I work at a local dealer near the mall in town. One of my dad's been running since before I was born. He loves cars and he loves to sell them. I guess which sums up about why I work there. It's not a bad gig. And I've been doing it long enough to get pretty good at it. I've had some pretty good sales in the past. Some felt a little scummier than others, but hey, it's the way the trade works. I don't make much money if the cars don't sell, so it's in my best interest to do so. I was sitting at my desk when it started. It was a decent, but overall a slow day at the lot. The weather was nice, but I didn't get much of a chance to enjoy it because I hadn't had any sales all day. Not one. No young couple looking for a cheap ride. No bachelor looking for a lifted truck or sports car. No family scouting a replacement minivan. Nothing. So I spent most of the day at my desk, twiddling my thumbs, listening to the radio, eyeing the lot in case someone happened to wander over. I was ready to get a sale. Be productive instead of sitting around. My dad was out for the day. Something about a golf outing with a competitor. Love that stuff. Since I had the building to myself, I was hoping to put in some decent numbers, but on this particular day, there was no one. I've had a lot on my mind recently and the business would help clear the chaos in my head. So there I sat, dicking around as the hours crept by. That was until... He showed up. I watched him arrive by bus, getting off the shuttle at the stop through the window. I had nothing going on, so I watched him after he showed up. He got off the bus and looked straight at the dealership. A slow, almost limp of a walk starting as soon as he saw my building. My first thought of him was your stereotypical boomer dad. Had to be pushing 60. What was left of his wispy hair has gelled and combed across a colossal bald spot. His eyes were shielded by bronze aviator glasses, and his outfit looked like it was ripped straight from an 80s business catalog. Khakis and old leather shoes. A floral print button-up that barely contained a large beer belly. And a Navy member's only jacket to tie it all together. He had his hand stuffed in his pockets of the jacket. And he was on a mission. Well, he drove closer to the dealer, I combed my hair, spit out my gum, and straightened my tie. It was evident he was coming this way, but he was heading straight to the lot, probably to browse. I just took that as my cue to meet him. I pushed through the door and into the sunlight, feeling the breeze for the first time today. He was just standing there now, scanning. He didn't linger on anything very long. I would have to do some digging to get this sale moving. How are we doing today? I asked. The name's Mark. I'll be your liaison today. Something I can help you find? He just stood there ignoring me for a second, looking at the cars at his own uninterrupted pace. With the aviators and the double chin, 
He looked like a grumpy frog. There was something unsettling about him from the get-go. I'm looking for a car, he said. Can't seem to find it. See my third dealer today. He said plainly, very to the point. I clapped my hands together, ready to start the routine I had done a hundred times. Well, this is your lucky day. We currently have an abundance of... I'm not here for the sales pitch, kid. He cut me off, taking slow steps toward the shiny hatchbacks. Ah, uh, well, certainly there's some way I can help. I know all the makes and models in this lot. We happen to be sitting on quite a bit, and let me tell you, now is a good time to be on the market. I started, turning around to face the luxury sedans. Are we looking for something sleek, or cruising, or maybe something a little sportier? Surely an old top like yourself would. I turned back to see he was already walking away. I felt a twinge of frustration. I'd have to work a little harder to get this guy to play ball. I scratched my head and caught up with him, walking quicker so I could lean. The mini SUVs are one of our most popular items. Plenty of room for passengers. Cargo in the back. All-wheel drive, too. I can't recommend that enough. You know how winter can be around here. I said. The man just looked ahead, chewing his lip a little. The wind blew at his comb strands, but he didn't seem to mind. Heated seats, Bluetooth, some of these even have TVs in them. They make the commute more enjoyable. Satisfying. No interest on the first 12 months if you buy before the fall. We're at the tail end of our summer sale, but there's still time. Even if you need time to think something over, I'll get you taken care of. What do you do for a living if you don't mind me asking? Finally, he looked my direction, but his face was still blank. Almost like stone. I was a car salesman. I'm retired now. He kept walking. Gotta be fucking kidding me. I thought to myself, this guy already knew the game. The tactics wouldn't work here. I'd have to follow him around like a lost dog and lap up whatever he fed if I wanted any kind of sale today. We could be here all day, and he still might not get anything. I kept the enthusiasm going. You don't say. Anywhere around here? Maybe you know my father. I asked. The man had finally stopped at our little cluster of trade-ins from past transactions. The man looked them over one by one. The sun shining of his sunglasses as he panned slowly like an owl. He came to an old Buick and stopped, fumbling in the pockets of his windbreaker. He pulled out a pack of cigarettes and a Zippo. Ah, uh, sir. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to put those away. We have a smoke-free premises. I said. But he continued anyway. He leisurely fished a cigarette out of the pack and lit it, taking a big drag before pointing to the Buick. The Le Sabre. Give me the keys. He blew the smoke out at me and I waved it away. I looked at the car, a creeping anxiety washing over me. It was a 98 Buick Le Sabre Limited, silver with tinted windows. This car, of all things, was this a game? Pardon? Trade-in? I assure you we can find something better to suit you. Walk with me. There's quite a bit I can show you. What's the deal with the price? 8,000? It blew books for five tops. I know you heard me. Get the fucking keys. He looked at me and took another drag. His tonal shift was alarming. I found myself glancing around. We were still alone. Uh, yeah, yes. Right away. Let me get those for you. I briskly returned to the office for the keys. I was sweating a little, trying to wrap my head around the old man's choice. The Le Sabre of all cars. I thought about calling my dad, but decided against it. He would flip out, ask too many questions, want to know every little detail about what was going on. When I came back, he was peering through the windows of the car, 
His cigarette snubbed out on the pavement. I wanted to scowl at it, but I kept cool. I still wanted to get something out of this guy. I just had to figure out how. Looks clean. Really clean. He said as he peered through the driver's side window. They all are. I said, scratching the back of my head as I looked across the lot. The SUVs wouldn't do it. It was too old for a really smart car. I had a feeling the digital stuff would scare him away. Maybe the Lincolns. The old man was looking at the paper that was taped to the inside of the windshield. The one below the large for sale sign. It displayed the mileage and terms of sale. As is. No warranty. Stuff like that. It was a trade-in after all. Well, let's take a look, shall we? He was leaning on the car now, waiting for me to unlock it. Sure thing. I smiled and worked the key, looking inside myself to make sure nothing was amiss. The front seat floors were still covered with paper shields to ward off shoe scuffs, and the back seat was nice and clean, just as I hoped. Here she is. I reluctantly held the door for him, and he ducked his head in. It was hard to tell what he was thinking. It was those damn sunglasses. You couldn't see anything behind them. He chewed his lip as he looked up and down the dash. Then his gaze held on the seats. They were tan leather. A clean shine still catching the light. Leather seats. Very clean. Back in my day, these used to drive the girls wild. He said under his breath, and I started to feel uncomfortable. So many skirts in these back seats. He clicked his tongue and ran a finger down the clean leather. He looked at his fingertip and rubbed it against his thumb as if trying to feel dirt. Oh yeah? Is that so? I played along, wiping sweat from my brow. Yes, of course, he continued. You ever get a dame in the back seat of one of these, kid? He asked, a grin forming on his wrinkled, stubbled chin. It gave me the chills. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I gave a nervous laugh. Say, a few rows down we have the Lincoln Town Car. A few of them, actually. Even in silver, too. Of course, he wasn't listening. With a labored wheeze, he leaned in and hit the button for the trunk. There was a soft clink when the trunk popped, and he immediately walked around me toward the rear of the car. He stood in front of the trunk with it cracked a little, as if he didn't want to open it. He ran his thumb over the paint, then over the temporary license plate. When his thumb reached the dealership sticker, he stopped for a moment. The sticker was the silhouette of a diamond. He looked at me, still frowning. There it is. Namesake of the business. You know. Diamond deals. It was my dad's idea. I still think it's pretty cheesy if I'm being honest. I said, unable to shake the feeling of nervousness. The old man seemed taken aback. Ah, uh, yeah. There's that. He looked at the sign, then lifted the lid of the trunk. As he stared in the trunk, I found myself following and looking as well. The same silent stare... The trunk was empty, and there was a clear view to the little carpet hash that led to the spare. The old man ran a finger over the carpet. Plenty of room in there, isn't there? He asked. He was looking tired. Perhaps the sun was getting to him. Yeah, I suppose there is. Good going to town car. I guess. Plenty of room for groceries. Or a woman. He spoke stood the hair up on the back of my neck. Excuse me? I asked. You heard me. He looked at me, then slammed the trunk shut. It was loud and I jumped a little. Sir, I think it's time I asked you to leave. I stammered, feeling a ball in my throat. I instinctively felt for my phone, and the old man stared and scratched at his stubbled chin. Leave? Who said I was leaving? I'm not finished here. He pushed past me and walked back to the driver's side. He dug in his pocket again, 
this time pulling a full half pint of whiskey. He twisted the cap and broke the seal before taking a swig. I could only watch in disbelief. Hey, I don't know what the hell you think you're doing, but it's time for you to go. I'm calling the police. I pulled out my phone while he screwed the cap back on. Don't worry. I'll call them. He said, pocketing the whiskey and pulling out his own flip phone. What? I asked. I said, I'll call them. Don't worry about it, kid. I'll handle it. He flipped his phone open. I mulled it over in my head, sweating more and more as my confusion built. Oh, wait, that's not necessary. We can figure something out, I'm sure. I put mine away and held my hands up. The old grumpy man looked at me, and after a time his phone snapped shut. He dug out another cigarette and lit it. I scratched my sweaty head and looked around, but it was just on the lawn. When's the last time you drove this, kid? He asked. What? The Buick. You ever take her for a spin? After hours? When daddy's not looking? He growled, his voice getting lower like he was whispering. What? No, I've never driven this car before. I told him. Huh. <laughs> That's funny. All of these cars in the lot, and the only one without dust on the paint is this one. Still got shine on the tires. Why you spray that on there? Pretty it up. Why do that if it's overpriced? You only pretty up the front liners, kid. He was moving closer. The cigarette smoke dancing on the wind. I told you, I haven't driven this car. Only around the lot like the others. Another thing, kid. The paper on the window said it got 130,715 miles. He rasped. Yeah, and? I demanded. Dash says 747. He took another drag. So what? The car fax is off then. It's 32 miles. Who gives a shit? I'll print out a new one. I told you the cars get moved around. Yeah. Maybe a block or so, unless there's a maintenance issue. But you know what? There's a couple of bars in town, only a few miles away. You ever take her out for a spin, kid? Clean her up? Impress the girls? He was taking another drink. My hands were starting to shake. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. Sure you don't. Let me tell you a story, kid, real quick. Like I said, I was a salesman too. I get it. I was there once. I was damn good too. But I tell you what else. I was a total piece of shit husband. And a worse father. I didn't give a damn about my kid. Not really. They were just things that happened. The cars on the other hand. I lived for those cars. That's what I loved. Got divorced a long time ago. Me and the wife never talk. My daughter, she must be a little younger than you. He said. He was talking much faster now, raising his voice. Anyway, my ex calls me yesterday. We haven't spoken in years. She tells me our kid hasn't come home. She thinks she's missing. She said to call the cops. He didn't do shit as far as I know. Yeah, so what? What's that got to do with me, huh? I was getting loud, my voice echoing in the lot. I could feel the anxiety settling in. Thing is, her date picked her up that night, like a gentleman. Car all done up, spick and span, was the last time she saw her. Said he was driving an old silver Buick. Said there was a sticker on the bumper, like a symbol. She wasn't sure. It was dark out, but as it turns out, on the third dealer, I found it. I looked at the large spinning sign. The glimmering letters, Diamond Deals. I couldn't breathe. So I think it's time to come clean. He took a last drag and snubbed it out. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think you do. Maybe your daddy ain't quite figured it out, but he will. 
You know you mark the price up on that car to keep the eyes off of it. Fuck you. I clenched my fists. Sure, you only put a couple miles on. Far is not that far, but I tell you what. You know what else isn't far away? The river. You could be there in ten minutes. So what happened, kid? You pushed too far? She rejects you? You're wrong. I said, tears welling in my eyes. No, I'm not. This car is probably the cleanest on the lot. It's been vacuumed at least three times. And the outside's shiny and new. You don't wash the trade-ins, kid. They're not worth the effort. How long till daddy finds out? You think he'll like that? You messing up that bad? It was an accident. Was all I said. Brat like yourself. Maybe not used to hearing the word no. She hurt your feelings. Take you down a peg? Big man like yourself? I told you it was an accident. I felt my knees buckling. Suddenly, it was hard to stand. Sure thing, Ken. I'm gonna cut to the chase. I'm calling the cops either way. Either now or when I'm on the way home on the next bus. They'll take everything I know and they'll find her. Wherever she is. But it ain't gonna be quick. They'll drag you and your father through the mud through the whole process. You'll be finished. He said and my legs could no longer hold the weight of the stress and guilt. I started sobbing, burying my face in my hands. What do you want me to do? I can't undo what I've done. At some point he was standing next to me, getting one last thing from his pockets. Through tears and shame I could see the pistol. A little 38 snub nose. I won't lie and tell you I was there for my daughter growing up. I wasn't. I know that. But she was still my daughter. I'm just doing what's right. It's the least I can do. But I'm no killer. You want to know what I want you to do? Atone for your mistake. Make sure it doesn't happen again. Seems like a better alternative to carrying the weight and rotting in prison, don't it? Either way, it's up to you. I did my part. He said and held the gun out. I took it and cradled it in my trembling hands. The old man sighed, retrieved the whiskey and downed it in a large gulp. He winced behind his glasses and there was a glimmer of a tear behind the lens. He tossed the bottle into the parking lot and walked away, lighting a cigarette without another word. Through puffy eyes I watched him go, the same limp taking him to the bus stop he arrived on. Without as much as a look, he sat on the bench and waited for the next shuttle. I climbed to my feet and went back in the office. I collected my things and locked up for the day, closing the dealership early. When I came back out, he was gone. The bus bench was empty, like he was never even here. The pistol in my pocket and the booze bottle in the parking lot reminded me of his visit, almost assuring me of... What had to be done next? I got in the Buick and drove home. It took me some time to process it all, but by the time I got home, I knew what I had to do. I sat down and wrote this, hopefully to clear up any questions for those that come looking for me. I know I'm a piece of shit, and I did what I did. There's nothing I can do to fix that now. I'm sorry. Really. I was in denial at first, and I tried my best to cover it up because I was scared. Scared of what I did and the repercussions that would follow if it was discovered. I've got a bunch of missed calls on my phone now. Too many to go through, and to be honest, there's no need. I've made my decision. There's a little bar on the outskirts of town called The Sixth Shot, where a little red neon sign... If you head east for eight miles or so, there's a small bridge with a river running underneath. She's under the bridge. I tried to use some rocks to weigh her down. I hope she's still there. I'm sorry. She deserved much better. Well, that's about all I have to say. I've learned from my mistake. I won't hurt anybody again. I got the pistol on the desk now, and once I post this... I'm going to take the deal the old man gave me. At least that way I can try and set things right. 
did say he was a damn good salesman. Goodbye. I have a close friend who's a psychiatrist. She mostly just teaches these days. From a textbook that she wrote, no less. But back when she was still practicing, this friend's specialty was the treatment of specific phobias. You know, patients with an irrational fear of heights or needles or spiders. Fun stuff like that. That's why I lovingly refer to her as Dr. Scary, a nickname which she absolutely adores, no matter what that lying bitch tells you. One night when we were both especially turnt, I asked Dr. Scary if she ever encountered a patient with a phobia that managed to scare even her. We were seated directly beside each other on the wooden bench swing suspended from her back porch. But Dr. Scary didn't look at me when she replied. Her gaze remained fixed on the shadowy expanse of her well-manicured backyard as she scoffed and slowly nodded. And then she said, The elevator people. When this particular patient, a 39-year-old medical supply salesman who we'll call Simon, first showed up at Dr. Scary's office, he had listed fear of elevators as the reason why. Needless to say, but if that was an accurate summation of Simon's issue, we wouldn't be here. It all started almost a year prior. Well, Simon was at a conference in Las Vegas. He was there with his sales manager, scoping out the latest innovations in pacemaker technology and hoping to find a distributor willing to haggle. The trip really was all business, too. Simon had never been much for gambling, and the live shows gave him a headache. The conference might as well have been in boys for all he cared. Simon noted that the initial elevator ride up to his hotel room that night had been perfectly uneventful. Though his flight into McCarran had been delayed, of course. Simon had barely made it to the hotel with enough time for a quick shower and change of clothes before the meet and greet in the lounge at 8pm. It was 5 after when he finally re-emerged from the room in a flurry, tie still untied and his blazer draped over one arm. As Simon hurried over to the bank of elevators at the other end of the hall, he got a text from his sales manager, who sounded annoyed and was currently waiting for him down in the lobby. Simon hit the button to call for an elevator as he began to frantically tap out a response text, explaining the flight delay. There was a mechanical ding as the middle elevator's metal doors slid open in his periphery. Simon started inside the elevator as he finished his text and hit send. He looked up to smile politely at the other passengers on board, and that is when Simon went rigid, his half-formed smile freezing in place as a tingling surge of fear temporarily overrode control of his body. To his right, a naked and skeletally thin old man stood grinning back at Simon. The man was completely hairless. His malformed bald head was the shape of a used pencil eraser. He didn't have eyebrows or facial hair or even pubic hair to hide a fraction of the small yet, noticeably erect junk jutting out from between his shriveled legs like the head of some hungry, flesh-colored turtle. To Simon's left stood a woman in a tattered gray dress. She appeared to be hairless as well and had a similarly deranged grin stretched across the front of her similarly bald and oddly shaped head. She sported a pronounced hunchback and had glimmering feline eyes. Simon bewildered gaze darted from the naked man to the female hunchback, then down to the bald child peeking out from behind her. The woman shoved the child back out of sight as the naked man attempted to grab Simon by his face. Seeing those grimy fingers darting toward him was enough to finally snap Simon out of his shock, and he just barely managed to evade the naked man's grasp with a single leaping jump back out of the elevator. He hadn't moved like that since college, and every joint and tendon in Simon's legs was currently screaming at him. Fortunately, at that moment, adrenaline was making it impossible for Simon to register much of anything aside from the elevator doors sliding closed in what felt like slow motion. Just as the lunging naked man was about to reach between them, the dumbstruck Simon was still standing there, quietly panting and staring at those same closed elevator doors a full minute later when an attractive blonde woman approached from the other end of the hallway. She gave Simon a wave as she neared, but he didn't even seem to register her presence. The woman's expression went from confused to annoyed, 
as she noticed that the button to call the elevator still needed to be pushed. Simon shook off his daze and managed to take the next elevator all the way down to the lobby without further incident. If you didn't count several awkward glances from the attractive woman who rode down with him. He was only fashionably late for the rendezvous with his sales manager, who was already busy talking up several of the reps waiting in line for the meet and greet. The open bar and a name conversation helped Simon put what had just happened to him out of his mind for the moment and, to his surprise, it actually turned out to be a rather lucrative evening. So much so that, about an hour in, Simon's manager gave him a pat on the back and announced that he was going to officially clock out for the night to, quote, start focusing on who I'm a fuck. Still feeling a bit jet-lagged and generally exhausted from his earlier encounter, Simon decided to take this opportunity to get some much-needed rest before tomorrow when the real work needed to get done. As he exited the hotel lounge and made his way back across the lobby, Simon spotted a pair of Vegas newlyweds forcefully making out while they waited for an elevator. A wave of relief washed over him when Simon realized he wouldn't have to ride back up to his room alone. An elevator arrived a few moments later, and Simon hit the button for the 10th floor as he entered. The couple followed him on, and the young guy leaned away from his better half just long enough to poke the button labeled 3. Simon's stomach began to churn as he realized he was going to have to ride for seven whole floors by himself. When the car stopped to let the couple out, he was tempted to exit with them and take the stairs the rest of the way, but the lovebirds had seen him hit the button for ten already. Following them off now, without looking like a weirdo, would be rather difficult. Simon just barely managed to suppress his urge to sprint out of there and took a deep breath as the elevator door slowly slid shut with him still in close behind them. The elevator resumed its ascent, and almost immediately, the overhead lights began to flicker. This prompted a tired eye roll from Simon as he muttered, You've got to be fucking kidding me. And that's when the lights switched off completely. He could feel the car continue its climb as he reflexively spun around and presses back to the cold steel of the elevator's inner doors. Somewhere just past the oppressive darkness now enveloping him, Simon could hear movement, he held his breath in an attempt to better discern the sound's location. As Simon's eyes began to adjust to the darkness, he glimpsed what at first appeared to be the silhouette of a massive spider crawling toward him. But this was only a trick of perspective. What he was actually seeing was merely a hand reaching out to grab Simon by his face. There was another ding as the doors he was leaning against finally slid open, sending Simon spilling out onto the hotel's gaudy patterned carpet. Landing face up, and looking into an open elevator that currently appeared to be both well lit and noticeably empty. It was that moment right there when his fear of the elevator people truly took root. Since the inciting incident was tangentially related to his job, Dr. Scary's first instinct had been to examine Simon's work life. He claimed he couldn't have been happier on that end. He liked the job and made good money doing it. Simon even liked the people he worked for, despite the fact that his sales manager was five years younger than him and a womanizing prick. He was a young, womanizing prick who knew the market and stayed out of Simon's way. At that point, the only negative aspect of his job stemmed from his recent inability to easily move about tall buildings. That may not sound like much of an issue to those of you who don't live and or work in large cities, but Simon did both. Granted, being in sales meant he spent most of each workday away from his own office, but the majority of that time was usually spent visiting other people's offices in different, often taller buildings. As is typically the case with phobia patients, in the beginning Simon tried to solve the problem by developing various workarounds for his sudden yet crippling fear of riding in elevators alone. He started scheduling a lot more lunches with prospective buyers. He offered to take clients golfing, anything that would get them to meet him down on ground level. He even volunteered to train the new intern because it gave Simon someone he could drag along with him on cold calls. But there were still the annual conferences, which were always out of town and often involved staying in hotels. And there was also the mortgage on his high-rise condo apartment, which his husband, Ronald, absolutely adored. Simon had confided in Ronald about his fear of the elevator people pretty much as soon as it became an issue. The whole thing had been rather difficult to hide from him, given the circumstances. Of course, Ronald was totally understanding, and most nights, 
He was able to meet Simon down in the lobby when he got home from work so they could ride the elevator up together. Of course, no system devised by humans was ever truly perfect. Eventually, there came a day when Ronald had to suddenly go out of town to assist his cousin with an extended family emergency, which resulted in Simon having to sprint up 15 flights of stairs to narrowly avoid crapping himself because he had scheduled three different lunches with clients earlier that day, and two of them were at the same Mexican restaurant. It was actually this very bathroom mishap, which finally convinced Simon that he was going to need professional help for his phobia, if he wanted any chance at living a normal life. Though, in a rare and rather humbling turn of events, Simon's case was the first one in a long while that had Dr. Scary feeling holy and truly stumped as to how she should proceed. She had asked about Simon's relationship with Ronald. He was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Simon's parents, both still alive and super accepting of their successful gay son. And the likelihood that this was all stemming from a traumatic childhood event, Simon simply failed to mention. Apparently, not very. I grew up in Connecticut. Dr. Scary must have looked disappointed by this answer because Simon followed it up with, Not a big fan of the Constitution State? I'm just worried he might be schizophrenic. It was now Simon's turn to look disappointed as he took a moment to consider this. Then he said, Isn't that a hereditary condition? Typically, but not always. There may be no documented cases in your family history. There are, Simon replied with a nod. My aunt and my grandmother. Dr. Scary held up her hands in a slow-down gesture and said, Okay, back up. For starters, symptoms of schizophrenia typically start to present in men by their early 20s. Plus, that was pure speculation. It's just as likely we simply haven't located the right stressor yet. There's still plenty of stuff we can try. Like what? Are you familiar with the concept of exposure therapy? Dr. Scary didn't typically like attempting such a drastic treatment this early into the process, but she clearly wasn't getting anywhere just talking with Simon. Dr. Adoradora thought that if she could watch him react to the source of his phobia in real time, it might tell her something that Simon couldn't. So she decided to make their next session a house call. It was just past 1pm when Dr. Scary arrived at Simon's high-rise condo complex. At that time on a weekday, his husband Ronald, like most of the building's tenants, was still at work. This, of course, had been intentional. They required an empty elevator for the exposure therapy, and Simon didn't need to feel any more self-conscious about this than he already done. It doesn't have to be all 15. One would be fantastic. Ride one floor down by yourself and look. Dr. Scary gestured at the smartphone in Simon's hand. She turned her own around to show him that the two phones were currently FaceTiming each other as she continued. I'm going to be with you here the whole way. Dr. Scary gently grabbed Simon's arm and guided up until his phone's camera was aimed at his face. Right there. Perfect. Now, we're going to get started, okay? Simon didn't respond, but it was clear from his expression that he wasn't exactly psyched about exposure therapy. No phobia patient ever was. But then finally, Simon glanced at her as he lifted his shoulders in a nearly imperceptible shrug before returning his gaze to the elevator's closed outer doors. Okay, Dr. Scary repeated. She then casually hit the button to call for an elevator as she turned to head inside Simon's condo. She leaned her back against the door to shut it behind her as Dr. Scary held up her smartphone to address Simon through the screen. His uneasy expression had transformed into something more primeval by this point. He looked like a wild animal, sensing an approaching storm. Dr. Scary tried to comfort Simon by saying, Remember, I'm right here. Simon's eyes stayed trained on the elevator doors as he eventually replied, No, you're not. There's nothing you could do anyway. Tears began to stream down his cheeks. Dr. Scary attempted to say something in protest, but was suddenly cut off by the familiar ding of an arriving elevator. She heard the metal door slide open, and then Simon let out a sudden, thunderous gasp. Oh, fuck no. God, no. He frantically muttered as he started to back away. What? What are you seeing? 
Look! He screamed and then turned his phone around so Dr. Scary could see inside the elevator. The interior wasn't well lit, and it was hard to make out most of the details through Simon's forward-facing phone camera. But Dr. Scary swore that she saw two figures inside the elevator. They were both bald. The one on the right was skeletally thin and appeared to be naked. The figure on the left was shorter and had a pronounced hunchback. And just before Simon finally dropped his phone and sprinted inside the condo, Dr. Scary glimpsed a much smaller figure behind the first till, lying motionless against the back wall of the elevator. She said this smaller figure resembled something somebody had crumpled up and tossed aside. Like the balled up piece of paper you find next to a trash can. But instead of paper, its pale skin and broken limbs were covered in bite marks. Bite marks? Dr. Scary nodded and replied, Big, red, bite marks. I waited for her to continue, but she remained silent for several moments. Then finally Dr. Scary turned and, for the first time since starting her story, she looked at me. Her mouth was twisted into a somber, humorless smile as she said. After that, Simon stopped showing up for his sessions. He killed himself a few months later. Caught off guard, I reeled back and replied, Good God, woman, when was all this? Dr. Scary's sad smile got a little sadder and she said, Right before I closed down my practice. Another long and much more awkward silence followed. Then, as if she could sense the one question I was still too afraid to ask, Dr. Scary added, I never saw them again after that, though, I'll be honest, for a while... I was genuinely scared I might, but what happened that day was merely a prime example of the power of suggestion. Simon's fear of the elevator people made him feel so real in that moment. It's actually not surprising I saw what I'd done. I thought this over and then shrugged as I said, Makes sense. Though, of course, there were the dreams. You had dreams about the elevator people? Dr. Scary slowly nodded while avoiding my eye contact. She exhaled a sigh and then said, It actually still happens occasionally. It's the weirdest thing, too. Most of the time I'll be dreaming about nothing, especially terrifying, you know? Like visiting my sister who somehow now lives at the summer camp we used to go to as kids. Mundane shit like that. Then, out of nowhere I'll get hit with this. She tensed her fingers into a claw-like gesture as she motioned at her chest and said, Overwhelming sense of hopelessness. That's how I know they're close. Dr. Scary glanced over at me again, and I saw that her eyes were now brimming with tears, yet her tone remained almost unnervingly, even as she continued. And that's when I'll realize I'm standing at a bank of elevators, and I can hear one approaching from below, and that creeping hopeless dread is now so palpable, I can literally taste it in my mouth, like dirty copper. I turn and try to run, but my legs feel like they're encased in cement, and I can hear the elevator doors opening behind me. I don't want to look, but I know it won't matter. The worst part, though? In the dreams, they know my name. I put a hand on Dr. Scary's shoulder in an attempt to comfort her, and she suddenly turned to glare at me. A morbid grin where her somber expression had just been as she nearly shouted. Do you want to know what they tell me? I opened my mouth, but before I could stutter out a coherent response, Dr. Scary started blinking and her creepy grin reverted to a confused frown. She said my name like a question and asked if I was okay. I lied and told her I was fine and thanked her for sharing such a fascinating story. And yet at first... I thought there was no way I was ever going to tell it to anyone. Sure, it was creepy enough to have potential, but in the end, it just left me feeling sad for my friend. So, I put the whole thing out of my mind, and for a while, that was that. Though yes, much like Simon, I too technically live and work in a major city, but my place is a duplex, and my job is at a bar. So I don't typically encounter a lot of elevators in my own day-to-day -day life. But then my dentist retired, and the new guy my insurance switched me to just so happened to work out of one of the CBD's taller high-rises. And even then, 
I managed to get all the way across the building's otherwise vacant lobby and hit the button to call for an elevator before Dr. Scary's story finally came rushing back to me in vivid detail. It was the first time I had even really thought about the elevator people since that night. I remember the look on her face as she described what she saw during Simon's exposure therapy session. The way she had grinned and when she said, Do you want to know what they tell me? I was outside in the courtyard bordering the front of the high rise and trying to steady my hand long enough to light a cigarette before I was even fully aware that I had left the building. It was just about then that I decided two things almost simultaneously. One, 12 flights of stairs would definitely count as my cardio for the day. Two, if I had to worry about this shit now, taking the rest of you with me. I can't believe how sick of peanut butter cups I am. And no matter how many times I try, the page never loads when I try to post this. But maybe someday it will post, and I honestly just need somewhere to talk about this nightmare. Even if this somehow made it to someone out there, I don't know what anyone could even do to help us, but here's the trying. My name is Aurora, and I'm 22 years old. I'm from Bancroft, Ontario. We all are. There are four of us here. Myself and my three best friends. Leah, Charlotte, and Rose. We've been best friends since high school, living in this adorable little one-horse town. We used to spend our summers finding gemstones in the creek and roasting in front of evening campfires. It feels like a different lifetime, one I'm not sure we could ever return to. It started with a simple sleepover. We had tried to do monthly sleepovers, though with work we sometimes had to settle for bi-monthly, or quarter annually, gatherings instead. It was October 30th, 2019. Leah was hosting and we all wore our slapdash costumes and brought copious amounts of wine and Halloween candy. As I stored my two bottles of rosé in the fridge, Rose came up beside me. She clutched her own bottle and grinned at me. This was our first monthly sleepover in about three months. I'm so excited for tonight. I've needed this so badly. I smiled back earnestly and felt the anticipation welling in my own stomach. We both filled our glasses and returned to the living room to find Leah and Charlotte chatting excitedly. My attention was drawn to a beige and black box with distinctive insignia on it. I cocked an eyebrow. Leah saw me and smiled coyly, grasping the box with two manicured hands. She stroked its edges, drumming her fingers with a satisfying rap on the lid, her eyes playfully alight. I see you've noticed the Ouija board. Care for a little game? Leah and Charlotte giggled. Where did you even get that? Rose questioned, eyeing the box curiously. She sat down next to Leah, glass in hand. The three of them were quite the sight. Leah with her bleached blonde hair and last minute playboy bunny costume. Really just some rabbit ears and a silky nightgown. Rose with her black cat costume. Cat ears and a tight black dress. And Charlotte dressed as a witch. Essentially the same as Rose, but with a hat instead of ears. All three cuddled together, clutching their wine glasses and pouring over a Ouija board. I half expected a mass murderer to pop through the door and stab us all to death. We really were like something out of a Halloween movie. I smoothed my cheerleading costume, my actual cheerleading uniform from high school, and sat down in front of the coffee table. I got it from Amazon. Brand new. Completely uncursed. Leah replied to Rose. Don't you need silver or something to put on it to be safe? Charlotte piped up, living up to her costume. Rose pointed to her and nodded her head in agreement. Those are the rules, she added. Leah rolled her eyes slightly and smiled. Well, I wear gold. Does anyone else have silver? Charlotte perked up. I do have this new ring I just got. It's set in silver. 
She held up her hand to show a beautiful, almost glowing green gem seated in a thick silver band. It shone with an unearthly glow that mesmerized me. I took a deep sip of my wine, ogling the gorgeous jewel as I did. What kind of stone is that? Rose asked, seeming as mesmerized as I was. Charlotte beamed evidently proud of her purchase and our response. It's called Maldivite, and it's fucking expensive. But it's so worth it. It came from literal space. The way it caught the light, it seemed to cast glimmers of emerald light onto Charlotte's skin. She removed it from her finger and placed it on the Ouija board. Glancing at the box, I could tell it truly was brand new. The corners were crisp, and the glossy coating was almost completely bereft of fingerprints and scuffs. So do we play the Ouija board to get scared for the movie, or do we watch the movie to get scared for the Ouija board? Leah took a long swig of her red wine to finish to glass, and refilled it from a bottle at her feet. She drummed on the box's lid expectantly, looking around to all of us. I shrugged eyeing my own rapidly emptying glass. Maybe we should do the board before the moving, so we don't let the wine interfere with our Ouija capabilities. Rose suggested. I considered the four of us, wind up and sloshing over the board together. I nodded. Sounds fair, but I want to top up first. Charlotte popped up and raised her own empty glass. Same. The two of us went to the kitchen and retrieved our wine from the fridge. That ring really is beautiful. Charlotte smiled happily as she poured her glass. Thank you. I love it. They say it brings about great changes. I remembered her exclamation about the cost, imagining a similar ring on my own finger. So, how much was it? Charlotte grimaced a little at the question, and I knew it was a lot. She opened the fridge and replaced her bottle. A lot. Like $260 for that little ring. A lot. I choked a little on my wine and had to pause the conversation while I settled a coughing fit. That's a lot. I agreed, flustered at the idea of wearing that much money on a little ring. I saw it in a gem shop outside of town and I couldn't walk away from it. It completely entranced me. Honestly, I could understand. It was mesmerizing. I thought of the unearthly green glow it gave off under the light. We returned to the living room to find Rose and Leah had set up the board already. The ring placed just above the sprawl of numbers across the top of the board. Leah lit a candle to set the moon. We all placed our fingertips on the planchette and took a deep breath. There was a pause. A kind of long pause, actually. Our eyes collectively shifted over to Leah, who let out a breathy laugh. Oh yeah, I guess I have to ask something. We all chuckled, and Charlotte took that as her cue to take the lead, once again living up to her costume. Is there anyone with us here tonight? She asked in a cool, mysterious voice. Nothing happened for another long moment before I felt Leah tugging the planchette towards yes. I raised an eyebrow and shot her a jokingly accusatory glance. She sent me an equally playful look back and Charlotte continued, Welcome then, spirit. Thank you for joining us tonight. Ooh. Rose cooed playfully, feigning fear. Charlotte pressed on. What should we call you, spirit? The planchette started moving almost before Charlotte had finished the question. S-A-V-I-O-R My brow furrowed and I looked quizzically between the others. Why Savior? Charlotte looked equally curious why that word had been collectively chosen. Okay, does that mean you're here to help us? The planchette moved quickly towards yes. Aw, it's a friendly ghost. Thanks, ghosty. Rose said sweetly, thoroughly with the wine at this point. What have you come to help us with? Charlotte continued. The planchette remained still for another long moment. 
So long I wondered if it was my turn to move it and spook everyone. But then it very slowly began to move again. L. I. V. E. The message wasn't that spooky, but the hairs on my arms rose up and a chill ran down my spine. Are you a familiar spirit to us? The planchette moved to no. Are you an angel? I could tell she was really getting into the whole witchy seance vibe. The planchette moved away from and back towards no. Are you a demon? She followed. The planchette did the same thing again. She looked a little relieved, but thoroughly confused. What are you then, Savior? The planchette moved so rapidly I had to focus hard to process what it was spelling out. The candle Leah had lit was flickering wildly. C-O-L-L-E-C-T-O-R What, like Pokemon cards or something? Rose said, a little slurred. We all shared a giggle, but we also all shared a similar look of uncertainty as we tried to understand the meaning of the response. This was the point that had dawned on me that we were all confused. No one had been pulling a prank or playing around, or else they were doing a great job acting their part. The mood of the room began to shift from playful to uncertain. As if to end the silence. Charlotte continued asking questions. She tried to start a new line of questioning. How old are you, Savior? The planchette moved across all the numbers and back again, never settling on any one, tugging at our trembling fingertips the whole way. The candle sputtered loudly and the ring seemed ethereally lit. I began to feel mildly nauseous. The planchette moved back to the letters beginning to spell something else out. P-E-R-F-E-C-T-S-P-E-C-I-M-E-N-S. -E -E Perfect specimens. My blood ran cold. Leah pulled her hands off the planchette and rose from the couch. What the fuck was that? She said in a shaking voice. Charlotte was pale and hadn't taken her eyes off the board. Aurora, was it you? Rose asked in a small voice. I shook my head, feeling the color drain out of my face. Stupid games. I tried to say casually, but my voice faltered. I want my money back for that stupid frickin... Leah withdrew her phone from her pocket and began tapping away on the screen. Her brow furrowed and the tapping became more and more frantic. She finally threw her phone onto the floor with a thud and flopped back onto the couch. I have no service now. She sounded outright afraid. No attempt to hide it at all. A panic was rapidly building. I'm not sure what compelled me to do it, but I rose and pulled back the dark blue curtains that hung over the window behind the couch. Peering out, I saw nothing. Not like normal backyard, no big deal, nothing. Like, nothing. No yard, no light, not even stars. Only black. Nothing. My head felt like it was spinning as Leah pushed me out of the way to look outside for herself. What the... Her voice was high and tight with panic. Charlotte, what did you do? She let out a harsh screech that made us all jump. Me? Charlotte shot back. You got that stupid fucking board. The two of them started arguing back and forth as Rose shrank helplessly into the couch, her face blank and staring. I put my hand over hers and we both sat, catatonic, as Charlotte and Leah bickered until they ran out of steam. That first night, we tried every door and window, just to find that they were all sealed and blacked out. We fell asleep well after what should have been dawn, and the windows never lightened. When I woke up the second day, Leah and Rose were already awake and cooking breakfast. It seemed so normal, and I wondered if last night had been a horrible dream. Hey, I said awkwardly. They both smiled, but their eyes didn't show it. Last night had been real. This was just a show. 
We're making eggs. Rose son. Trying to sound chipper, but I'm just sounding tired. The first couple of weeks we tried hard to feel normal. To keep our spirits up and find a way out of the apartment. Nobody touched the board. We hid it under the couch well out of sight, but never quite out of mind. None of us spoke of it. Charlotte hadn't left her ring in the box and hadn't put it back on since. We figured out by the second week in the apartment that the food replenished itself weekly, as did the soap, toilet paper, and our clean clothes. Though we had to wear Leah's clothes, as all the rest of us had, were our costumes. We had exactly the food and drink that we had when we started the party, which meant we actually had quite a lot of food, and so much damn candy. Also, enough wine to sedate all of us pretty thoroughly at least once or twice a week. By the fourth week, though, our candy bowls and snack spreads felt monotonous and sickly sweet, and there was never truly enough wine to keep us as numb as we all wanted to be after four weeks stranded in this tiny space. The first fight broke out between Leah and Charlotte, still tense from that first night. Leah drank the last of Charlotte's wine a full three days before reset, and Charlotte got so mad that she slapped Leah in the face. There was a lot of quiet days after that one, but as the weeks went by, the fights got a lot more frequent. After a few months, I stopped even counting the days. Every day was the same, waking up in this cramped apartment, eating the same crappy junk food, wearing the same clothes, sleeping in the same sleeping bag on the same floor, over and over again. Rose kept track, reminding us the day before each reset that a week had gone by. We realized early on that we never had any less food, but we also never got any more. If we ran out of anything before the reset, we were just out of it until then. One morning, Rose was exceptionally quiet. She had never fully recovered from the first night. She had been quiet since then, but this morning she wouldn't even make eye contact. It's been a year today, she finally said, looking at the floor. We all looked at her in silence and Charlotte and I met glances. She looked concerned. Wow, I can't believe it. But Leah cut her off with a loud fist on the coffee table. She rose from her established daytime spot on the couch like a storm cloud and glared at Rose. Thanks. I was really worried I'd missed that anniversary. With that, she stormed off and slammed the door to her bedroom. Rose didn't speak, even in response for the rest of the day. It's like Charlotte knew, because she tried so hard to get something out of her, but it was no use. Something had snapped inside Rose. The next morning, I woke to Charlotte sobbing. I followed the pain cries to the bathroom and that's where I found Rose hanging from the shower curtain rod by a strip of torn bed sheet. And Charlotte crumpled into a quivering ball by her feet. A flutter of panic rose in my stomach at the sight and I raced to Rose, fumbling with the knot around her neck. I could tell by the coolness of her flesh and the color of her face that we were far too late. Leah didn't come out of her room after we told her. Not even to eat. I heard her pain cries every night for three days. I took over calendar duties in Rose's absence. There wasn't even anywhere to take Rose's body, so when we finally cut her down, we had no choice but to hide her under a sheet in the bathtub. But then the day of the reset, I awoke in my normal spot on the floor and had no choice but to violently shake Charlotte awake to check my eyesight. Sleeping peacefully on the couch, in her original spot, was Rose. She had been... reset. Understandably, we had a very teary reunion. Leah finally came out of her room. She apologized to Rose. Rose apologized for killing herself. And for a few weeks, there was relative peace and harmony in the apartment. Rose enlightened us that she not only remembered everything from before she died, but 
She remembered killing herself. I don't think I'd do hanging again, she remarked. This taught us something. We can't really die here. By the 18th month in captivity, we would pretty regularly off ourselves when the apartment became too much to handle. It didn't even seem to matter because we always got reset the next week. Sometimes it was the only conceivable way to make it to the next week. The big problem was when we started to get violent with each other. After a year and a half stranded together with the same food, clothes, and surroundings, privacy had become a distant memory. And I guess this is why one day I woke up to Leah, straddling my chest, both her knees pinning my wrist to the floor. She had a pillow in her hands. Still groggy, I struggled weakly and tried to shake the sleep from my head. That's when I caught a glimpse of Rose on the couch. Eyes open, glossed over, mouth agape. Dead. I barely made out Leah's rushed apology before the pillow came down over my face. I admit, I didn't like asphyxiation. I didn't like most of the ways I died in the apartment, but I get why it was Rose's least favorite. When I reset, Leah seemed perfectly content and greeted me like nothing had happened. She just stirred a coffee as I gaped at her in disbelief. What the fuck, Leah? She let out a long, dramatic sigh and lowered her coffee mug, shooting me a, I guess we're going to talk about this look. Look, I'm sorry. I just needed some time to myself. Rage boiled up in my stomach. So off yourself like the rest of us do and reset yourself for a week. Why would you? She cut me off. We both know it isn't the same. It's nothing when until you reset. It's been so long since I had some peace and quiet. I just needed a freaking bath, okay? I had no clue how to respond. Charlotte and Rose had woken up while we were talking and were also staring daggers at Leah. We didn't discuss it further. We just noted that this was now an option. To my deepest shock, the next time I woke up dying, it was Rose's hands. Over the next few months, all peace and friendship faded away. We began to resent each other. Not surprising, since we kept killing and being killed by each other. But there was no real physical consequences for murder here. They always came back. Like the wine, or the peanut butter cups, or the clean clothes, or the eggs. Every week, they reset. Except our memories kept growing and feeding a resentment for each other that poisoned all our interactions. It became an unspoken rule that disputes could be ended by murder. Private time could be acquired by murder. More food and booze could be acquired by murder. So it's kind of just become a tool we use in here to get things we want. So the other day, I decided that finally tonight would be my turn. By my calculations, we've been here for just about two years now. I want a fucking bath in the quiet these people always talk about after annihilations. Leah says it's like you're the only thing in the universe, but I've only killed for extra food and once or twice to sleep in Leah's bed, so I've never experienced it. So tonight, I'll kill them all. So last night I stabbed them all. Tomorrow is reset, so I have one day all by myself. They were right. It really is like I'm the only thing in the universe. The quiet is unbelievable. It almost makes up for all the blood and the faint smell of decay setting in that starting to permeate the house already. Even with my growing resentment, these girls were still my best friends since high school. Every time I killed them, and vice versa, it always felt a little wrong. I know this probably doesn't make sense unless you've been in this situation and there's no way you've been through this. So, I guess only the girls could possibly understand. But they'll be back tomorrow, and tonight I can enjoy my grossly earned private time. My head aches so much from all that wine last night. And my stomach aches for another reason. I must have miscalculated the date. Reset must be tomorrow, because they haven't come back. 
they're still... I miscalculated. I'll try to enjoy a bonus day of privacy, but my ears are ringing and a knot is growing in my gut. I found a makeshift calendar that Rose was hiding in her stuff. I know I said I'd try to relax today, but I had to be sure I was wrong about the date. And I wasn't. Today is reset day. My heart raced so hard, I thought I might faint, and I swallowed hard to keep the bile rising up my throat at bay. Quivering, I withdrew the Ouija board from its hiding spot under the couch. Charlotte's ring gleamed a sickly green at me as I opened the box. The board set up, ring in place and my shaking hands on the planned chat. I reached out to Xavier. Where are they? I asked. My voice quivering as tears blurred my vision and began to roll down my cheeks. I felt the planchette pull my fingers with no delay. Like they had been waiting for me. I blinked away the tears and watched the planchette move across the board. F-R-E-E. -E. Then it moved to goodbye and fell completely still. Edit. After I used the board, my phone exploded with notifications. I checked and this posted. So I decided to check behind the curtains for the first time in, I don't know, probably months. And I saw a fucking sunrise. I could see someone wearing a medical mask and walking a dog on the sidewalk and they haven't reset yet. Oh God, what have I done? Scratching. That's what I heard when I was laying in bed at night. I sat upwards in bed, straining my ear to where it was coming from. The sound came again at my door. I quickly grabbed my phone, turning on the flashlight. The scratching continued. I huffed out, knowing what it was. Gus, you better stop. I'm not letting you in. I whisper shouted, knowing it was my cat. There was a small scratch sound before it went silent. I rolled my eyes, laying back down and falling asleep. There it was again. That scratching noise. I quickly sat up, checking my phone and seeing that an hour had passed. Cursing, I went to the door and stopped. I had my hand on the doorknob but didn't open it. There was another noise though. Breathing, almost like it was muffled. Strange. I thought, slowly turning the knob. I opened the door. Nobody was there, not even my cat. I quickly shut the door, heart dropping. Maybe, maybe it was Gus and he just quickly ran away when I opened the door. I tried to calm myself, going back to Ben. Halfway to my bed, the scratching was back. I stopped cold in my tracks as I silently stood there. I heard a faint noise. That breathing sound was also back. It didn't sound like an animal breathing, more like a human. I shook as I stood there frozen. It got louder and louder before stopping again. Sighing, I slowly turned back towards my bed. That was when the scratching started back again. I quickly snapped my head towards the door, my phone light flashing at the bottom of the door. A shadow was there. I could see it underneath the door. In a flash, the shadow quickly receded, along with the scratching. My heart thudded against my chest. Without thinking, I grabbed the door handle and yanked it open. Nothing. No one. Not even a single soul was outside my door. My eyes traveled down to the floor, where there was a small, long object lying there. I brought my phone light down, shining it on the object. It was my cat Gus's front leg. I almost threw up as I slammed my door shut and pressed my back against it. I let out a choked sob as tears threatened to spill. Who could have done this? Was there someone in my house? Or was it just my family playing a horrible trick on me? How could they make a replica of Gus's leg that accurate? I knew that was Gus's leg on the floor. 
The top half of his leg was a light orange color and the bottom half was black. I knew what my cat looked like. Well, all of these thoughts and questions raced around my mind, I didn't notice the scratching sound was back. I backed away from the door, tears running down my face. Suddenly, the scratching turned into banging, almost like someone was punching the door. This only lasted a few seconds before it was quiet altogether. The silence was almost deafening as I stood there in the middle of my room, shaking violently. Then, my bedroom door began to slowly open. I've been having dreams about that summer. Persistent dreams. I can't fall asleep without seeing my dad's face. It's why I started seeing a therapist in the first place. Because of those dreams. Those fucking dreams. They always start when I first saw the theme park. Where in his office. I must have been sad because he claps me on the back and says, There's no reason to cry. No reason at all. His voice scratches at my ears. That, I remember. There's little I remember of my father. Lee says that has something to do with trauma, but I don't think so. He was quiet when I was young and absent when I was older. That did more to cover him up than anything he did. But he did a lot of things. My dad owned the theme park. He built it. He bought some old farmer's property and built a roller coaster on it. I don't know whether it was the divorce that caused it or it caused the divorce. It's not like I can ask. He wasn't even planning on even selling tickets to the place at first. My dad was never particularly stable. My mom got full custody for the first few years after the divorce, and he moved halfway across the country as soon as the papers were filed. That's where he built it. They negotiated terms when I was about 11. I would stay with him during the summers, but I stayed at my old school. That always made sense to me. Summer was peak season. He built the roller coaster first. I remember that. He hired a bunch of contractors, painted it green, and then called it Nessie. That thing broke down three times a week, I swear to God. I can't believe they even let us keep it running. That thing was a death trap. Then came the carnival games. Those types of things with water guns and two small hoops. He hired a couple townies to do that. To man the stands, too. It's been a while. A long while. I'm sorry if I don't get everything right. It all blew up from there. We had more attractions when I was 17. There were bumper cars themed like a circus, with elephants and clowns and chipped paint. Those were always popular. His favorite was the Tunnel of Love. I don't think we ever got more than six people to ride on that a day. I guess I should say why I said we. My dad, even though he was very well off, was a cheap fuck. Or maybe he was trying to get closer to me. I don't know. I don't know a lot about my dad looking back. Whatever it was, he made me work there throughout the summer. He never left the park, I swear. He would just hand me the keys to his place and then say he'd get back when he could. Always came home at one in the morning and left at five. He always went back to the park, setting everything up doing paperwork. I was 17 when it happened. I had already decided by then, by the time I left that place and turned 18, I would never look back. I hated that fucking theme park. I hated it so much. It was all he could talk about too. He always said the place had a history, even though he built it 10 years before. That summer, I was mainly running the bumper cars and the coaster as my dad squirreled himself in an office at the edge of the property. I know everyone who worked there that summer. There weren't ever more than 20 in the best years, but that year we had 13. I was the only one from out of town. Everyone else was from the surrounding area. Townies, my dad called them, as if he hadn't been a history professor 11 years earlier. There were about five of us that always hung out and fucked around. There was Chuck... We went to the college nearby and needed extra cash. There was Landon, 
a year older than me, who was always the odd man out, with his black dyed hair and metal t-shirts, and who we knew nothing about. We always joked with increasingly unconvincing tales about his family life. There was Sarah, who worked there since I did, but legally, minors were almost certainly not allowed to be doing the stuff I was doing around the park. So she was 22, at least. Then there was Lucy. This was her first year at the park, and I was crushing on her hard. I could barely get a sentence finished around her. It was almost sad, really, how much I fell for this girl within the first week. Chuck and Sarah teased me mercilessly. I can't remember her voice. It's crazy what you forget. It's like a silent movie when I think about her. But I know she had a pretty voice. God, I don't know what she's doing now. I hope she's alright. I know we never talked after that summer. How could we, really? How could anyone? I'm getting ahead of myself again. Every time I try to tell this story, I just jump to the end. What else am I supposed to jump to? I shouldn't. I know. Lee says that doesn't help with the sessions. It just makes me relive the trauma without contextualizing it. It just sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me. I remember that summer a lot when I actually try to think about it. I can remember the way the paint peeled off of the sign. I can remember the way that one bumper car, Red 3, kept breaking down because a couple of kids always managed to slam it against the wall at full force. I can remember the day the first kid disappeared. It was bright and sunny. The place was overrun with locals. I was leaning against the control panel for the coaster as some guy barfed up his cotton candy a couple feet left of me. She came up to me crying. God, she was crying. She wasn't worried or angry or scared. She was already distraught. Did she know? Somehow? Did she figure it out? She ran up to me and screamed about some lost kid. I called into my walkie-talkie. Chuck made some joke about it, which she heard and started crying louder about. Not here, he says. Check with Andrew, who's manning the customer relations desk, which is our bullshit name for a help kiosk. Not here, he says. I check with Sarah on the bumper cars. See if they have any kids running around there. Not here, she says. I check around concessions. Not there. I check around walkie-talkies for another five minutes before we do a search. Takes an hour before we call the cops. My dad shut down the park early that day. To help the investigation, he said. I can remember how he said it, and I can smell the whiskey on his breath. The police searched for three hours, in the park and the woods around, as this mother's wailing the whole time. I can remember how that sounds. It's stuck in my head. I don't think I'll ever forget it. They called off the search at midnight, I heard. They say they'll fully search the woods in the morning. My dad came home on time that night. He slept soundly. The police do it again in the morning, with less effort, but they don't find him. Nobody ever saw that kid again. It's a sad thing, sure, but that's happened before. Sometimes people disappear. It's sad, but you keep on going. The next three weeks pass in a flash. I remember the energy of the place afterward. All of us were shaken up by it, but Lucy was definitely the worst off of all of us. She had never really done that sort of stuff before, and all this missing kid stuff messed with her bad. I remember Chuck making a joke about it, and then she left in a huff. It must have been 30 out. We were closing up for the night. It was the first time we really talked. We had made jokes or whatever, but that's when we actually started to trust each other. We started dating a week later. I don't remember how it started, but I knew I was happy. For a brief moment, I had a normal summer. The second kid disappeared not long after that. It was a dad this time. A single father, worried out of his mind. Thomas Earhart. I remember seeing the kid getting cotton candy and then running around. I saw a lot of kids around there, but I remember him. Red hair, glasses teeth missing from his mouth. I don't know why I remember that kid. Memory is a strange thing and sometimes it picks up only the least important stuff. That time, it caught him. I was watching him. I know that. Something about him struck me. 
I guess it's a sort of intuition. He vanished into the crowd. Thomas Earhart. I remember his name even now. I remember the picture the cops showed me. That same kid smiling, happy, with a family. There were two sisters, two parents. They were so happy. God, they were so fucking happy. He was never seen again. He vanished into that crowd, screaming, laughing. And then we never saw him again. It was the same routine. We searched for an hour and then the police were called and then nothing. They took our statements and then found nothing. They always say I had the problem of not seeing it sooner, but the cops had the same information I did. They knew what I knew. They did nothing. I'm getting out of order. I jumped to the end, but I know I don't want to go there. Not yet. After Thomas disappeared, I was reassigned. I had been working on bumper cars for the past two weeks, but I got reassigned. My dad put Chuck on the bumper cars because he caught me smoking outside the back of the park. He always hated me smoking, called it morally abhorrent that it would tear up my lungs. They were his cigarettes. He reassigned me to the Tunnel of Love because he knew I hated it. I was overjoyed. Lucy was working just next door. Every second I wasn't watching the tunnel, I would let the controls go on autopilot and then flirt with her. Of course, when it didn't break down. That thing broke down every fucking day. Even when it couldn't have had more than a dozen people going on it a day. I guess I should explain the ride just a little bit. It was a dark ride. A slow meandering trot through the world of love. Whatever kishy bullshit that is. There was the disgusting river of water below the boats as the boat moved from room to room, so you could admire the scenery. It was never my thing. I don't think it was anyone's thing. It just was. My dad had to put a lot of money into it. There were the dioramas, the little paintings on the walls, and a second track to put the boats on for maintenance. That second track was really just a tunnel into a storage area. A couple of dilapidated props, and some shit he had bought from a garage sale. And then there were the animatronics. I hated those animatronics. Big cartoon animals, pink and with hearts everywhere. There were teddy bears and chickens and all these animals with eyes that were too fucking big. They gave kids nightmares whenever they went on it. And couples, who were the only consistent group to go on it, never came back after they saw those things. I told my dad to take them out so many times, just let it be a dark ride, but he couldn't let that happen. My dad was a mess at home and in his office, but he obsessed over the tunnel. He couldn't do anything but think about that thing. That's why it reeked of cleaning supplies. He was cleaning it every single day, whenever it was closed, even as people dipped from one room to ride to another. This was his small world, and he wasn't going to let me ruin that. It was something compulsive. We knew that. He had been like that around certain rooms of the house before the divorce. I worked on that ride for the rest of the summer. It was supposed to be completely normal, even after those kids disappeared. We'd had something bad like that before, but never together. The police kept looking, but an officer on the premises wasn't a common sight anymore. They told us that they believed it was just a random occurrence, that these two got lost at the same time, told us to keep a lookout. That was supposed to be it. I began thinking of getting out of there again. I told myself I'd work another year, maybe move out here, even though I hated the place, because Lucy and I were starting to seem somewhat serious. Even though it had only been a month and a half, we were kids. Everything seemed like it would last forever. The third kid disappeared at the end of June. A girl. Her name was Charlotte. I remember all of their names. The police swarmed the place then, and we had to shut down the place. My dad hated that. He was a cheap fuck, and losing a whole day, even to this, seemed like the loss of the century. That was the first time I saw Detective Green. I'll call him that because his name was kind of like that. Big guy. Big, bald guy. Probably around 300 pounds. Six foot three. My dad was dwarfed by him. Detective Green told us that there was an active investigation. Landon, the weirdo, had a cousin on the force. 
He was the one who told me they thought it was somebody who didn't. Three kids disappearing within two months wasn't a coincidence anymore. That made my stomach sink. Even though I hated the place, I still felt a little for my dad. He put his whole life in this place and if they shut it down, a week with the low overheads could kill the place. I know that probably wasn't what I should have first thought of. Those were kids. They vanished. Disappeared. I still think of Thomas first. Red hair, glasses, disappearing into the crowd. He seemed invincible, running around. And I couldn't imagine someone wanting to hurt that kid. I couldn't comprehend it. That any of these people, wandering throughout the park, could have done it. Hundreds of strangers. Hundreds of suspects. The whole thing scared me. Even though I wouldn't have admitted it, we were all pretty messed up about it. Lucy, especially. Everyone except Landon. Landon had always been weird. Loved true crime, horror movies, anything scary. He was a year or two older than me. He went to the university nearby, I think. We barely talked to him, I'll be honest. Because Landon always creeped us out. He was a friend, I guess, but... I knew we talked shit about him a lot. We were kids. I feel awful about how we treated him. We knew better. At least, we should have. Landon was never weirded out by all these disappearances, even as much as we were. I'll never forget what he told me when talking about it one day. It was bound to happen sometime. I never liked talking to Landon. Police swarmed the place after they shut it down. We still work there some days, but they shut it down to any public presence. They didn't want to contaminate the evidence, or whatever, but they had no proof that the kids were anywhere on the property. The woods outside the park were just short of being a state park. The rangers were looking for those kids day and night, and having an officer in the park wouldn't have done anything. I wonder if Detective Green did that for a reason. I have no real clue what went on in that guy's head. Not even now. All I know is that he weirded me out. A lot of things weirded me out. Maybe it was just the circumstances, but Green would always look at me like I was a monster. We worked on the park, just checking the rides, making sure that everything was functional. That was the only concession my dad could wring out of the cops. If the park's rides broke down while closed, and we didn't get to them until reopening, we'd be fucked. That I was alright with. I needed that check. Moving out of my mom's house was never going to be cheap. It's funny. I was focused on the future. Those days, and now I can't stop thinking about the past. They promised they'd reopen the park after two weeks if they didn't find anything. They checked that place from head to toe. The roller coaster, the bumper cars, the back shed, the offices even taking a glance around the tunnel of love. But they didn't find a thing. Not a shred. The police department shifted towards combing through the forest, but everyone in town knew they had fucked up. If they had focused on the forest in the first place, then those kids wouldn't have had more time to fall into the caverns or vanish into the woods. Three kids disappearing, around the same time, in a theme park, is a horrific coincidence, we said. We were trying to rationalize it because we couldn't believe that someone could have taken those kids. I remember all five of us hanging out, smoking outside of a convenience store way past midnight. It was the hottest August night I can remember. My dad would have either been asleep or at work by then. Either way, he wouldn't have noticed I was gone. We were dumb kids. I remember that. We thought the world was going to be ours and that seemed so realistic. I thought I was going to make something of myself. That summer killed a lot of things in me. Lucy always made me feel like everything was going to be alright. That's why I liked her at first. She kept me at ease. We were smoking in the parking lot and talking about how the police fucked this up. Three kids. Three kids missing. I don't remember who said it but someone got the idea we should go into the theme park, do some detective work ourselves. Maybe it was just because we were stoned out of our minds, but it seemed like a good idea. At least, to half of us. Landon thought it was stupid, ran off, 
and Sarah had no interest in sulking around that place any more at night than she did at day. That left Chuck, me, and Lucy, but she barely wanted to go. The place looked so much worse. In the day, it was charming and a bit rickety, but at night, all the wrong things stood out. The shadows of the coaster were silhouetted black against the dark blue sky. The only thing lit was the do not enter sign. A little hint of brightness among the night. The whole thing gave me creeps. I don't let myself show it. Chuck turned back as soon as we had come, leaving the two of us. Fuck this, he said. We should have followed him away. I fished a flashlight from my glove department and flicked it on, bathing the fence in the flickering light. I remember that too. I remember the way the light glittered off of the fence, shining in the night. We tried to push the gate open, but my dad had locked it with a chain. He didn't want anyone to get in. I navigated around the fence, searching for a hole in the place. Lucy told me to give up, but I kept urging her forward. The fucker doing this is too scared to get anyone besides kids. I was an asshole back then. It took me about 15 minutes before we found a hole in the mesh. I could barely fit through, even though I wasn't the tallest. Lucy followed in after me, clutching at my arm. She was shivering in the heat. We took to the bumper cars first. Their shadows were massive with the flashlight, drenching the walls in dark. All the magic, the bare hint of it my father had managed to accumulate, vanished in the harsh shadows and light of the night. My teeth began to chatter when I remembered the girl. Charlotte. She had vanished around the bumper cars. We continued walking, but I stopped talking. Lucy was right about this. I realized then. I never should have gone there. We went to the darts next, then the concessions. Lucy saw a wrap by the cotton candy and screamed to high heaven. We went to the roller coaster, but that had been shut down for repairs a week earlier. Everything was always breaking down. Everything. They were patchwork reconstruction, barely able to continue going. I don't think my dad spent more than a penny on that place looking back. It's like he wanted it all to end with an accident. We wandered throughout the whole park, ducking under cobwebs and searching into the corners my dad wouldn't want us to go. We looked through his office, this short, fat building that could see the rest of the park, hidden next to the log flume. The door was locked, but if you jiggled the window just right, you could get it to open. I'd done that a dozen times to steal rum from his cabinet. It was covered with papers head to toe. It looked like the place had been ripped apart. If the police really had been investigating thoroughly, maybe that was their work. Detective Green had probably read every single document in here. The place looked like a tornado had gone through. We got out of there quick. I didn't want to linger and leave a trace. My dad was methodical. My stomach twisted up as soon as we got back outside. As soon as I noticed it. Do you smell that? She had sun. And I can still see her there, standing in the night. The wind was blowing from the north end of the park. Bleach. I started walking towards the tunnel of love, not even thinking about what I was doing. Everything goes in slow motion as I looked back on it. It feels like it took an eternity to walk from my dad's office to the tunnel. I told myself that there was nothing to fear. Nothing had gone wrong. It didn't stop my stomach from twisting up further. I was never that good of a liar. Not even to myself. In the day, it had been maybe a bit rickety. But it looked like haunted in the middle of the night. The smell of bleach overtook me. Couldn't have been that long since it was sprayed. Minutes, even. It could have been minutes since my father put another spray of disinfectant in there and I still think of that all of these years later what if he had seen me what would he say what would he do we stalked inside moving as slowly as we could we were afraid because it hit us then it made us realize what truly could have been happening the place was horrifically dark and it felt like my flashlight was barely peeking through it I fumbled for the power switch right under the main console it was a great big lever and yanked it down, making the whole place a light. We were supposed to be stealthy, of course, but I didn't even think of it as I turned the switch on. 
we rarely pulled the full lights on in the tunnel, usually. We'd do a lesser rig, a couple lights to instill a romantic atmosphere. The place would be lit in purples and pinks, bright Valentine's colors. It hit all the dirty parts, the holes in the wall, the dirty water. The place was drenched in that hideous light as soon as I pulled a lever. I had never seen it like this for so long. The wallpaper was old and faded, ripped apart at the edges, all of it covered in hearts and mold. Cupid looked rotten. The carts began moving through the unclean sludge of the water, filled with sick and stale water, missing its weekly cleaning, turning brownish in the fluorescence. The river smelled like shit and piss. Everything else smelled like bleach. The walls, the floor, the air, everything. We had to cough to get through the stench. She asked me to head back then, to turn the lights off. She didn't want to venture any further, but I didn't let her. We have to find out, I said. But I don't think I really knew then what I could have found out. I don't think I ever had a chance. I got in one of the boats, careful not to get any of the water on me. Lucy followed, more out of duty than any want. The boats began to move, sluggishly through the muck. You could hear it creak, no cute music to hide it. I could hear Lucy start to breathe heavier as the boat moved further and further along the track, the scent growing ever stronger. I don't think my hair was even on end. I wasn't brave. I just didn't understand what was happening. I hadn't figured out what the smell under the bleach, under the shit, was. It was some mystery scent, something I couldn't quite place, deep and slightly fruity. I know it now. I know it like the back of my hand. Everything seemed a lot clearer, with fluorescence on full blast. The hearts and the cupids were scattered across the ceiling. I could see now that the cupids were little baby dolls he had attached cardboard wings to. We moved further. The music started up then, which I knew made both of us jump. The smell of bleach got stronger as we moved further and further. I clutched the flashlight. She was talking to me then, telling me we should turn back or something. I wasn't paying attention. All I did was stare forward as the boat moved slowly ever onwards. I wasn't thinking. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Even now it's hard to put it all together. The images flash and swap and all I know is that we're getting closer. As I write this, I can see us there, trapped in that fucking boat, waiting for it all to end. Because I know where it ends. I know what happens next. I've been having this nightmare for months, years maybe. I always dreamt about this moment, sitting in the boat, knowing what happens next. Sometimes Lucy's there, sometimes not. Sometimes it's my dad sitting in the seat next to me and no matter how loud I yell, he can never hear me. I always wake up before we get there. It feels like a century before we finally make it to the animatronics. I say that, but they didn't move. They were big dolls, standing still as preset music began to play. They seemed so different in the normal light than they did in the pink one. Their cartoony faces seem closer to plastic. Their heads are plastic and the bodies are some sort of plush suit. I had never really looked at them closely. My dad had always said that it was too dangerous to step near them, to let the professionals have it. What if I had looked, early enough? What if I had seen what he had done? They were plastic and fluff, but they reeked of the bleach and the scent beneath. I wanted to run, really. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible because every bit of me told me that this was wrong. But instead, I stepped off the boat and onto the side of the ride, where the animatronics, the mannequins, stood so still. I wanted to vomit as I edged closer. Lucy was yelling now, telling me to get back in the boat, but I didn't listen. I moved to the mannequin. A pink bear whose eyes were a glittered blue and whose paint had been chipped off. And I pulled off the plastic head. The real one beneath it almost came off with it. The face had rotted like a pumpkin, melting and graying as the innards came pouring out. I could barely tell that it was a human face, but I could make out the barest pieces. The red hair, the glasses. 
I could make out Thomas, the boy I had seen on the posters and in the park who had vanished into the crowd. And then I vomited. The next few hours are a blur. I have no memory of leaving the tunnel, going through the park, or calling the police. It took them a day to arrest my dad, a month for them to try him. I went home to live with my mom after that, and I never came back to that town. I never came back to that amusement park. I don't think I ever could have. All I can think about, when I look up that place or read about it or think of it, is what those families could have had. What those families could have had if my father hadn't taken it away from them. Every time I think of it, in the end, I get out of sync. I get back to the beginning of the dream, back when I was 11 years old, when my dad first took me to the park. But I wasn't sad. No, I wasn't. How could I be? With my father owning a theme park? I was so happy. Everything's stained with it now. I can't think of my dad without thinking of what he did. But I was so happy then. He took me across the park and... There's this one sentence that stuck with me then. There's no reason to cry. No reason at all. He clapped me on the back, looked over the park, still halfway in construction and smiled. I realize now he wasn't talking to me. He was looking dead on, right out the window of his office. Straight at... The Tunnel of Love. I've always had a thing for the weird, dark, and mysterious. I devour podcasts about serial killers and hauntings. I'm constantly watching slasher movies. I have a tattoo of Michael Myers, and even the art I keep around my house can make my guests feel a bit uneasy if they stare for too long. I'm a weirdo. I'm not going to apologize for it. Sure, I've lost some girlfriends over my tastes. Hey, I like what I like. A few months ago, an unbelievably talented sculptor popped up on the local art scene and within a few weeks had become the talk of the art community. His name was Rodrigo. He never gave his last name, like he was a prince or something. No one knew where he came from, where he worked out of, or how he worked so quickly. But within weeks, he was setting up his own galleries across the city, and making more money than most starving artists would make in a lifetime. Bronze castings were his preferred medium. He had a few paintings scattered around his galleries, but what brought in the crowds and put the most money in his pocket were the statues. His incredibly lifelike and life-size statues, almost entirely of young women, dotted the floor space of his galleries and dominated the conversations of the art scene. My friend Brian owned the gallery space that Rodrigo had rented for one of his first art shows, so I was invited to come and take a look at this mysterious artist's new work. It was pretty good. I'm not a massive art guy, so, in my opinion, once you've seen a statue of one naked lady, you've pretty much seen them all, but you could tell from the buzz of the crowd what Rodrigo was doing was groundbreaking. The art was selling like hotcakes. A statue of young boy sitting cross-legged with his head in his hands sold for $8,000. It was entitled Hide and Seek. A statue of a woman nursing a newborn infant entitled New Mother sold for $10,000. Paintings were selling quickly for a few hundred dollars a pop. What quickly became the main conversation piece of the show sat in the middle of the gallery. It was a statue of a woman sitting on her knees in prayer position. Her hands, shackled, were stretched before her, clenched in tight fists. Her head was tilted back, looking skyward, her delicate features distorted in a wild scream, her eyes wide. A key on a shoestring, on bronzed, hung around the woman's neck. It was entitled Emancipation, and it sold for $20,000. A later review of the work had this to say, Emancipation is a gut punch of a piece that sings songs of love, loss, violence, and submission. Its delicate and precise moldings tells the us 
simultaneously a story of subjugation, servitude, and meekness as well as a hidden rage bubbling under the surface. Yes, it reminds us that our means are within our reach, but it also dares us to not to escape but to break free and rage in the faces of our gods. Pretentious? Yeah, I think so too. But you should have seen it. Something about the piece was so visceral, so real. Not a person walked by without stopping to stare. Towards the end of the night, the gallery was beginning to empty. The deep-pocketed oligarchs had left first. The less well-off aficionados left soon after, and eventually they were followed out by the student crowd who more than likely were only there for the open bar. At the end, it was just Brian and I. The paintings had all been sold and taken to their new homes. The statues were all marked with little red sold signs on their title placards, waiting to be shipped later that week to their new resting places in mansions and private galleries across the country. Rodrigo was making money hand over fist. Brian and I took one more lap around the gallery to make one last look at the art of a man who would no doubt become one of the greats. When we noticed one piece off in the corner that, miraculously, had not sold. I understood why it didn't sell. It was grotesque. It was a person crawling on their hands and knees. The head was cleaved down the middle from the crown to the nose, leaving a few inches of air between the eyes. The mouth incredibly detailed was frozen open in a deathly scream you could almost hear the bronze didn't look like it was cast but rather dripped onto a mold and left to harden and leaving long globs of seemingly molten metal dripping off the head shoulders arms and torso of the person the split head and misshapen casting of the body made it hard to tell if it was a man or a woman i loved it of course i did I like weird shit. It was called El Comienzo. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. I let Brian finish his checklist of chores he had to complete before he closed up the gallery for the night, and I stood and stared at the work. I was entranced. I didn't even hear the gallery door open or the one-sided conversation happening behind me until I felt a tap on the shoulder. You like? A small voice behind me asked. I turned around to see an older gentleman. He was skinny, tan, and had salt and pepper hair. He was wearing a black button-down, black slacks, and black leather shoes. It was Rodrigo. I love it, I said to the man. A moment of silence passed between us. The man seemed to want more out of me. Never have been one of those people that really gets art, so I turned on my impression to some of the part-time hipster art critics I had heard mingling in the gallery earlier that night. I think it makes a pretty profound statement. I said. That we're all just animals climbing out of the primordial stew. No reason. No conscience. No understanding. Even the most rudimentary sense of life or death. Good or evil. Right or wrong? Thank God he wasn't a fan of the movie Halloween because that last part was just a Dr. Loomis quote. I see. I see. He said enthusiastically. His accent was difficult to place. South American? A man pretending to be a South American? It must go. You must have it. No, no, no. I laughed. There's no way I could afford this. Cheapest statue you sold here tonight was 8k. There's no way I can take this. The old man took my hands into his and stared deep into my eyes. Then how about for a dollar? The man smiled. It must go. All of it must go. Once the art is out in the world, I cannot take it back into my home. I will make more. I will sell more. He shook my hand and placed it on the statue. This belongs to you now. You. Rodrigo snapped at Brian, who had been eavesdropping quietly in the corner. Broom in hand. Take this man's information and make sure this is shipped to his home. 
Ryan's mouth hung wide open as I handed a dollar over to the soon-to-be famous artist. The old man snatched the money out of my hand, winked, turned, and left. Ryan's mouth still hung open. Neither of us could believe what had just happened. We stood in silence for a while until Brian decided to break it. You fucker, he said. If you ever sell it, I'm getting half. The statue arrived at my front door a week later. I had been rearranging my furniture constantly the past seven days, trying to decide where I wanted my new art piece to be installed. The living room? No. I watched a lot of scary movies and honestly, I didn't want it in there staring at me with its blind eyes while I did that. Bedroom? Definitely not. Center of the foyer? That would be a conversation starter for sure, but like I said, I had lost too many girlfriends to my weird tastes and with that monstrosity greeting you at the entrance, I'd never get a girl in the front door again. I decided to put it in my office. To the right of my desk, looking out the door like some sort of fucked up post-apocalyptic guard dog. It took a team of massive men to carry the statue into my house, down the hall and into the office. They grunted and cursed the entire time and I was so worried they would drop it. Not because I was worried about damaging the basically free statue, but because it would probably destroy my hardwood floors and I did not have the money for that headache. After half an hour, they got the statue into position next to my desk and unwrapped the foam and bubble wrap that covered it. When the last meter of bubble wrap was unraveled from the head of the statue, a great weight seemed to settle in the room, like the air had just gotten thicker. The men went silent and stared quietly at the statue. I remember sitting there thinking, do I tip these guys? Is this where I'm supposed to offer them lemonade? One of the men broke the silence. You a fucked up motherfucker, huh? Then the men filed out of my house. The dreams started that night. Or at least, I think they were dreams. I could hardly remember most of them. You know when you have a bad dream and you try to remember it, but the harder you think, the more distorted and distant the memory becomes? It's strange how an image in your head can be so vivid, sharp and dangerous one second and the next it's slipping through your fingers, fleeting and ephemeral. That first night I woke up sweating, gasping for air in the dark, hands clenched in fists so tight my nails left shallow cuts in my palms. I sat in the darkness trying to recollect. What woke me? Did I have a bad dream? Why can't I remember? I didn't sleep the rest of that night, too wired on adrenaline from a forgotten terror to close my eyes. That morning, I left my room before the sun came up to drink an inhuman amount of coffee before work. I wandered through the dark hallway of my house and gasped when I crossed my office door and saw the monstrous statue peering out at me from a shadowy corner. I had completely forgotten it was there. It was definitely going to take some getting used to. I drank my coffee, made some eggs and watched a little TV before cleaning up and deciding to start my work day around 8 a.m. I stood in the doorway of the office and studied misshapen human figure frozen in bronze sitting in the dim corner of the room. The image of the statue brought a forgotten memory to the front of my mind like a burst of lightning. A scream, a blood-curdling, window-shattering scream had woken me up that morning. I was sure of it. But was it my scream? Obviously, I had been having a nightmare. I was still damp with sweat. It was loud and high-pitched, which didn't sound like me, but, but who knows what noises my unconscious body could be capable of making. I'd made some pretty embarrassing noises a few weeks before while watching The Exorcist by Candlelight. I'm weird, I know, I get it. Maybe there wasn't even a scream at all and it was just a figment of my imagination trying to rationalize whatever terror was plaguing me in my sleep, but it was probably my own scream. I sat down to work. Or at least, I tried. 
I tried to focus on my spreadsheets, but my eyes kept wandering over to the corner on my right to inspect the dripping globs of the statue. Each time I tried to focus on spreadsheets and paperwork, my eyes would slowly glide over to the corner every five minutes or so. I wasn't getting anything done. I got more coffee. Still couldn't focus. I took a walk around the block. Still couldn't focus. I took an early lunch to take a short nap. Still couldn't focus. The statue seemed to have a gravity of its own, pulling my eyes towards it as if it was asking to show me something. Whatever. I'm just tired. I figured. I'd get a good night of sleep and have a better day tomorrow. Spoiler alert. I didn't get that good night of sleep I was hoping for. I laid in the bed staring at the ceiling watching the fan spin round and round. I couldn't keep my mind from drifting back to the statue. Something about it wasn't sitting well with me. Sure, it could be kind of hard to look at, but there was something else about it that was just off. Almost as if it exuded some sort of energy that seeped out of the office and into the rest of the house. Bad vibes, as Brian might say. I thought maybe I should call Brian and tell him about the statue. Maybe he'd heard from the other patrons of the art show. Shortly after that thought, I drifted off into a short, fitful sleep. Jolted awake again, adrenaline pumping. The sheets were damp with sweat. The first thought that came into my head was the scream I had imagined I heard last night. I definitely heard something, I think. God, I was tired. Honestly, I probably could have slept through a marching band in my living room at this point. I jumped in the shower and repeated the same routine as the morning before. Coffee, breakfast, TV. Then I would get to work. I sat down at the desk and pointlessly clicked the mouse around the monitor. Too tired and distracted once again to get any real work done. I decided to call Brian. Hey Brian, have you been getting any feedback from anyone from the art show about their statues? Feedback? Like what? It's heavier than I thought it would be? Brian laughed. No, I mean... Never mind. I sighed. Obviously Brian hadn't heard anything. It's nothing, I just don't know if I like it in my house. Well, it sure as fuck isn't going in mine. Don't sell it yet. I'm telling you this guy is going to be huge, just wait. Shh. I shushed Brian up. I swear I could hear the faintest noise of someone else on the telephone with us. Breathing. A deep, slow inhale and exhale. Not like Darth Vader, but... Not completely unlike Michael Myers. I rubbed my tattoo. Is someone else on the phone with you? Uh, no. Brian said, clearly confused. Inhale. Exhale. Brian, I have to get rid of this statue. I'm going to sound crazy, but I can't have this thing in my house anymore. It's freaking me out. Well, if you would have let me finish... I would have told you to hang on to it for a few years. That guy is going to be huge. Imagine just being handed a Picasso painting. A Dali. A fucking Rembrandt. That's what happened to you. Just hold on to it and in a few years you'll be rich and don't fucking forget. I get half. Yeah, okay. I was almost whispering I was so tired. Inhale. Exhale. I gotta go. I'll talk to you later. Brian hung up. Three years? There was no way I was going to be able to pull that off. I turned my chair and looked at the statue. It stood same as ever, frozen in a constant state of torture. Its head split right down the middle, the unseeing eyes wide open in terror, the mouth twisted into an awful scream. Inhale. Exhale. I launched myself out of my chair. What the fuck? I yelled. I swear to God the statue breathed. I didn't see it happen. It didn't expand and contract like it had lungs, but I heard it. I swear to God I heard it. 
I was sitting three feet away from it. I was positive that fucking thing was breathing. I stood still in the office doorway, looking down on the statue. I didn't speak, and I was moderating my breathing as quietly as I could, so I couldn't mistake my own wavering breath for that of the statue. I'm not sure I even blinked for the first five minutes I stood there. If it was going to breathe again, I wanted to witness it. I needed to witness it, if only to prove to myself that I wasn't insane, but the longer I stared, the more paranoid I got. The hair on my arm stood straight up. My mouth went dry. I could feel the air going out of the room. I couldn't shake the feeling that any second this tortured human would draw air or blink, or I would notice in a split second its muscles tense, then it would be launching itself across the room towards me, its hands reaching for my neck. I went to the bedroom grabbed a spare bed sheet, and brought it back to the office. I draped the sheet over the bronze figure and sat back down to get some work done. It didn't help. In fact, it just made everything worse. What if it was blinking under there? What if the distraught scream had morphed into a menacing smile? Every now and then, the sheet would get caught ever so slightly in the air conditioning and shift just a few millimeters, sending my mind into a state of sheer panic. I couldn't take it anymore. I evacuated the office. I moved my entire workstation to the kitchen and made a special point to close the office door behind me. I remember chuckling to myself, I won't go into that room for three years. Easy. The kitchen was better for me. I drank some more coffee and got a little bit of work done, but I was never able to relax. My shoulders were tense and my eyes started to investigate every little sound I heard. It was going to be an early night again. I had to get some sleep. Before I went to bed, I downloaded a sleep app that records noises throughout the night. It's supposed to be for people with sleep apnea or sleep talkers or bed snoring. Not people in possession or demonic statues, but it would have to do. I loaded up the app, put my phone on my nightstand, and again tried to sleep. Getting to sleep that night was easier, probably because I hadn't slept for two days at that point. But I can give you a guess how I woke up. I woke up on the floor of my bedroom, sweating and panting for air. I immediately grabbed my phone and started the playback of the night's recorded audio. It was a small file. I had only been asleep for about three hours. The first two hours of the recording were uneventful. Just a little snoring and a cough, but about ten minutes before I woke up, the recording started to get pretty... uh... bad. My snoring quietly tapered off to a natural breathing pattern before devolving into a whimper. I sounded like a scared child. I could hear myself trembling through the audio, then six loud thuds, each spaced out by about two seconds. The next ten seconds were a deathly silence, then the long, slow creaking of my bedroom door swinging open. The next four minutes was more of my whimpering accompanied by another sound. Inhale, exhale, then... A head-splitting, mind-numbing scream exploded from my phone. The scream of someone in pain. The scream of someone being tortured. The scream of a vengeful spirit. Three sounds could be heard in the background of the scream. My bedroom door slamming. My body falling out of bed and myself gasping for air as I woke up. And the scream subsided. I closed the app. Called my boss and let him know I was sick and wouldn't be working that day, and probably the following day as well. I didn't realize it was 2.30 in the morning. He was pissed I woke him up, but fuck him. I sat in my bed and stared at my door for six hours. I didn't want to leave my room. As soon as I opened that door, it would be standing there on the other side. I could feel it. Another two hours later and I was about to piss myself. I remember thinking I was being foolish. Was I going to piss in my bed because I was scared of a statue? Grow the fuck up, dude. 
Get out there and piss in a toilet like a man. I stood up, crossed the room, opened my bedroom door and immediately pissed myself at what I was looking at. At the other end of the hall, my office door lay wide open. The bed sheets I had used to cover the statue was laying in a crumpled mess on top of my desk. I think you would have pissed yourself too. I slammed my door, locked in, as if a flimsy plywood door would stop a 1,000 plus pounds force running into it, and crawled back in bed. I didn't even clean up my piss. I sat there staring at the door for another four hours until the banging started. Bang, bang, bang. I felt dizzy. The world was spinning around me. I can't believe this was really happening. Bang, bang, bang came the noise from the hall. I dry heaved in my bed. I couldn't believe this was how it was going to end. I screamed as loud as I could. I stopped, drew another breath, and screamed some more. Then what sounded like an explosion came from the hallway. I could hear wood splinters clatter on the hardwood floor. I kept screaming. My doorknob was turning and I was getting lightheaded. I could hear voices from it in the hallway talking to each other was there more than one i'm fucked the bedroom door swung open and into my bedroom walked a cop gun drawn he was just sitting in bed screaming like a psycho he called over his shoulder to the other cop in the hallway the officer took a deep sniff with his nose ah oh, jesus christ i'm standing in a piss puddle ain't i i passed out when I woke up, a cop was sitting in a chair across from me. I was in a hospital bed. I was really glad it wasn't the cop who got my piss on his boots. We heard you screaming so we busted down your front door, the cop said. The department will not be reimbursing you for that. He sat up in his chair and rubbed his mustache a little bit before settling himself back in a bit more comfortably. I'm going to tell you a story. Then I'm going to ask you some questions. Do you think you can handle that? Nurse says you've been suffering from dehydration and exhaustion, but you've been asleep for damn near 24 hours at this point, so I'm thinking you're doing a bit better. I nodded. He told me a story about a businessman. He had started his own plumbing company at 20 years old, expanded it, took it nationwide, then sold it at 60 years old for nearly $100 million. From then on, he spent his time traveling the world and buying art with his wife of 30 years. They were very much in love and spent their anniversary at the Love every year. The businessman built a church in his hometown at 65 and spent every Christmas at soup kitchens feeding those less fortunate. Eventually, his travels brought him to the same art show I was at a few days ago. Rodrigo's. The one held in Brian's gallery. The man was entranced by a piece of art he saw there. It was called Emancipation. He said something about how the piece spoke to him, so he bought it. The next day, he brought it back home and placed it in his private gallery and invited friends to come see it. They were impressed with the craftsmanship, but the businessman's respect for the piece quickly developed into an obsession. His friend said by the third day he wouldn't leave the room it stood in. He moved his bed into the gallery. He took his meals there. We're told he would hold lengthy conversations with the statue while his wife and friends listened in from the other room. The fifth day, he snapped. Went completely nuts. Destroyed most of the art in his gallery, then killed his wife and her friend who happened to be unlucky enough to be visiting at the time. When he woke up the sixth day... He couldn't believe what he had done. He got a hammer and chisel from his toolkit and went to work on that statue. Says the statue told him to kill his wife, so he wanted revenge on the statue before he turned himself in. He chiseled the statue's face off over the course of two hours, then called the police. When the police arrived at the businessman's house, the first thing they noticed was the smell. It wasn't coming from the two bodies they found in the kitchen. They hadn't been dead long enough to stink yet. It was coming from the gallery. 
When the police entered the gallery to investigate, they found the statue kneeling, hands chained, and littering the floor around it were small pieces of bronze that had been painstaking chipped off. The statue's face tilted back towards the ceiling, had been chipped away, revealing underneath the charred and rotting remains of some unlucky soul. We're looking for a man who goes by the name Rodrigo. He's connected to 14 open missing persons cases, the cop said. If you haven't put it together yet, they're in the statues. I went home from the hospital the next day. The statue in my office was gone and my room smelled like piss. I kept myself busy that first day. I didn't want to stop to think, afraid of what my mind might conjure up. I replaced my front door, then tried a dozen different remedies to get the piss smell out of my room. None of them worked. I made a mental note to eat better. I started to move my workstation back into my office, humming to try and distract myself from the empty space in the corner where the statue used to reside. When I found a dollar bill sitting on top of the desk, I picked it up and folded it over my hands. On the back side of the bill, in black sharpie, was written, She was my first. The Black Bogart. That's what they called my grandfather. That's what they called Randy Gray. He wasn't a star. Nowhere near the A-list except for In My Mother's Heart. But Randy carved out a career in the Golden Age when doing so wasn't common for black leading men. Especially in the film nor genre. Randy's movies weren't well known to the masses. Granted, they were barely movies. We're talking a handful of serials and one real wonders. Except for Dark Knight at the Beersford. This was the only official feature my grandfather starred in, and I knew exactly nothing about it. Hell, no one did. Growing up a part of the Grey lineage made me an even bigger classic movie fan than I would have otherwise. After all, Mom and Dad both loved the black and white staples, that was what bonded us above all, cinema. But then came the tragic inevitable. My father passed when I was 20, and now nearing 30, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Literally on her deathbed, and yet, she still didn't know what happened to her grandfather. What made Gray, aka Stanley Howard, disappear from her life all those years ago? The year he abandoned them was 1951, and also the year he vanished off the face of the earth. The same year, Dark Nights at the Beresford finished filming. As a kid, I was curious, but now I'm fascinated about him. Especially with every day, every passing moment of my mother's life so important. Of course, growing up, she never mentioned the importance of knowing what happened to her dad. But now with over 30 years experience, I knew how she operated and I knew deep down she wanted to know. I did what I could. While Mama suffered in Kindred Hospital, I dove into my movie resources, specifically the internet. The IMDB page for Dark Knight gave me a title and my granddad's stage name but nothing else. No other cast and crew with links. Damn sure no plotline. There was the year 1951, and the odd trivia that this was indeed my grandfather's final film. But there was nothing. No new info, no updates at all. None of the other mainstream movie sites offered me much more, so I turned to blogs. I got nothing new. Nothing regarding what this movie was other than being a lost slice of film, nor only remembered for it being one of the few to feature a black lead and for inspiring generations of rumors regarding its cursed film status. But the mystery of the mystery didn't satisfy me. I wanted more, but where to turn? All the other listed names in the credits proved to be one-off pseudonyms. The studio went bankrupt immediately afterward. The movie itself never released on VHS, 
much less DVD. Sure, there were a few forum posts I made out of desperation, but there was one name this Turner Classic Movies enthusiast had to reach out to. The Tsar of Noor himself, Eddie Mueller. Shot him an email. Did my best not sound too much like a cringy fangirl. Once I mashed send, the anxiety only increased. Trembling, I sat at my desk in front of the cheap laptop in this cheap apartment. The LA weather never bothered me, especially not in April, but nothing could stop those chills. The agonizing suspense over a reply that, at best, wouldn't come till tomorrow. That is, until I got a new message. A response from one of my posts over at moviedetective.com. Don't ask. I didn't recognize the email address, nor the name T. Crenshaw. Evidently, my post had caught his eye, and what I got was something oh so cryptic. You might not want to know more about Dark Knight of the Beresford or your grandfather, but if you do, reply. I'll be waiting. So the message was weird, but it was a hit. It was something. I told T. Crenshaw I wanted to know more, and right after mashing send, another message arrived. One from Eddie Mueller. He knew the movie, knew my grandfather, and he wanted to chat on Zoom. Eddie, just as curious as me. I thought it may have been a joke. Then again, my profile pic may have helped pique Eddie's interest. So I copy and pasted the code and hopped in on the video call. Eddie was waiting and he was just as handsome on my laptop as he was every Saturday at midnight. Leaning over, I flicked on a lamp. Better lighting to not make me seem like a complete weirdo sitting in the dark. Only Eddie's bedroom stayed far from well lit. A double indemnity poster on his back wall was all that could be seen. Then again, the guy made his career off living in the shadows, so I shouldn't have been too surprised. The conversation went smoothly. We introduced ourselves. Eddie, more than courteous. But then the topic switched to my grandfather's film. Shit got real. The gleam in Eddie's eyes grew more vibrant. Well, that movie always interested me. Eddie admitted on screen. He ran a hand through his short gray hair. And not just because it's cursed and missing and whatnot. I just found the history interesting. And what all do you know about the history? I asked. A smile appeared on Eddie's round face. Quite a bit, obviously. Your grandfather was an interesting actor. I enjoyed some of those serials, especially the one with PRC pictures. A saxophone and a six-shooter. Always low-budget stuff, but good stuff nonetheless. Chuckling, I nodded. I've seen that one. But I've never actually seen Beresford, only heard of it. And I do know it was Randy Gray's first and only feature. Eddie cracked up momentarily. Then the film scholar returned. Of course, that was it. No one knows what happened to him since. Trying to contain my excitement, I kept calm on the video call. My big eyes starstruck. And that's why I wanted to know. Eddie gave me a respectful nod. Your mother. I know. I'm really sorry, Peyton. But do you know anything else? All this cursed stuff? Saying the movie's lost, or when you watch it, you die? It's just so... Dumb? Eddie interrupted. Trust me, I know. Leave that mythos to the horror pictures. So what is there? I leaned in closer. Intrigued. Leaning back, Eddie reflected for a moment in the darkness. Well, my first instinct is it's a race film. A race film? Yeah, it might be lost, but so are so many in that genre, you see. Eddie moved in toward the laptop camera, letting it capture him for this glorious close-up. Race films were quite common in the 40s, and there were plenty of film noir homages, especially crime movies in general. Gotcha. 
I mean like Murder on Lenox Avenue, 1940s Gang War, even going back to 1935's Murder in Harlem. I've never heard of those. Not many have. As you pause to collect those thoughts I cherished so much. These were low budget, probably lower than Poverty Row Productions, man. I imagine so. If they're anything like my grandfather's. Then they're probably pretty good, right? Eddie said with a smile. A saxophone and a six-shooter is a masterpiece in my opinion. I'll get it up on Nor Alley someday. Instantly, my heart pounded at the Eddie Mueller gushing over my grandpa. Trying to keep my cool, I slouched back in my seat. Kept a lethargic Nor vibe. One so chill, Robert Mitchum would be proud. So is... That what you think Dark Knight of the Bears for it is? A race film? More than likely. That or a stag film. Eddie chuckled. Oh my god. I hope not. I laughed. Hey, I'm respecting the man. The myth. The legend. Randy Gray here. Stanley Howard. I added. Oh, yeah. Eddie went on. But at the same time, I'm just saying that in that climate... Black actors and actresses had to take what they could get. There's no shame in your grandfather slumming it. Eddie's sincerity sold me. The Tsar of Noor somehow reassuring amidst the most uncertain mystery. That's fair. I grinned. Knowing good and well how ridiculous my next theory was going to be. But could this all just be like drive-in, grindhouse type stuff? Maybe it's so indie that even back then, it was gory and had all this crazy sex everywhere. Eddie matched my own laughter. Maybe in the pre-code days, that'd be possible, but certainly not in the 40s. Yeah, Roger Corman wasn't around too much back then. Exactly. Or Herschel Gordon Lewis. Smiling, Eddie motioned his mixed drink toward me. There you go. You know your shit, Peyton. I appreciate it. I beamed. Of course I was flattered, but I knew he had deeper things in store, especially with my mom's limited time. So you don't know anything about the other actors? The director? Eddie shook his head. Nope. Not at all, I'm afraid. Then in the dark room he moved his hands about in professor fashion. But look... No one knows anything about them. Nothing except there was a leading lady playing opposite Randy. I've heard that. A slight unease crashed my excitement. But this curse stuff, you're saying none of it's real? No. Hell no. Eddie gave me a smile. Not in my opinion, anyway. It's just... I glanced over at my emails real quick. It's just I got this weird message... Someone was telling me they knew about... T. Crenshaw? Eddie interrupted, matter-of-factly. I looked at him stunned. Well, yeah. With a playful scoff, Eddie waved me off. That guy's a nut. Ignore him. Do you know him? Eddie shrugged. Not in person. The confident charisma returning, he sat up straight. I mean, it's the internet, Peyton. Trying to match Eddie's own confidence. Or arrogance. I ran a hand along my scalp. Well, what do you know about him? For once, Eddie shifted in his seat. Some shadow sliding over his smile. Honestly, not anything really. Just that he sent me similarly silly stuff about Dark Knight of the Beresford. You don't believe him? Oh, hell no. Eddie dismissed. He's just another troll. I've never gotten a real name from him. No proof. No nothing. Regardless of Eddie's comments, I felt my heart sink a bit. My dim hope giving in to despair. Those crazies are a dime a dozen. Eddie reassured me. He sent me all sorts of weird shit like pictures of me at Norista's. Dark underbellies. All my favorite bars and restaurants. Cringed, yet felt a new emotion. Fear. That's kind of creepy. Chuckling, Eddie gave me a carefree shrug. 
hey, at this point, you get used to it. That's show business, right? That's not even counting all the other messages he sent. The videos. By now, Eddie's smile was omnipresent. Almost like he was flattered to be famous enough to have his own stalker. To live out his own film noir scenario. But one that, in my opinion, was quickly veering toward horror territory. I even deal with him on Twitter. Eddie raised his drink. His second one during this conversation. Myself on a second glass of Pinot Grigio. But what can you do, man? People are fucking crazy. He took a quick, reassuring swig. You just gotta get used to it in this line of work. I grinned. I can only imagine. From there, our chat got more light-hearted. Less about internet psychos and more about a chance for us to meet and further discuss the Bearsford mystery. We settled on Norista's, a cafe slash bar Eddie frequented. Immediately after setting the date, Eddie and I did a friendly, if awkward, goodbye. Awkward mostly due to my fangirl status. I leaned back and took another sip, relishing what looked to be quite the adventure. Then in the midnight silence, a notification popped up. A new email from that same address. That same weirdo. T. Crenshaw had a new message. Ask Eddie about me. I left it at that. After all, why tempt trolls? That Thursday, I saw Mom before making my way out. The five-hour drive plodding but peaceful. By nightfall, I rolled up to the dead parking lot. Not many cars were in sight. San Fran had a dead calm. Norista's even deader. The Roxy Theater, a dollar cinema located right beside it, looked abandoned. Tucked away in what appeared to be the remnants of a closed nightclub, Norista's was appropriately claustrophobic. Shiny framed movie posters lined up along the pitch black walls. All of them vintage. All of them classic film noise. Okay. Hitchcock's rope may be debatable. The bar, an impressive array of both beer and the harder stuff. The coffee makers and stovetops in mint condition considering they appeared to be from the 40s. All in all, we had ourselves a diner slash bar slash coffee shop combo. And Norista's excelled at all three. Furniture and props were scattered about like a most morbid museum. I saw a literal Maltese falcon. A suitcase-like box from Kiss Me Deadly. Barbara Stanwyck's double indemnity anklet. Even the rug from a neo-nor like the big Lebowski. That really tied the cafe together. A jukebox kept the fatalistic vibes going with a dark jazz that was only broken up by the occasional crooner or movie scar. I stopped next to a vintage phone booth and stood there in awe. The smell of a most fresh coffee mesmerizing. But I had my eyes on those cocktail signs. Their pictures and descriptions showcasing North themed drinks that most certainly had my name on them. I only saw three other customers. Just two servers, but this was five people too many for me, especially since I was 15 minutes early and Eddie didn't exactly scream Mr. Punctuality. I veered toward a glass door on the right, toward a smoker section that must have shamed its gumshoe chain smoker imitators given its crawl space size arena. Apparently the discouragement of nicotine worked considering I was the only one in this cage. I took a seat and turned to see a window, showcasing the dark San Francisco streets. Those Venetian blinds, another nice touch. To my relief, there was no lingering cigarette smoke. The ashtrays surprisingly empty. The waitress was even friendlier than I expected, thankfully not channeling the hard-boiled dialogue we loved from the genre. I started off with the Mildred Pierce... The liquor was smooth. Before I knew it, 20 minutes went by and still there was no sign of Eddie. Fuck it, I thought. I got ready to call him when my phone vibrated. A new email greeted me. T. Crenshaw. The subject line? I know the truth. Of 
Of course, I clicked it. Another cryptic message spilled out. If you really want to know the truth, come with me. I have the movie. I know what happened to Randy Gray. I scoffed, but somehow an unsettling suspicion lingered. What if he really was telling the truth? What if Crenshaw wasn't just some random weirdo, but did have a copy of the movie no one had seen in almost 70 years? But then I dropped the delusion. By now, I'd finished the Mildred Pierce and either needed more, or Eddie Mueller. Raising my phone, I turned, then looked on in shock, a slowly rising fear settling in. A tall, scrawny man stood right outside the window, his arms folded, his stature strong and poised in that dark business suit. Sunglasses disguised the eyes, a fedora disguised his hair, but nothing hid the man's sly smirk. Those chiseled dimples, even beneath the weak streetlights, an eerie confidence just radiated off him. The Venetian blinds, jagged, filter, making him all the more menacing. He didn't have to make a move, didn't have to tell me his name. Through the horror, I knew this was T. Crenshaw. Fighting the inner panic, I stumbled to my feet and slapped a 20 on the table. One quick look back at the window showed me Crenshaw was gone, but I was too scared to relax now. I dialed Eddie. To my relief, he answered quickly. Hey, I'm sorry, Peyton. I was just about to leave, he said. He's following me, I yelled. What? Who? That creepy guy on the internet? Another glance at the window just showed me a desolate San Fran Carencia. On the other end, I heard Eddie pause. A rare sigh escaped his lips. A rare glimpse of unease in his tone. Shit. Just come to my house. I'll shoot you the address. But what about Crenshaw? Feeling my anxiety hit overdrive, I looked at the glass door. By now, only the waitresses were left. Should I call the cops? No. Eddie's firm response. Just come over. Keep your eyes and ears open, but get in your car. Just drive here. We'll talk about it when you get here. Not gonna lie. Deep down, I was glad his lethargic coolness was back. I was comforted by Eddie's casual cadence. Is that cool? Eddie continued. I'm sending it now. I felt my phone buzz with his escape plan. I'll see you there. Be safe. I hung up and faced the door. A slight meditation or hesitation that lasted only a few seconds. Then I walked on in. At first, it was smooth sailing. With all the patrons gone, the jazz now sounded louder in this empty stage. The music a manic, eerie loop that brushed against my flesh like an October wind. I noticed more shadows following me, but figured it was just the lamps working their magic. I waved at the barista. Have a good night. But again, a horror washed over me. I saw T. Crenshaw standing in the phone booth. Damn sure not using it for a call, but to chill. To watch me. Because regardless of the sunglasses, I knew that's what he was doing. I moved quicker. All while Crenshaw kept his gaze locked in on me. Out the store I went, straight out into a chilly spring night. Of course, I didn't slow down. I'd seen too many films, no war, and horror movies to linger when a stalker was on my hands. Instead, I took Eddie's advice. I drove on over to his place, a modest yet big cabin located in the San Fran heartland. Earlier, he texted me the code to get through the gate so there were no problems there. Upon entry, I was even more impressed. Well, this wasn't. No worries does Eddie had his share of the genre's most memorable memorabilia. Rare film noir posters, the trophies hanging on each and every wall. Eddie's DVD collection, absolutely astonishing. In his living room, I conversed with an idol that was even handsomer in person. 
Eddie's charisma carrying over off screen. Yeah, that Crenshaw guy. I've seen him around a time or two. Eddie said as he nursed a cocktail. I cling to the Cosmo he'd made me moments earlier. It's just creepy. A slight smile crossed my lips. More Hitchcock than the war, I guess. Eddie bobbed his head side to side, contemplating my analogy. Ah, fair enough. Brushing my bangs back, I looked over at the layout. Besides the lady from Shanghai poster, I noticed other things. There was Eddie's cat Charlotte strolling by, a bookshelf dominated by Raymond Chandler and Dorothy B. Hughes, and a bar that was far less impressive than I expected. Certainly nothing like the home bar I'd seen on Eddie's YouTube videos. Consider this drunk disappointment in her fellow alcoholic. Granted, as a guy, I probably felt less threatened. Eddie went on. He shrugged his shoulders with a playful gusto. I get used to the stalkers, but yeah, he's creepy, no doubt. A sincere sympathy showed through the sarcasm. I'm sorry you had to experience that on your first night. I faced Eddie. Thanks. I appreciate that. I watched him take another sip. Certainly not the first Eddie had had tonight. Yet he was still so handsome in that suit. But what more can you tell me about my granddad? Eddie paused, clearly taking note of the more focused demeanor I was forcing. Just Eddie and the Cosmo were so damn distracting. Randy Gray wasn't a bad man, Eddie's son. I will say that he was ahead of his time from what I understand. So what's the full story then? I challenged. Why did he abandon my mom? Put on the spot, Eddie stole another swig. If he was this relatively famous figure in film noir, I went on. Look, it was a different time back then. Eddie finally answered. We all know that. Granted, he was right, but that didn't stop me. But besides the racism... Listen, it was more than racism. Eddie said. He put the glass to his lips before pausing. It was much worse, I mean. So, what? They ran him out of the industry? After another sip, Eddie aimed those bright eyes at me. Well, can you name me another successful black actor in film noir besides him? One that lasted as long as he did before the disappearance? I didn't have an answer. Sure, there was Harry Belafonte in a classic like Odds Against Tomorrow, but black actors and actresses weren't exactly excelling back then. Eddie's son. He leaned back against a countertop, leaning next to an autographed Lawrence Tierney photograph. A picture of the notorious noir heavy standing next to her, a much younger Eddie. It's very possible your grandfather just got left out of the industry. Whether he was blackballed or just left to do other things. But that doesn't explain the mystery. I interrupted. I mean, why is there so much mystique around Dark Knight at the Beresford? Keeping his charismatic cool... Eddie held his arms out. It's a lost movie, Peyton. This shit happens. So maybe his disappearance is just as mysterious. Okay. Maybe it is. I couldn't help but notice the allured way Eddie watched me take another sip. Or maybe I was imagining it. Maybe Peyton Hardin's thirst was taking over. Trust me, I'm as big a fan of your grandfather's as anyone. Eddie admitted that with that beaming smile. In fact, let me show you something. From there, he led me toward the very back of the house. A much darker arena. A literal home theater. The big screen was glorious and retro enough. And rather than hideous seats and sticky floors, we had sofas and psychedelic rugs. Not to mention the home bar of both my dreams and Eddie's best uploads. Immediately, I nabbed another drink. This one, Eddie's infamous assassin cocktail. Needless to say, 
it was strong and good and hit quick. Eddie put on a saxophone and a six shooter. Certainly I'd seen it before, just never on the big screen. Never around such enthusiastic company. Eddie slid in front of me, his tall frame not much higher than mine. Albeit, he was still so handsome. We'll check out the bears for tomorrow, he said. See what we can find at all the filming locations. Sounds like a plan. But I want to help you, Peyton. Honestly. I gave him a mischievous smile. My mom would appreciate it. She always thought you were cute. The upteenth mixed drink helped make Eddie crack up. That's nice of her. He leaned back against the couch. I just... I can't imagine how much she means to you. And now this whole... In professor mode again, he started talking with his hands, spilling some of the drink. This mystery with her dad, I know it means a lot to you to give her some closure. With a trembling grasp, he took another sip. Never before had I seen Eddie Mueller get emotional. Sympathetic, sure, but never this shook up. Then again, this wasn't TV. Thank you, I responded. Fighting back tears, Eddie looked off at the screen. His tough facade not allowing him to give in to this vulnerable state. I spent a lot of time with my mom too. He gave me a weak smile. We watched a bunch of movies together. Oh, I'm sure. I pointed the assassin at him. And my mom damn sure loves watching you. Eddie chuckled. It keeps her going. Just me and those Saturday nights with Eddie, she tells me. My dad was that way as well. Eddie started. That's how we bonded. He waved toward the screen. Movies. This was the most personal episode of Noir Alley yet, and it was all for me. I stood there, mesmerized, spellbound by the czar. Eddie stood up off the couch. We'll get to the bottom of this. He held up his drink. For your mom. Then he escaped into the martini, literally drowning out his sorrow. I followed suit. The buzz then re-emerged in both of us. Our smiles collided. I gazed on at Eddie's face. Not even sudden gunfire from the movie made us jump. Breaking the slowly smoldering tension, Eddie stepped closer. You don't have a boyfriend in L.A.? The question caught me off guard. Not that I was against it. What do you mean? Using his drink, Eddie pointed toward my pocket. You haven't been on your phone much. Well, not every young person stays on their phone 24-7. I teased. Oh, I know. Eddie smiled. I just figured. You might have been talking to a guy. Or girl. I laughed. Well, no. There's no one in my life right now. Besides mom, anyway. Same here. Eddie said. Minus the mom part. I'm sorry. Eager to cheer him up, I gave Eddie a quick toast. But nice observation. Hey, I've done a lot of research. Watched a lot of detective movies. I like to think I'm the same way. Another sip of that assassin accelerated the confidence. That's like what we're doing now, isn't it? Especially visiting the hotel. A crime scene. I stepped in closer, closing the distance between Mueller and I. Two privates working the case. Sure. Eddie shrugged his shoulders. For such a clever neurologist, he was an obvious flirt. Or maybe you're the femme fatale. I think that's you. I hurled back with a smile. Oh, I like that. He pointed the martini at me. Post-feminist no war. Exactly. Brief silence then struck. Nothing awkward at all. Our smile staying put. Our stare starting to simmer at this point. A police siren blared off the screen. Its shrill beat matching my heartbeat. 
Eddie couldn't help but smirk at the film, then turned to face me once more. So when was the last time you went on a date to the movies? The confidence hit its peak. I staggered up to this Turner Classic movie, Matini Idol. The sexy host transplanted straight from mom's TV right to my fingertips. Tonight, the only reply I needed. To my relief, Eddie didn't resist. Instead, he caught me in his arms, still spilling more booze. Then I went in for the kill. A kiss to kill, that is. Together, our lips invented a new mixed drink, but the smell of alcohol didn't bother me. Nothing could bother us in this moment. A film noir behind us was our romantic beach view. Eddie's bar, our hotel suite. Grinning, I pulled back. One hand wrapped around Eddie's neck, the other holding on to that assassin for dear life. You're good, I said with a sly charm that'd make Bogart and Bacall proud. Likewise, Newly replied. I felt along Eddie's chest, then felt literal heavy metal where his heart should have been. What the hell? I smirked. Sorry, Eddie laughed. He places Martini on a counter before reaching inside his coat's breast pocket. What is it? Eddie pulled out a glorious flask. One with Barbara Stanwyck as double enmities Phyllis Diatrixin engraved on it. Totally badass. Wow, I exclaimed. Full of pride, Eddie held it closer to me. His megawatt smile, making this film noir world so much brighter. To me, anyway. Hey, you gotta be prepared, man. That night was bliss. The joy lasting all the way to morning. There was a movie marathon in that screening room. A marathon of booze brought to us by that lovely bar. And the fun continued all the way to Eddie's bedroom. The following day, I got up around 9. Well, Eddie was in the shower. I pulled my hair back in a messy ponytail. On the nightstand, Eddie's iPhone buzzed to life. Then that fear returned, an anxiety burrowing itself deep inside me. Eddie had an email notification from an address I was all too familiar with. T. Crenshaw. I grabbed his phone. To my surprise and secret joy, the preview was lengthy. I saw most of the message, the key phrasing hitting me like shocking jolts from a Nora era's electric chair. You better meet me tonight. I told you, I'd only talk to you like you said. I'll leave her alone till we're face to face. Many emotions hit me, conflicted me. So we were going to the Beresford Hotel, not due to Eddie's intuition, but because of the stalker Eddie told me he'd blocked. I didn't want to tell you. Eddie struggled to explain at his mini bar. By now, we were dressed and ready to go. Eddie in a checkered blazer, myself in a red sundress. Both of us chill, but professional, and holding our respective drinks. Two postmodern private eyes. I know Crenshaw was making you nervous, but you didn't have to lie. I interrupt him. I know, I know. Eddie gazed down at his bullion. Look, I was going to tell you when we were around. He smiled at me. One he knew was so cute. Called a surprise, I guess. I laughed. The second frozen margarita helping his cause. I know, I just... Groaning, I leaned back against the bar counter. It's just freaked me out a little. Well, I knew he was bothering you. I just decided to ask him about the Beresford and see what he had to say. Intrigued, I watched him. I gotta say the excitement replaced my disappointment. My first ever crime case ready to kick off. A twinkle appeared in Eddie's blue eyes. But hey, let's get lunch at Dog Patch. That's where they shot the opening scene. Well, supposedly. So we ate at Dog Patch. 
then later checked out various sites where Dark Knight at the Beresford were rumored to have been shot. Of course, no one knew shit about it. This was a lost movie after all. The two of us had fun. The investigation turning into a date the more it went on. Playing part-time tour guide and full-time film geek, Eddie's charisma never melted. The weather may have been perfect, but our chemistry became scorching hot by the time we made our way over to the Bears Ferd for another round. For the meeting with Crenshaw. He was supposed to meet us at the hotel bar at 8. And once 9 o'clock rolled around, we both began to doubt Crenshaw's appearance. Not that we cared. The bar served them up strong, and Eddie and I were enjoying one another's company, with or without the stalker. Only one thing broke up the good vibes. A text. I checked my phone to see a picture message from Mom. She looked somewhat... better. Or at least that gorgeous smile made it seem so. She was still in a hospital bed, the caption beneath her pic bringing back both the drive and disappointment I felt. Have you found anything? Miss you. Eddie sensed my sudden sadness. Are you alright? He leaned in closer next to me, keeping a respectful distance. Peyton. Everything was too much. The failed mystery, Crenshaw the no-show, and most of all, my mom's deteriorating condition. I demanded to leave and go straight to my safety net. Film nor noristas to be exact. We don't have to go there. Eddie had protested. Let's go somewhere else. Maybe dark underbellies. But I wasn't having any of it. I stormed out until Eddie pulled me back. Until I strong-armed him back to the salvation of noristas. The bar was quiet even on a Friday. Especially the smoker section I led Eddie into. A room completely empty besides us and thankfully, empty of current cigarette smoke. We ordered our drinks and appetizers and weighed in. It wasn't long before I felt my phone vibrate. Thinking it was mom, I rushed to check the screen. The new email was from Crenshaw. I now felt a fire inside. Not sadness, but a spark of excitement. Quickly, I opened the message before, even scanning the preview. Why didn't you show? It read. Then I saw another email arrive. Another one from Crenshaw. We were supposed to meet at the Roxy. I told Mueller. More anger hit me than anxiety. Especially toward Eddie. I looked over at him. Immediately, my glare brought him out of his buzz. Peyton, what's wrong? He asked, concerned. I showed him the message. Enough, son. Eddie groaned, guilty as charged. The guy's a creep, Peyton. It doesn't matter. I start in. I don't want him leading you into anything crazy. You lied to me. I told him, the drinks making my subtle rage a bit too transparent. Again. Okay, look. Eddie collapsed back in his seat. There's more. Why do you lie to me? You said this was about finding the truth. I'm sorry. Eddie sighed. Unsettled, he collapsed back in his chair, a flustered frustration crashing his cool demeanor. But there's more to this. Like what? I slammed my hand on the table. This is the goddamn reason I'm here, Eddie. I want to know the truth. I know. So stop fucking lying to me. Eddie paused. He looked off at the window, purposefully dodging my irate stare. It might not be what you expect. I don't care. Trembling, Eddie faced me. I mean, it might not be what you or anyone wants to know, Peyton. The scary sincerity startled me. I couldn't talk. Instead, I just watched Eddie. 
Look, I was trying to help. Eddie son. I mean, do you really want to know this? Do you really want to know the total brutal truth? Because this is your grandfather we're talking about here. I don't know if it was the day drinking, the mommy memories, the ultimate need for answers, but whatever it was, I fucking snapped. I grabbed Eddie by the blazer collar, startling the shit out of him. You listen to me. My son, I came here to find out what happened to Julie Harden's dad. I threw Eddie back in his seat, my sheer strength and willpower keeping him silent for once. And I'm not stopping till I get a goddamn answer. Then I did the unthinkable. I abandoned both my idol and another Mildred Pierce to storm toward the exit. That is, until Eddie's voice stopped me. Peyton, he said. I stopped at the door to face him, my glower contrasting his stoic stare. I wanted you to make your own decision, Eddie's son. Okay, that's all. I will, I replied. A nervous Eddie ran a hand through his hair. All right, I'll be here. I'll wait for you. I didn't even respond. Without further ado, I bid farewell to Eddie Mueller without ever actually doing so. The Roxy came calling T. Crenshaw, specifically. The theater was right beside Norista's. I didn't need Crenshaw's help considering there was only one screen in play tonight. The walls were bare, the lighting minimal, the concession booth a graveyard of expired candy. The place made grindhouses of yesteryear look like movie palaces. I didn't even message Crenshaw upon stepping inside theater number one. A sticky floor greeted me. I saw several broken seating chairs and a screen of many wrinkles. I was the only person in attendance other than the man in the fedora. The weird guy I saw in the Norista phone booth just last night. The guy sat in the second to last row and beckoned me to sit right beside him. A middle seat for a perfect view of the black and white movie sprawling before me. Why the hell not? This drunk... I took the bait. I didn't protest. I sat behind Crenshaw. Immediately, dark night at the Beresford grabbed my attention. As any cursed and lost movie on the big screen should. At first, the movie was charming. Full of film noir cliches. Yet they felt fresh. Mostly due to my grandfather's charisma. The Black Bogart sold every scene including a third act that left me horrified. I realized this was why the movie went incognito. Watching Dark Knight's finale deeply disturbed me. There my grandfather was in a cheap 1951 hotel room, a young white woman, his only companion. At first, the encounter appeared consensual, until a gun was revealed. A knife, all at the hands of Randy Gray. The woman then went from horrified to helpless, as did the audience. Quickly, the lady was bound and gagged by my grandfather, and a more than willing cast and crew. Unspeakable acts happened. The type of disturbing behavior too sickening to explain in detail. A gruesome slaughter captured on camera. What I was watching no longer became obscure film noir, but sensationalized snuff, and my grandfather was the star. Soon the screen faded to black. Only the theater's humming, antiquated air conditioning could be heard. No credits helped explain the movie's obscurity, aside from the horrific crime it showed on celluloid. I sat there in the cold, my body petrified in fear, my mind wallowing in repulsion, and a hand through my tears. Shedding tears not for Stanley Howard, but the lady in the movie, my grandfather's victim. Up above, dim lights flickered, 
Now the man in the fedora stood in front of me. This much closer, I saw wrinkles. Another telltale sign of old age. Regardless of the sunglasses, I knew he was staring right at me. His stance still somber. A film noir, grim reaper. But I didn't say anything. I needed to go. In one sickened swipe, I knocked the tears away and stood up. Then the man took off the glasses. A pair of big, soulful eyes greeted me. A sharp contrast to his cryptic costume. No wonder he kept them hidden. Her name was Sharon Maven. Crenshaw said, his voice vulnerable, meek. He lowered the shades as he looked away, exhaled in a painful gasp. She was my mother. Shit, I thought. And to think her humiliation, her death was on film. Forever. I'm sorry. I forced out through the yawnies. Really? Using the sunglasses, Crenshaw pointed toward the screen. It took me decades to find a copy. I let him do the talking. What else could I do? I stayed put in shame. I just... I wanted to know what happened to her. Crenshaw went on. He hesitated. Kinda like you. Just like me. I responded. Gonna take it to the police. T. Crenshaw trembled there. Nervous. Trying to be as gentle as possible when it was his mom that was butchered. I want the whole world to know what happened. Maybe they'll find her remains. I don't know. I just want closure. I understand. I do. He gave me a tip of the fedora. I just wanted you to know first. If you really wanted the truth, of course. I did. Then I turned, ready to leave the whole fucking scene behind. I gave Crenshaw a sympathetic look. But I'm sorry. I started to walk away. And tell. Do you want to know more? I stopped and turned to see Crenshaw. Some confusion appearing in his anguish. About your grandfather. He added. I know what happened to him. With a disgusted smirk, I shook my head firmly. No, I'm good. The man nodded. Then a sudden thought struck. A terrifying one. Just one thing. I sniffed and wiped away any trace of tears. Were there more? An uncomfortable Crenshaw paused. More movies? Yeah, I replied, my voice now more detached. I nodded over at the screen, the huge blank canvas like a ghostly portal. Ones like that, where he killed someone. At first, Crenshaw didn't say anything. His discomfort further manifesting itself in the form of restless hands and shifty eyes. I knew the answer. All Crenshaw did was give me a nod. I then left the Roxy in silence. I walked alone. Los Angeles and my mother's final days were calling me. Of course, I didn't know what to tell her. Who would? I just had one more stop before dialing a new bear. Behind a cynical glower, I stopped outside Norista's smoking section window. For one last look into this San Francisco Noir world, I was all too eager to leave. There was Eddie at the table, still waiting. By now, several empty drinks, part of his booze body count. Currently, he nursed a cup of coffee. I watched him pull the flask out of his breast pocket. Eddie always with a penchant for making his drinks stronger. Non-alcoholic beverages be damned. As he poured the bourbon into the coffee, Eddie looked up. He saw me. Instantly, his expression veered from neutrality to weary 
resignation. Eddie knew. He knew all along. He didn't stand up. He didn't rush out to greet me. There'd be no sappy reconciliation. No sentimental value. He knew how this story would end. We all did. Eddie put away the flask. Holding his latest cocktail, he stared on at me. My glare not going anywhere. Our exchange probably lasted seconds but felt like an eternity. After all, I felt born again when he called me. I felt alive when he investigated with me. Then I died when he lied to me. Finally, I turned and walked out into the dark night. I haven't talked to Eddie Mueller since. Nor did I ever reach out to Crenshaw again. I don't know what happened to my grandfather. I don't know if he went into hiding or got arrested or went overseas. I just hope he's dead. My favorite story as a child was called The Hideous Hair. Of course, it went by other names depending on who was telling it to you and what kind of mood they were in, but my father never liked that name. When we were snuggled in bed and he sat on our nightstand with his fingers running over the grooves in our dollar store lamp, he called it the hag and the hair. If he felt especially adventurous, he'd replace hag with a word we weren't allowed to say as the scrawny little ten-somethings we were. The story in question was a well-loved one, passed down from our thrice great-grandmother to her son, and from there to her daughter, and so on, all the way to our father. The lesson was simple enough to grasp, but it wasn't one learned by the glass slipper fitting on the princess foot or the frog shedding his slimy skin, for that of a prince. Once upon a time... My father would say in a hushed tone as if he were telling us some secret tale that was only for Jacob's and my little ears. There was an old hag who lived in a tiny house in the middle of nowhere. The hag in question did live in the middle of nowhere, and behind her house was a vegetable garden. Rabbits would come and steal bites from her carrots and lettuce, and she didn't like it. Not one bit. She hated rabbits. So, when fall raked the last of the trees bare, and winter's cold fingers crept up ever so slowly, she sat in her rocking chair reading how to get rid of the little bastards. That's when she heard the very first knock. It wasn't an ordinary knock, mind you. It was a thump knock. She knew it must be an animal at her door. When she moved to the door and threw it open... There stood a hare. It was white as the driven snow, but was by no means perfect. It bore mangled ears and an empty, bloodied socket where an eye used to be. The poor creature had seen some hardship, that was for sure, but of course, the old woman had no sympathy. Miss, if you might spare me some warmth for the night, I would be forever in your debt. My warren has flooded with the autumn rain. My father would always pitch his voice up an octave and soften his eyes when voicing the rabbit. The hag's voice was always a low, snapping tone like dry twigs in a fire. For a moment, the hag laughed. It was with the laugh of a mean old bitch, the kind that made you think of ruby slippers and gingerbread houses. You think I'm going to let a silly old rabbit stay the night in my house? That's a gag, a gag indeed. You better get off my porch, or I'll get my gun and splatter your freaky little face all over it. The hare, terrified for its very life, bounded away into the thicket. The next evening was colder still. The thump knocking came again as the hag was embroidering a small fox into the middle of a flower ring. She loved foxes. Foxes eat rabbits. Of course, they also eat chickens, but all of hers had disappeared several winters ago under mysterious circumstances. She stood and threw the door open yet again. She met the chilly air with disgust, just as she did the rabbit's renewed pleading. 
Miss, surely you can spare me a night's shelter. My body is so weary and I don't think I can stand another night in the cold, hungry forest. I will repay you however I am able. There was no laugh from her lips this time. She only stared down at the bastard bunny. You'd do better in the forest than you will if you keep tottering around my doorstep. Get gone, you hideous hare. With that, she made for the broom closet. Before it could feel the bite of straw, it scrambled away into the thicket once more. The next morning, the first snow of winter had just begun to grace the ground. The hag sat by a roaring fire with a pot of tea and a small platter of cheese and bread. When the thump knocking came for the third and final time, she stormed over to the door and wrenched it open. She could barely contain her fury as the rabbit pleaded. Please, miss, the snow has come, and I'll freeze to my very death. One night out of the cold is all I ask, no more. She stomped her foot, barely missing its paws. At this part in the story, my dad would jump to his feet and stamp his foot into the ground, spooking us without fail. Then freeze. If I see you on my doorstep again, I'll skin you good, you wretched little thing. With that, she slammed the door, nearly crushing the poor hare in the process. The rabbit began to squeak with desperation. She snatched the cheese knife from the small end table and made for the door. The hare opened its mouth to speak, but the hag gave it no time. She angrily stepped out to snatch it up and skin it into a nice fur hat, but she missed. It gaily ran inside, slamming the door behind her. Let me in, let me in, she cried as she heard the lock click into place. You'd better get off my porch or I'll skin you to a bloody pulp. The rabbit sneered. After banging for several minutes and a string of curses that would make the devil blush, she realized she was not getting back in and walked uncertainly into the night to beg for shelter just as the hare had done. And the hare? Well, it sat right down and finished her meal. Sitting on the old oak steps of the front porch, I remember wondering if my dad would tell us the story that evening. He wasn't up for telling stories much nowadays. Now, all we heard was his soft grieving from down the hall. That, and fire and brimstone, and the word of God from our aunt. There were many things our father wasn't up for anymore. Holding a job, feeding us, clothing us, caring for us when we were sick. That duty fell on my aunt at her insistence. I read the passage over and over absorbing almost none of it. My thoughts, scattered as they were, were interrupted by the crows of my aunt's rooster. I closed the Bible, placing it to the side to watch the snow gently falling. Snow was an odd sight in November around these parts, but the weathermen on the old fuzzy TV had said a cold front was coming in from the northwest. The cornstalk swayed in the gentle dusk breeze, and amidst it all sat the scarecrow. It was no ordinary scarecrow. I didn't know who'd made it, but it bore the face of a malnourished rabbit, a ridge above where each eye would have been cast deep shadows on its face, and its burlap skin was pulled tight, giving it a gaunt face to match its tattered ears. The body was painfully low effort compared to the face consisting of only two tree branches and a burlap bag stuffed with hay, all tied to a post. As the snow continued to fall, it dusted its limbs gently in white. My childish brain was stuck with the notion that the scarecrow might be cold. I stood when, walking back into the house, my steps were light as I crept to the front closet. In the time I'd been living in that old farmhouse, I knew that the less noise I made, the less my existence mattered. Generally, one would view that as a negative thing, but to me, it meant avoiding confrontation. I wasn't so lucky that night, though. I couldn't always be avoiding. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? 
my aunt snapped as I reached for the spare winter coat in the closet. The smell of sap clung to her skin and stained her fingers like blood. I considered myself lucky she did not still hold the axe. I was so caught off guard that I gave her my honest answer. I'm getting a coat for the scarecrow. It's cold. She let out a mirthless laugh. It was her way of saying, No the hell you aren't, without wasting her words. She slammed the closet door shut, nearly catching my fingers. I jumped. Where's the Bible I gave you? I realized a moment before the back of her firm, bony hand hit the back of my head that it was still sitting outside on the porch. Go get that damn Bible. You should be ashamed, leaving the good book out in the elements like that. Rotten girl. So, like the rotten girl I was, I immediately ran back outside to retrieve the Bible. The snow was falling thicker now. The graceful flakes mashed into blustery gray. The air tasted like dirty ice and pine. I pulled my jacket tighter around me as I clutched the Bible. The scarecrow was still sitting at its diligent watch. For a moment, I imagined it shivering in the cold. That's when I made up my mind. The yellow grass crackled under my feet. It was the kind that stayed perpetually crunchy, even in the lushest of springs. Hello, I said meekly as I came to a stop right in front of him. I thought you might like a little company. The hair crow gave no reply. I found myself relieved that it had not spoken back, as if that were a reasonable thing to fear in the first place. You looked lonely and cold, so I came to give you this. I shrugged the jacket from my shoulders and stood on my tiptoes to affix it to its branchy ones. The breeze that swayed the cornstalk slowly died. The quiet was serene until it went for too long. I felt the cold fingers of observance creep up my back. Something was watching me. How can you wash the fields if you don't have any eyes? I asked it, mostly to break the silence. Here, let me fix that for you. Everyone deserves to see, especially you. You have such a nice view of the sunset. I took out the permanent marker left in my overalls pocket from when Aunt Rachel had made me copy Bible verses earlier after I couldn't find her misplaced axe. I was nearly unable to reach, but I managed. I gave it the best rabbit-looking eyes I could. We stood there for a minute, observing each other. Finally, I turned back. I'll see you again soon. I tossed over my shoulder as I began to brisk walk back to the warmth of the house. My aunt was mercifully drooling in her rocking chair, some late night program droning on behind her snores. My father was awake in his room, even though I couldn't hear his voice. His grief was loud enough. I sat the Bible down on the china cabinet. My shoulders hadn't stopped shaking and I blew into my red hands trying to bring the feeling back to them. You really are one of a kind, Pandora. The scent of cocoa rose from the pot Jacob was stirring, warm and inviting. He was the one lucky enough to be allowed to use the stove out of the two of us. I watched you out the window, you know. My shoulders relaxed. They'd been tense since meeting the scarecrow for no particular reason. It had only been Jacob's eyes on me. I don't know why you'd get close to that scarecrow, much less give it your jacket. That thing, it freaks me out. He confessed as he poured the steaming chocolate into two silver mugs. I sighed. Nobody deserves to be alone, was all I could say. He rubbed his thumb over his bottom lip for a few moments, something he did when lost in thought, and then he smiled. Fair enough, but you'd better not go asking me for any of my clothes when yours are on that rabbit out there. You'll be running around yelling, my shoes, my shoes, the rabbit took my shoes. But you'll just have to be barefoot as that scarecrow tap dances all the way to New York City in little Pandora's Chuck Taylors. We both howled with laughter at this until we nearly woke my aunt. 
Once we drained our mugs and my body had returned to its normal temperature, we moved up the creaking oak stairs to our bedroom. Worn white bed cover swallowed us whole, and we both fell into a comfortable silence. There was no bedtime story from our father that night. Just as the first rays of sun were creeping over the windowsill, and the rats in the walls were beginning to quiet, Aunt Rachel woke us for school with little more than a, Breakfast is downstairs. Don't be late. She was a brash woman. Some would call her behavior abusive, and they'd be right. But in those days, it was all filed under the all-too-broad label of strict. Still, she did the bare minimum of keeping us alive and healthy. As I walked out onto the porch, where the thin layers of snow from the night before had begun to melt, I saw my jacket. Jacob dragged behind me, and I wondered if it was him who'd retrieved the jacket and left it there on the porch, so our aunt wouldn't turn my backside inside out. I just shrugged and put it on. Jacob met me at the bottom step with our school bags, and off we walked. It wasn't a long walk to and from school. The town had one bus and one route. It didn't end up in our neck of the woods, for one reason or another. Though school was a safe haven, I hadn't made any friends there. Today would be the day that that changed. That day was the day when the teacher stood at the front of the class with a girl clutching the back straps of her Lisa Frank backpack and introduced Naomi to the class. When I met the girl who showed me her favorite books among the middle school library shelves, when I met the girl who held my hand in the hallway and gave me a quick, innocent kiss behind the tunnel on the rickety playground, that day changed my life forever. I skipped down the dirt road home, Jacob trying his best to keep up with me. The breath of honeysuckle flowers in the air felt sweeter that afternoon. What's got you about to fly away, Pandora? Jeez, you're like a kite. For the first time since getting to school that morning, I felt a note of hesitation. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened had I kept my secret if I hadn't found validation in Jacob. I scanned around and then whispered as if the very trees and dirt had eyes and ears. I kissed a girl today, Jake. Instead of spiel about how it was wrong like some small part of me expected, an ooh rose from his mouth. The kind of jeering that fills classrooms when someone gets called to the principal's office. Pandora has a crush on somebody. Is it the new girl? We spent the last leg of our journey home lightheartedly bickering back and forth as all siblings tend to do. It was only when the house came into view that Jacob grabbed my arm and stopped me. There was a deep sadness in his voice. Pandora, listen to me. This is important. Whatever you do, you cannot tell Aunt Rachel about this. She... she won't like it. I want you to keep it a secret between us for now, okay? At that time, it didn't click in my mind why he'd said that. The bruises on Jacob's arms and legs, the cries of unclean from my aunt, and the sad look he often had in his eyes in that year we lived with her never truly hit me until the day it did. We got inside and were immediately put in work in the back garden. The afternoon moved slower than a slug in molasses until Aunt Rachel sent us to bed after a meal of watery chicken stew and a too hot bath. My muscles ached as I pulled open our window. I paused, listening for Jacob's slow and even breathing. When he didn't stir, I climbed out onto the front porch roof. I slid down the wooden support and turned my eyes out to the field. There sat that scarecrow. The half moon hung low in the sky above it, a yellow and slightly sour lemon wedge. I walked up to him as if approaching an old friend. Um, Mr. Hare Crow? No, that's not right. You need a name. Everybody needs a name. How about... Frith? 
The name had worked its way out of the corners of my mind. From when I lifted Watership down from the high school only section of the library, it fit in a way I knew nothing else would. The wind made the cornstalks sway. Almost in approval, I smiled. I love names, especially Naomi. I love the name Naomi. I imagined that the scarecrow was giving me a knowing look. Okay, I know, I know. I'll tell you what happened. So just like with my brother, I relayed my secret in a quiet tone, as if I was telling it the directions to some treasure deep in a swamp. Frith, for his part, listened patiently and quietly. I talked with him until the first hints of the sun lightened the night sky. Once I realized that dawn was fast approaching, I scrambled back onto the roof and onto my bun. I thought you'd gone and gotten yourself killed. I heard him before I saw him. Jacob was sitting up with his eyes weak from sleep. Then I went and looked out the window. Why do you like that scarecrow so much? It gives me the creeps. I sighed as I began to change out of my pajamas and into my school clothes. I hadn't shut my eyes the entire night. School would be exhausting today, even if it was better than here. He looks lonely. Nobody deserves to be alone, and I know I'm the only one who's brave enough to go spend time with him. I paused to pull on my shoes before adding, No offense, Jacob. He pulled himself out of bed, and the cycle of school, chores, homework, bed started all over again. Whatever free time I had was spent with my brother, my nose and whatever books I could hide from my aunt or talking with my quiet friend Frith. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and months turned into nearly a year. My aunt only got worse in her treatment of us. The nights we were sent to bed without supper and the pages of Bible verses we had written gradually grew in number. We saw very little of our father during that time, only the ghost of his footsteps moving to and from the kitchen or bathroom at odd hours of the night, and the whispers of weeping for our mother and his wife. I never blamed him for turning a blind eye to our abuse, and I still don't. He was at the bottom of an inescapable ocean. That was why, when he walked in on the night of Halloween, after we'd been sent to bed without supper yet again, Jacob and I were shocked to see him appear in our doorway. He looked fragile in the purest sense of the word. His perpetually sore eyes crisscrossed with red veins. He'd eaten very little food in the months since we'd gotten here, and his figure reflected that. He was more rake than man. He ran a hand through his matted orange hair and sucked in a breath through chapped lips. I held in my tears at the sight of him. You kiddos have time for a bedtime story? I saw the renewed joy in his eyes when our faces lit up. I think we can fit you into our schedule, Jacob said in a breathless, happy voice. He sat down at the edge of my bed as Jacob flew across the room to us. Our father started a tale about a little girl living high in a tower, but I stopped him. Dad, you should tell us something scary. It is Halloween after all. He rubbed his scruffy chin as he considered my request. You two are awfully young for that sort of thing, aren't you? I laughed a little. Dad, I'm 13. For a moment, his eyes filled with sorrow. I know now what that look meant. It was one of a man watching the lives of his kids slip by him, knowing he wasn't present for it. I guess you're right. After several long moments of deep thought, our father began to weave a tale about two little girls wandering in the forest on Halloween to find a magic well, only to find out it was haunted. It wasn't his best, but it kept us gripped until the very end. When his story concluded, he stood up and rubbed his face. I love you both so much. Don't ever forget that. 
He reached out a hand and offered us both a small brownie in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern. Our aunt didn't believe in Halloween, so there was no hoard of treats to be had for us. Jacob and I eagerly took the treats, and our dad smiled. As we filled our stomachs with the sweet chocolate goodness, he got to his feet and wiped at his perpetually weepy eyes. I'll be around more for you two now. I promise. I can't say for certain whether he would have kept that promise or not. I like to think that he would have. The weekend slipped by like a fish in oil. I stood at my locker just after lunch Monday morning, searching for my math homework. My face flushed when I felt two firm fingers press into my shoulder blade. Door, you'll never guess what I saw, Naomi whispered as if she'd seen into King Tut's tomb. I stood turning towards her. Her eyes were soft but sly. She was hell on wheels, but she made my heart sing. What? Don't leave me in suspense. She nodded towards the block of lockers where the obnoxious teen boys would often mill about in the sun. You see that locker over there? There's something in it. A playboy. I was a sheltered child. She said the word playboy with a drama that didn't land for me. What's that? She took my hand as we crept down the hall. It was beginning to empty out as stir-crazy kids piled into the worn jungle gyms and swings outside. It's a magazine with naked ladies. My jaw dropped. Seriously? I think I can get it for us. She said with a grin. The concept of something so scandalous and private in my young mind being proudly on display along with my still emerging sexuality made it an offer too tempting to pass up. We found the locker in question, and she held a callous hand up to her ear as she worked the cheap blue lock. Naomi was an artist, and her medium was mischief. When the padlock popped open with ease, she handed it to me. You do the honors. No snooping. We just want the magazine. Naomi had a strange sense of morals about such things. Thievery was fair game, but only in moderation. Nothing more than we came for. She would have made a wonderful Robin Hood. I pulled open the locker and my heart froze in my chest. It was empty save for a large white hair, twitching on the metal floor. Its head bent sideways, and dark, frothy blood dribbled out of its nose and mouth, pooling onto the floor. Bile rose in my throat as a jarring noise grew around me, from everywhere and nowhere. The dying squeals of a rabbit were something I should have considered myself lucky not to have heard before then. The cries felt like a child's, one that was screaming for their life. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the lockers on the opposite side of the hallway against my back. I tumbled to the floor as a wave of nausea and dizziness washed over me. Pandora, are you okay? Naomi helped me to my feet and steadied me. I pointed at the locker, blubbering something about rabbits. She looked, and then so did I. It was gone. I wondered... If it was ever there in the first place. I rubbed my eyes as Naomi nabbed the dirty magazine. I haven't been sleeping very well lately. I muttered. Bad dreams. She smiled and put a hand on my shoulder. That's what rabbits do, don't they? They disappear. I laughed. Then she laughed. Then we laughed so hard I forgot about what we were laughing about. She pulled me into the bathroom and we flipped through the pages of nude women in erotic poses as we huddled in the last stall on the right. When the bell rang, she pressed a soft kiss to my mouth and asked, Do you want to keep it? I stared at the outstretched magazine. The offer was tempting, yet so dangerous. Live a little. She joked in response to my hesitant expression. Open the box, Pandora. Okay. 
I finally relent and... Wait, one second. She took out her favorite purple sharpie. The one she always kept on her. I watched her scribble at the very last page. Right across the chest of a woman in a barely there bathing suit. It was an address and a phone number. As soon as I got home, I wrote it down in my journal. Had I not done that, Naomi likely would have been a middle school love. Lost to the endless march of time and life. But... That fate was instead replaced with a stream of letters that lasted well into my teens. Loving at first, but then only mutually friendly. I squirreled the Playboy away under my bed, tucking it so it lay parallel with the frame. There, I assumed it was safe. I dared not bring it out again unless I was sure I was alone, in the deadest of autumn nights. Another week trickled by. The following Monday was calm until we returned home from school. On that day, Jacob had been stopped by our Mastiff Blue in the yard. So much of my mental energy is spent on reflection and what-ifs. Wondering what would have happened had Jacob followed me like usual is one of the most persistent. The wind whipped dry red leaves around the front yard as I stared out the window in the kitchen. My stomach growled and I moved to fix myself a sandwich, wondering why my aunt had not yet accosted us for chores or homework. Behind me, I heard the quiet yet anxiety-inducing clacking of her shoes as she entered the room. I sat down the knife I'd been holding and for far too long. It was absolutely silent. Then, under her breath, I heard the words, Too many chances. And the devil in my house. I turned towards her and was knocked off balance by the backside of her hand crashing into my face. Her voice was full of cold fury. Do you want to tell me what this is, you wretched little thing? I whimpered as she knocked me to the hard kitchen floor. I knew exactly what it was. It was the goddamned playboy. I thought I'd hidden it well enough. I was wrong. You sinful little harpy, with your book full of whores. She snatched up my hair and started dragging me out through the doorway and towards the stairs. I thrashed desperately. You disgusting little freak. I've tolerated this long enough. I've allowed Satan to take up residence in my house. I will not have it any longer. Your sin will not go unpunished. Her voice popped and cracked with an unspeakable rage, less curt than it had been before. My fingernails raked at the stairs and anything else I might try and gain purchase on as my head thumped against each solid wooden step. My nose hit the wall at one point, exploding with blood. I tasted dust and copper. By the time we were on the second floor, I was too dizzy to scream for help. She dragged me into the bathroom and slammed the door, locking it. You will both have to stand before the Lord and be judged. I will make sure of it. He will throw your wretched, miserable souls into the great inferno. I wailed as she began to fill the tub with water. Urgent footsteps pounded around the kitchen downstairs, though I could not decipher their owner. Pulling myself up, I tried to throw myself towards the door caught me by my neck. Please. I begged. Please don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She spit in my face. If you are lucky, maybe this water will purge you before you stand before God Almighty. She whispered as she plunged my head underneath the icy water, and my world went blurry. My body burst into uncontrollable shivers as I flailed desperately. I could feel my lungs filling with cold water as my aunt held her grip. As she slammed my face against the porcelain bottom of the bathtub, crimson bloomed out into the water. For a moment, I thought of death. I wondered whether fire and brimstone truly would be waiting for me on the other end. Then I heard the screaming, the clatter of metal on metal, the breaking of glass, 
and the barking of a dog. Behind all that, I could hear another sound my delirious brain couldn't recognize. My aunt released me and stood up, storming out the bathroom door with a slew of curses. I threw myself from the tub, throwing up mouthfuls of frigid water before gulping in as much air as I could. I struggled onto weak legs and ran for my life. I rammed my shoulder into the back door and tumbled ass over elbows down the back steps. I could hear the cacophony of noises that had freed me from my watery grave better now. Jacob had heard my desperate struggles. That was why he was running around the front yard, shouting blasphemies and obscenities and banging our only two pots together. My aunt was chasing him with a knife. Behind that, there was an ever-present cloud of cawing. A swarm of carrion birds blotted out the sun. I spilled out into the barn out back and slammed the big wooden door behind me, pushing some dust-coated farm equipment in front of the door. When the bang started at the door, I climbed into the loft and picked the corner with the least amount of spider webs. I shivered there for hours, blood drying on my face as my mind created shapes in the dark. I watched figures made of shadow dig their claws into the sides of the loft and pull themselves up ready to devour me. I could feel the whispers of their fingers on my face. I didn't leave the barn until slivers of moonlight peeked in through the rotting wood slats. My clothes were still damp as I trudged over to one of my only friends in this damned place. My breath came out in frigid clouds as I focused on drawing air in and out. She tried to drown me. She tried to kill me. I was going to die. I collapsed against Frith's sturdy wooden support and began to sob. I can't go back inside. She'll do it again. She'll do it again. I'm gonna freeze out here. As I curled my knees into my chest and wailed in earnest, I felt something on my back. A thin scraping, like the comforting touch of a mother, but in all the wrong ways. In my periphery, I saw it. The end of a gnarled branch curled into knotted fingers. I couldn't move. The wind whistled around in the stalks of corn. It almost sounded like whispers. I launched off of the ground and ran around to the back of the house. Jacob sat there beside the crawl space door where he'd no doubt been hiding. He looked at me with a swollen black eye. Blood was caked onto his deep frown, and his nose bent just a little too far to the right. A long slash ran across his chin and jawline, a battle scar from saving my life. Guilt seized me for not coming to his aid. At that moment, I felt like a coward. She's gone insane. Dad isn't in his room. I think she might have killed him. She hadn't murdered our father, of course. He'd gone into town that day to look for work. He wanted to turn our lives around. But as children, suffering from the hands of an aunt in a murderous rage, there was little else we could come up with. I didn't tell Jacob about the scarecrow, how it had touched my back with its crackly tree hand and winked its marker eye at me. Too much was going on, and though I knew he would believe me, there was only so much a mind like his could stand. We snuck back into the house, Jacob pulling me along and whispering reassurances as we climbed the stairs, our feet as close to the wall as possible to avoid making the old wood creak. I could only breathe easy once we were in our room, and the door was locked. It was a small barrier between us and the mad woman that now wanted our blood spilled, but it was a barrier nonetheless. We have to run away. Dad can't save us now. Jacob was shoving things into a bag. I was still so tired and so very cold. I stripped out my damp sweater, desperate for dry warmth. Morning? Can't we wait until the morning? I whispered. 
Jacob looked at my way as I curled into the fetal position under the meager white blanket. His expression was heavy with a fight between fear and concern. Okay, morning. But then we have to go. I rubbed my eyes hard. We'll sleep in shifts. He paused before nodding quietly. Jacob coaxed me out of bed and helped me into my dry clothes, keeping his eye on the door as often as he could. My brother. My protector. You'd better wake me up. I mumbled as my eyes grew too heavy to stay open. He didn't respond, instead merely throwing his blanket over me and causing a deep shiver to rack me. The kind you get when the warmth is finally returning to your body. I knew he would end up letting me sleep. My dreams were plagued with dark visions. Twisting, animalistic bodies dipping in and out of shadows as I could hear the cries for help from my brother somewhere in the distance accompanied by the wail of a discordant calliope. I shot upright in bed sometime in the early hours of the morning. Jacob lay against my bed. His breathing deepened in light sleep. Behind it, I could hear an odd sound. The creaking of the front door on its hinges no doubt pushed by the wind. I slowly got to my feet and slid them across the wooden floor to the door. Against my better judgment, I disengaged our bedroom lock and slowly pushed the door open. The house was icy and my shivers returned in full force. I coughed quietly into my hand as I came to the top of the stairs. As my bare feet descended the wooden steps as quietly as possible, I found myself reciting a prayer I'd heard whispered by my grandmother above my mother's pale body. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I could hear thumps in the living room. It sounded like the movements of some sort of wild animal. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb. The air smelled sour like rotting plants and urine. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. Terror seized my lungs, making it hard to breathe as I neared the bottom. And at the hour of our death, I reached the bottom step and peeked into the living room, holding my aunt above the floor as her pink slippered feet swung frantically was. Freth. Its long, knotted branches hovered just in front of her face, and my aunt's skin looked paper white in the glow of the TV. How the scarecrow kept upright on its single support post, I couldn't tell you. Physics bent to the will of whatever this thing truly was. The burlap was pulled tight around whatever laid beneath it, and yellow eyes with wide black pupils bulged out of the rips. Swaths of rough brown fabric hung from the mouth and cheeks revealing a mouth filled to near, bursting with white, dinosauric teeth. Before I could so much as blink, the scarecrow sunk its makeshift claws into her neck. A fountain of blood erupted from her mouth and then everywhere else as it dragged its impossibly sharp digits through her neck like a sword through hot butter. Her headless body made a wet thump as it hit the floor. A small whimper escaped my mouth and the hare's head snapped to look at me. She'd deserved it, make no mistake. But in the moment, I felt no sense of satisfaction. All I felt was insurmountable fear. I shrieked as I flew up the stairs. I could hear Jacob jump to his feet and my body crashed into his as I flung myself into our room. Go, now. But we didn't have time to make it out the window. As the door opened, I flung Jacob towards my bed, and we scrambled underneath. We both heard the steady thumps as the monster I'd formerly known as Frith crept into our room. Pandora, Pandora, what is that? Jacob's voice was quiet and urgent, and I pressed his face into my chest. Nothing, Jacob. Keep your eyes closed. Don't you look, okay? He'd protected me. Now I was doing the same. It stood over my bed, staring down into my eyes with its wide, 
soulless ones as I held Jacob close to me. That was all I knew until the sun began to creep over the cornfields. Its eyes and mine. I didn't know whether or not it intended for me to meet the same fate as my aunt. As dawn ran its fingers through the hills and forests of Tennessee, the scarecrow broke our staring contest. As soon as it began to move, I squeezed my eyes shut tight. It leaned down, and with a wooden claw, it stroked my right cheek. A thin trickle of blood ran its way down my neck, but still, I remained frozen. It withdrew, and I heard the slow thumps of it retreated down the stairs and out the front door. I still have that scar. Despite the sun spilling into the room from the window, we didn't move from our spot under the bed. The terror and innocence both left my body in one great outpouring as the exhaustion of someone that's witnessed a murder took hold. I pulled Jacob closer as my eyes slipped closed. The sound of a scream woke me. It was the voice of a man, one I hadn't heard in so long. It was our father, our real father, not the ghost that had so long wandered through oaken floors of the farmhouse when we'd long since fallen into our beds. Before Jacob and I could fully get out from under the bed, he'd flung up the stairs and thrown open our door. His face was flushed, and his eyes were full of a vibrant sort of terror. The kind only a father who's seen dark blood staining the floor all the way to the back door, and his sister and children nowhere to be found could feel. He was alive again, grief stamped out like a dying fire pit by fresh air. Kids, are you okay? I hated seeing him so worried but running into his outstretched arms felt like rising from the grave. Things moved extremely fast after that. Police were called. The farmhouse was cordoned off with yellow tape that whipped in the late November wind. The cornfield where one scarecrow had gone AWOL was stripped bare. We found a temporary home in a shitty little inn on Main Street. The sanctioned search for my aunt didn't last long. On the third day, everyone went to sleep, and when they brought their trucks back and assembled their grids, they made a grisly discovery. My father refused to tell me what had been found until I was much older. Sitting on top of the pole where Frith had once been was my aunt's severed hen. Her milky eyes still filled with a cosmic sort of horror, like she'd seen the very devil she preached so adamantly about. Laid out on the ground in front of it was a blood-soaked Bible. The same Bible that my aunt had made us read innumerable times. Every single line of text in the entire Bible was indecipherable, except for one verse. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Shortly after that, we were packing things away into boxes and loading them into our father's truck. After some light pressing, my brother admitted to our father what our aunt had done to us. There were many emotions, and all of them crowded over one another for center stage. Despair at losing his sister, really losing her, in a way that death can't hold a candle to. Guilt for not seeing the bruises on Jacob or the unspoken pleas in our eyes on the rare occasions he'd leave his room. Sadness that the love of his life was not here to advise him on where to go next or what to do now. But the greatest of there was rage. A boiling fury at the attempted murder of his children at the hands of someone he trusted. That anger has never fully gone away. We left town two days before the funeral. To this day, Frith's motives are still unclear to me. It's possible that the Scarecrow was some sort of unorthodox protector. I'd been an only friend to him, and it was returning the favor. Maybe it was never something to be feared. But sometimes, 
I find myself looking up places I've been in the early hours of the morning, and Google takes me to that little town. Each time I see the slowly increasing amount of missing persons reports, it's hard not to feel that breath was a hair of a darker color. I'm not a fan of shopping malls. Why shop in real life when online stores exist? It baffled me that people preferred shopping in public when they could sit in the comfort of their own home with a frothy latte. The newest styles just a tap away. My parents are not exactly technologically advanced. Sure, they own a phone and an iPad, which they're practically glued to all day. But mom is convinced that if she uses her credit card online, some anonymous scammer will empty her bank account. Those things do happen, I'm not saying they don't. But mom won't even online shop on big brand clothing sites. Ones that have a very clear, we are not a scam banner at the top of the page. Over the last year, she's been kind of forced to use online stores. But mom still hates it. She still asks me 100 times if the transaction is safe, and then goes into panic mode when the page freezes. It doesn't freeze because of some faceless entity stealing all her savings. It freezes because she taps buy now repeatedly. The only site mom trusts is Amazon, and it took her a year to fully get used to buying things. Well, I guess she was forced to get used to it. When we went into lockdown, mom had to swallow her stubbornness. Unlike my mother, I don't go to the mall unless I absolutely have to. Or my friend drags me there on a day out. I preferred the park, or maybe the local swimming pool, but Nina wasn't the type to argue with. When she rang me a few days ago, excitedly gushing about a shopping trip she had been planning all morning, I felt like I had to say yes. I graduated back in May, and I'm taking a gap year before college next year. Nina was doing the same, but job searching wasn't on her mind. Shopping was. She was talking so fast, so convoluted, I could barely understand her. But I got the gist of it. It was sale season and Nina was eager to be first in line. Now, I'm not sure if I've made it clear, but I hate going out in public. I've suffered from anxiety since I was a kid and untreated. It bled into my teenagehood. I take meds for it, and I'm not as bad as I used to be, but I still hate enclosed spaces, such as our local mall. I'm fine going to school or a job, but being in a crowd is just a no-no. Greensleigh is a small town, and I like that. Nina wants to move to New York or LA, but city's life terrifies me. I can't even go to the mall without freaking out. I can't even imagine what moving to a big city like New York would do to me. Anyway, I didn't exactly have a choice that day. Mom and Dad were at work, and I used the excuse that I was job searching with Nina. It started out fun. We got takeout noodles from a fancy Japanese restaurant that Nina insisted on paying for, and scoured Barnes & Noble. The problem started when Nina started in the clothes stores. I say stores, but she spent pretty much all afternoon in Forever 21. Sure, I like looking at clothes, but Nina takes ages. Last summer, during a heat wave, she took nearly three hours in one store. I was hoping history wasn't going to repeat itself. After all, I had told her multiple times I didn't want to spend forever in the clothing stores, and Nina had laughed, insisted that she wouldn't even be half an hour. When an hour passed, and she was still staring at the same dress and bag combo, I realized I'd made a mistake. Two hours passed, then three. I'm not sure what I ended up doing. Forever 21 was right in the middle of the mall, just next to the food court. I knew the exits by heart, but once my stomach started twisting with nausea, that oh-so-familiar prick of panic creeping up my spine, my palms grew sweaty. I tried to follow Nina, tried to give her compliments, but after several pathetic ones riddled with the same adjectives, I ended up walking around aimlessly. 
I tried to distract myself with my phone, but the smell of food was making me feel sick. There was a record store opposite, and I spent maybe two minutes in there. But the music was too loud. The crowd outside was growing, and I felt like I was suffocating behind my mask. I had to get out. That's all I could think. I had to get out. I had to suck actual air into my lungs, or I was going to die. That was my mind talking. I know it was. I know it was stupid, but once the thought was rooted, I couldn't suppress it. Felt like I was drowning and I could no longer remember the exits. I could taste the noodles from lunch in the back of my throat. I was going to throw up. My mind kept telling me. I was going to throw up and everyone was looking at me. I find it hard to tell people that I'm sick so I end up not telling them. I keep it to myself and pray that I start to feel better. Except at that point, I was shaking. I could barely breathe and I keep swallowing bile coating the back of my throat. When I found Nina standing in front of a mirror, holding a dress to her slim figure, I had to choke back a sob. Hey, I tried to smile, I tried to act like I was fine. Nina, we've been in here for ages. He's cute. Nina cut me off, twirling around, her blonde hair a halo in her face. I've always envied her looks compared to mine. Well, Nina looks like a model, I'm kind of bland. In her hands were a combination of the exact same skirt, and I struggled to figure out what she was talking about when my gaze followed hers. Nina was talking about a mannequin a few meters away. Forever 21 had a guys and girls section, with the girls section being downstairs and the guys at the bottom of an escalator. Though, in the girls section, or the summer slash fall collection, there were a myriad of mannequins, both male and female. The one Nina was staring at was an adult male mannequin. It wore a tight black shirt, skinny jeans, and sunglasses. Like my friend, once I'd caught sight of it, I couldn't look away. Nina must have been thinking the same thing as me because she turned to me, a grin plastered on her lips. Men. She marched over to the mannequin and ran her manicure down the material of his t-shirt. That is the hottest fucking mannequin I've seen in years. She gushed. Are we like, totally sure he's not real? I was fairly sure of it. Not he wasn't real. The thing was plastic for God's sake. Though I couldn't help agreeing with her, at least at the back of my head. Mannequin didn't look human. That wasn't it. But it didn't look like a mannequin either, if that makes sense. Nina's eyes were wide. She cocked her head to the side, her lips curling into a frown. I know this sounds crazy, but does he look familiar to you? I expected her to be joking around, but her expression was deadly serious. Like, I feel like I've seen him before. That's crazy, right? I folded my arms giving the mannequin a once-over. She was right. I didn't recognize the face because there wasn't really one, at least not at a first glance. When I looked closer, however, there were facial features I couldn't ignore. Looking past the plastic sheen, the perfect jawline, I realized I was seeing exactly the same. But I would never say that. Nina needed glasses, but insisted on wearing contacts on a prescription that barely helped her. I'd lost count of how many times I'd had to yank her out of the way of a car. Him? Nina, it's a plastic doll. But Min, how can you not see it? She snorted out a laugh. He's got actual eyebrows. Her eyes snapped to his lower torso and kept going. I knew where she was looking and I felt my cheeks grow warm. Nina, are you done? Her gaze snapped to me. Why that much detail, though? Her lips curved into a smirk, and she squealed, nearly bumping into a passing woman who shot her an odd look. It is so we can show off to the girl mannequins. I was slowly losing my patience. We're probably making them more human-like to market the clothes better. Nina scrunched up her face before sighing with a nod. She took a step back. 
I didn't move. Maybe it was the sick feeling that was growing worse in my gut, but my feet were glued to the floor. I wanted to look at the mannequin properly when a bustling crowd of teenagers weren't around me. Part of me expected Nina to marvel at more, but she shook her head with a grin. You're right, he's plastic, but it's kind of hot, right? She waggled her eyebrows at me. Is it weird that I'm crushing on actual plastic? I ignored the comment and forced myself to follow her to the changing rooms, where she spent nearly an hour picking out the best outfits. When Nina was done, the store was emptying. The sales assistant crept up behind us. She looked tired, though, was somehow maintaining a Cheshire cat grin. I wondered how many girls like Nina showed up on a daily basis. We close in five minutes. You two should head to the checkout counter. Nina bought four t-shirts and three dresses. When she was swiping her card, my dancing stomach decided it really needed to go to the bathroom. I was half aware of a bathroom by the changing rooms. Hey, I'm gonna head to the bathroom. I said, my cheeks blazing. Don't wait for me, okay? I'll walk home. Just the idea of sitting in Nina's car without air conditioning for 45 minute drive made me want to curl into the ground and die. Nina looked baffled, but she nodded. Are you okay? Her eyes narrowed. Min, you look kind of pale. I'm fine. I choked out, backing away. It's my... it's my time of the month. Oh, okay. Nina's expression brightened. Do you need a pad? I shook my head. No, it's fine. She nodded, swinging her bags around. The motion made me feel worse. Hey, do me a favor. My phone died, but I really want a pick of Daniel. Can you get one when you come out? Daniel? She giggled. Behind the counter, the sales assistant laughed along. The mannequin. You know, the hot one. Ah, uh, yeah. The sales assistant nodded while folding up Nina's clothes. Our mannequins get a lot of attention, particularly the male ones. Though we have had several boys taking selfies with the girl mannequins. It's adorable. Nina, with her usual charm, grinned. The one by the door is gorgeous. How do you make them so lifelike? No idea. The sales assistant shrugged. They've been here for a while. I only started last year. Hey, men. Nina was in Nina land. Though I wasn't surprised. Do you think if we grab him and run, we'll get caught? I didn't reply, dashing to the bathroom. I don't know how long I spent in there. I could hear voices from outside, staff shouting their goodbyes between colleagues. The noodles from the Japanese place didn't exactly agree with my stomach. I scrolled through my Instagram, searching for anything to distract me. Nina had already made a post with an unflattering snap of the two of us in front of a mirror. I liked and commented. I thought it was food poisoning, but I didn't throw up. I had the stomach pains and nausea, but I didn't actually barf. When the pop music stopped playing over the speaker, and the lights flickered off outside, I panicked. The words, wait, were stuck in the back of my throat, but I swallowed them down. The bathroom, thankfully, was well lit. I did a quick once-over in the mirror. My cheeks were pale, and I looked horrific, but at least Nina was gone. When I hesitantly slipped through the gap in the door, I stepped out straight into the pitch-dark hallway leading back into the store. The lights were still on, though there was no sign of anyone. The checkout counters were empty. The shutters were yet to be pulled down, so I hurried for the exit. Instead of leaving the store, though, I found myself gravitating towards the hot mannequin once again playing with my phone in my hands. Nina wanted a photo, and sure I could tell her I didn't have time, but part of me wanted to snap a picture of it too. Something about it, the way it was perched on its stand, human-like features carved into glistening white plastic, gave me the creeps. Still though, I took a few steps back and held up again, this time with flash on. I removed the Ray-Ban so I could get as much detail as possible. But once I was seeing eyes that were far too intricate, I snapped more photos to get it over with. 
The mannequin's eyes were freaking me out. If I suspended my disbelief for a moment, I found myself wondering how long the design had taken. Someone must have spent hours carving the iris and each individual lash. I wasn't really paying attention to the mannequin. My attention on the photo. I was staring at it, and the twisting feeling in my gut worsened. But it wasn't because of food poisoning. I could have sworn the mannequin had blinked. Peering at the photo, it didn't look like a full blink. More like its eyes were flickering. Moving. Ow! The voice. The male voice. Which sliced into the silence. A voice that shouldn't have been there sent me stumbling backwards. My phone flying out of my hands and hitting the floor with an audible crack. In front of me, the mannequin's eyes had blinked open and were half-lidden. Staring at me in confusion. No, I wasn't crazy. I was seeing emotion. Actual emotion in its face. When it brought up its hands to stare down at them and then claw at its face, I realized it had fingernails. It moved like a human being, not like a plastic doll. The mannequin's gaze was stuck to its own hands, and then its eyes, its human eyes the color of warm chestnut, were settling on me. The longer I looked at it, or I guess, him, I understood what Nina said was right. The mannequin did look human, it looked too human to be plastic, to be a doll, and yet, when I drunk him in fully, trapped in my own state of paralysis, he was starting to look less plastic, like it was dripping away, revealing light, tanned skin. Fuck. The mannequin blinked, his voice a soft croak. When he blinked again, this time rapidly I glimpsed veins of dark red bleeding to life, my heart catapulted. There was no way. I thought dizzily. There was no fucking way that much detail had been put in. There was no way I wasn't looking at a person. How? How long has it been? His words were hitting the sound barrier, but I wasn't registering them. All I could think was that I had to get out. Whatever was happening, I wanted no part in it. I was hallucinating. Thought hysterically, taking slow steps back. One step, two, but I couldn't turn around. Not yet. I couldn't stop staring at the mannequin, which was looking less and less like a mannequin by the second. I wasn't looking at a plastic doll. I was looking at a boy. No, a man. Maybe 19 or 20. His expression, I could only see pain. I could only see fear. And it didn't make sense on a mannequin's face. Because I was supposed to be looking at one, right? I'd been around him all afternoon, following Nina around. I'd passed him multiple times, and not once did I wonder if there was a living, breathing human under there. What I was seeing defied logic and science and reality. It shouldn't have been real. It shouldn't have been staring at me right in the face. So I did what any other person would do. I ducked down grabbed my phone, and ran. At least, I tried to run. I had only taken three shaky steps before a sharp yelp filled the air. When I twisted around, the mannequin had crumpled to the floor. When he lifted his head to look at me, I caught tears glistening on perfect cheeks. He was crying. Please, he croaked, struggling to get up. But his body was failing him. Every time he tried, he dropped back down with a startled cry. I found my gaze gravitating towards his cheeks, and I swore something was chipping from his cheek. Falling away. Tiny white flakes dancing in the air. Everything inside me, every instinct I had was telling me to leave him. To run for it, but the boy was hysterical. He reminded me of a child who couldn't walk yet. When he failed to get up once again... He held out a trembling arm. Please, you have to help me. I don't... I don't know where I am. I keep waking up and I don't know where I am. I see... I see faces staring at me and I can't move. I can't... I can't fucking breathe. When he broke down, I found myself wrapping my hand around his arm hesitantly. 
I nearly let go, shivers spiking up and down my spine. I didn't touch plastic. I touched skin. I touched skin that had been hardened to look like plastic. I couldn't help myself. The words slipping out. You're a mannequin. I hissed out sharply. I couldn't stop myself from running my fingers up and down his arms, touching real skin. When I risked tracing his lips and nose and eyes, they were real. His hair, which had been slicked back, seemed to come to life. Dark curls bouncing back into place. Didn't make sense to me. Nothing made sense to me. He was a mannequin, and he wasn't. He was an inanimate doll, then he wasn't. The boy hissed out, waving me away. Can you stop? His eyes were wide, lips curled almost like an animal. Do I look like a fucking mannequin to you? But... The camera flash. He muttered more to himself than me. The camera flash brings us back. Before I could speak, he sent me a panicked look. His eyes growing frenzied. Dad? Is Dad here? Dad? I repeated in a whimper. He nodded. I don't remember much, except Dad. All I remember is drowning. I remember screaming into freezing cold water. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't shout or cry. I was going to... I was going to die. And I felt arms around me. It was Dad. He pulled me out and helped me breathe again. He gave me my breath back. There was a light smile on the boy's lips, as if he was reminiscing before his expression darkened. And he wouldn't let us go. He wouldn't let me see my mom. And when I tried to get out, he... He did something to me. He took away my thoughts and my breath. And I was... I was lost. I was lost for so long, and then this boy... He trailed off, his voice breaking. This kind boy. One day he brought me back. I don't know how, but I could breathe again. He told me he was going to get us out. All of us. He told me he was going to take us home and I was going to see my mom again. And then dad took him away and I fell asleep again. Fell asleep until now. My mouth was filled with questions, but I choked them back when he forced himself up, holding out his arms to steady himself. When I offered help, he shook his head. I watched him stumble over to another of the mannequins, a pretty female one brandishing a light pink summer dress and Ray-Bans. I didn't want to properly look at her, because I knew when I did, I'd get the same feeling. I wasn't looking at a mannequin. I was looking at a person. I didn't want to think that, that the mannequin was just like the boy, trapped behind a spell I still couldn't understand. Skin and blood and bodily organs armored under plastic. I thought about the way Nina had laughed and the mannequin hours earlier, shouting that the mannequin's body sent unrealistic expectations for women, except it was a real body. Jessa. The boy whined. He stood on his tiptoes, wrapping his arms around her and trying to heave her off her stand. He twisted around to face me. Don't just stand there. I need to get her down. A camera flash brings us back, so do the same to her. He was yelling, and I didn't have the heart to tell him my phone was dead. I'd max it out completely with the photos of him for Nina. I couldn't move. Watching the boy try to heave the female mannequin off of the stand, I wondered if I was losing my fucking mind. When he couldn't lift her, he dragged his feet over to a second male mannequin, one with a leather jacket and designer shirt underneath. Noah, he said in a breath. Fuck, I'll get you and Jessa out if you're okay. Just hold on a bit longer. We're, we're getting the fuck out of here. Without turning to me, his hand still grasping Noah's arm, the boy choked out a sob. What you did to me, he said shakily. Can't you do it again?
my phone's dead. I said softly. But, but don't worry. I'm going to help you. The boy broke down, his knees hitting the floor. I felt the emotion writhing through him. I need to get out. He was whispering, tearing at his hair. I need to get out. I need to get out. Please, please help me get out. I just want to go home. I want my mom. I don't want to be here anymore. Somehow, I coerced words in my mouth. You're not going to be, I said. I'm getting you out. He looked skeptical, his gaze going to his lap. All of us? You promise? I nodded. What's your name? The boy lifted his head to look at me and I caught desperation in his eyes. My name is... Ben. A male grunt sounded, and the boy stiffened. Young man, where are you? You know your father doesn't like it when you leave your stand. Shit. Ben grabbed me, struggling to pull me to my feet. His face was inches from mine, a hot breath feathering my cheeks. If I'd had any doubts he wasn't human, that moment crushed them. The police, he said, grasping my hands and squeezing hard. Go to the cops and bring them here. I don't think I can run, and I'll only slow you down. Listen to me. You have to get them to listen. Even if you sound crazy, get them to come here. I wanted to argue with him. I wanted to tell him that there was no fucking way the cops would believe me. And I didn't want to leave him. I didn't want to leave him to a fate worse than death if I failed. Ben Maddox. Ben whispered. His fingers entangled with mine. Hot and sticky with sweat. And I reveled in the feeling of real human flesh. He was real. Ben was real and I was going to get him out. I was going to end his nightmare. My name is Ben Maddox. He gestured to the accent. The shutters were halfway down. Go. Footsteps. I had to slap a hand over my mouth. Oh, Ben. The man's voice was soft. You know I don't like it when you disobey me. Before I could speak, he jumped up on shaky legs and raised his arms. All right, Dad. You got me, he said loudly. And I took that as my cue to make a run for it. I didn't think. I just ran. I ran until I was at the mall's exit, stepping out into fresh, cool air. It was night. The sky pitch black. The police station wasn't far. And I found myself sitting in a box-like room in front of a cop who looks around my dad's age with grayish hair and stains down his shirt. I had been hysterical and out of breath when I'd ran into the station. They provided me with a glass of milk that I kept sipping until my stomach complained. I could barely believe anything that had happened. There were still holes I couldn't understand. Like how Ben and Jessa hadn't aged, and how their skin could look and feel so much like plastic. With doubts still haunting the back of my mind, I still told the officers everything ignoring their raised eyebrows and twitching lips. Let me get this straight. He eyed me like I was crazy. I felt crazy. The cop had a notepad, but when I glanced at it, he'd only written Forever 21 and Mannequins. You're telling me the mannequins in Forever 21 are actual people? I nodded, gulping down the rest of my milk. I know I sound crazy, Ben told me that, but if you just go there and see yourself, Ben? The cop raised an eyebrow, the door slid open, and a female officer strode in. I nodded. Ben Maddox, I said sharply, and, and Jessa, I think her name was. Ben Maddox? The officers exchanged glances before the man fixed me with a steely glare. He sat back, picking up his notebook and flicking through it. Young lady, have you heard of the Moorhead incident? Something cold slithered down my spine. I shook my head, even when I had, at least vaguely. 
Mom had talked about it a few times, and maybe Nina, but I was never interested enough to ask them to expand. The woman came to sit opposite me. Miss Atlas, can you confirm you're talking about Ben Maddox and Jessa Sharp? Her eyes darkened. Because Ben Maddox and Jessa Sharp have been dead for six years. What? I couldn't resist a startled laugh, but the officers weren't smiling. Before I could continue, the woman was pulling out her own phone with a sigh. On the 7th of October 2015, five students from Moorhead University tragically lost their lives when their bus drove off of a bridge. They looked for bodies, but apparently they were either swept out to sea or crushed on the rocks down below. She placed her phone in front of me. There was a photo of a news clipping showing a headline, but I didn't look at the headline. My gaze landed on a small, grainy picture of a group of college students, with Ben in the front smiling brightly, his arms around a girl who looked like she was mid-laugh, and a guy pulling a face. Their parents wanted no traces of the incident on the internet for privacy. The woman murmured. However, I kept this. She let out a sigh. Nineteen years old, with their whole lives ahead of them. One of them kids was my friend's little girl. Poppy, they called her. She was studying creative writing. Poor girl wanted to be an author. It fell. It felt like my reality was crumbling before my very eyes. That was what Ben had meant by drowning and being saved. They weren't dead. Whoever Ben's father was had taken them. No. I shook my head. My heart in my throat. I jumped up, slamming my hands down. No, I'm telling you. If you just go there, you'll understand. I spoke to Ben. He told me he nearly died. He told me he almost drowned. And someone saved him. Someone? The officer repeated. Yes, the store owner. The boss. If you're playing a prank, it's one hell of a sick one. The woman said, let those kids' souls rest in peace. And it became evident they weren't listening to me. I begged them. I begged them because all I could think about was Ben and Jessa and the others being trapped there. When the male officer finally caved, the two of them drove me to the Greensleigh Mall. When I was back in front of Forever 21, the police by my side, I was confident. An oldish looking man wearing a crinkled suit was standing outside, letting the shutters down. When he caught sight of us, his eyes narrowed before he pasted on a smile. Evening officers, he gestured to the shutters. I'm about to close up. He choked out a laugh. It's been one hell of a day. What can I do for you? I'm going to have to look inside, the male officer said. Like it pained him to say it. Young lady says your mannequins are actual people. Cleared his throat. Specifically, those of the Moorhead victims. The man's expression crumpled. Oh, oh, wow. I'm not sure I understand. It'll only take a second. The male officer rolled his eyes. When the man pushed up the shutters, I rushed inside first thing I noticed was Ben was gone. Jessa was still there, though a sweater had been thrown over her. Still, I ran over to her, shook the mannequin, uncaring how insane I looked. Jessa? I whispered before twisting around to face the officers. Do any of you have a phone? If you take a photo, they'll come back. Uh-huh. The female officer shook her head. She joined me and knocked on Jess's head. You're telling me this mannequin right here is 19-year-old Jessa Sharp? Yes. I was shaking. My blood was boiling. They didn't believe me. They didn't fucking believe me. Ben was here. He was right here and that guy. I pointed to the man. He did something to him. The man raised his arms with a scoff. Young lady... I have no idea what you're talking about. 
If you're talking about one of the male mannequins, I put him in the back for polishing. I don't have any kids, I promise. He was laughing. The bastard was laughing at me, and I looked out of my mind. Then bring him out, I said stiffly. If you use flash in front of their eyes, they'll snap out of it. That's enough. The female officer grabbed my arm. Ma'am, I don't know what game you're playing, but I should arrest you for wasting an officer's time. Her grip was tight on my arm when she dragged me from the store. You're a disturbed little girl who needs psychological help. She spat. Jesus Christ. The things you kids come up with these days to get attention. I was taken back to the station. And my mom was called. She didn't speak to me, keeping her head down. When we were leaving, and mom was muttering about parking spaces and how much they cost, we passed the same room I'd been in. I glimpsed the store owner and the male officer. The two of them were sitting together. 50,000, the officer murmured. I ain't going any lower. The store owner cackled. Brave, Tom. But you have yourself a deal. He rose to his feet with a sigh. I'll make sure to keep them in check. Mina? Mom was pulling on my hand and dragging me from the station before I could try and tell her. It's not like she'd believe me anyway. I tried to tell her. I've told her multiple times. It's like talking to a fucking brick wall. I went back to Forever 21 yesterday. Ben is in the window now. I feel like the store owner is laughing at me. Parading Ben in the window to show that he's triumphant. Well, fuck him. I'm getting Ben out of there. Do me a favor. If you're in Greensley, next to Forever 21, please look out for mannequins in the window. He's the one who looks almost lifelike. And if you look closer, it looks like he's crying. My mouth was covered by my older brother's hand, shallow, panicked breaths escaping between the sweat between the cracks of his fingers, both of us whimpering underneath our house in the crawl space, our sweatpants and fan shaw t-shirts covered in spider webs, dirt, and blood. I'm crying underneath his hand. I know I'm crying inside the cusp of his grip as he holds me close. The sound of his footsteps grow louder above us. He's inside. He's right above us. I think to myself, squeezing hold of my brother's arm with my bloodiest hands. I look to him. In the darkness, all I can see is the green in his eye when the moonlight skims past between dark clouds, creeping through the cracks of the grating and reflecting off his iris. My heart sank into my stomach when the sounds of tapping happened directly above us. We could hear his soft snicker like some sort of personal, deranged victory. I wake up, clammy hands and a heartbeat racing as if to escape a now fading memory as I sit upright in this bed. I feel cold, alone. I'm still there. I am still stuck in that moment. When the officers found the scene of the crime, they asked me how it all happened. In truth, I barely remember them arriving. Between the shock and the blood loss, the memory comes fading, the words said, inaudible. It was nearly seven months ago I had that encounter with a serial killer, which has since put me in protective custody, and moved me far away from my home of London, Ontario. Each day I wake up at nearly five in the afternoon, since now I won't sleep till my eyes cave from exhaustion around eight in the morning. What the documentaries rarely tell you, what survivors seem to never say is that when you live through horror, the hell of the encounter with a serial killer, they never tell you how regardless of whether you live or die, you still become theirs. They still own your thoughts, even just for a fleeting moment, or throughout the night such as myself. The perversion on some is the belief of collection their victims, to own them, control them, to have them, a psychophant to their own murderous, self-believed desire and impulse. This is my story of what happened on July 15th, 2009.
2015. It was no secret that a serial killer called the Dollhouse Murderer had been active in the news. He traveled between London and Strathroy, murdering random victims. Never in age, gender, place of employment, hair color that he sought after in his trail of slayings. The only factor was the area, Middlesex County to Stathroy. But that is far from an easy net to cover. His only pattern, his gruesome pattern that he would leave behind was a dollhouse. He would take a body part or hair, fingernails, eyelashes, some gruesome piece of a person he would collect, and when you open the dollhouse, you'd find a porcelain copy of whatever he took. That was his calling card. When my mom heard the news, she took us out of London and to our cottage in Hanover, a slowly growing town with a beautiful landscape and a river that ran up to our little run-down cottage house. That was our true home. It was not a rich person cottage with lighting, electricity, and fresh paint. It was a simple wood house, cedar wood finish that was slowly wearing off. Still, it was our home. Our escape. Our father was still in London. He unfortunately did not receive his vacation time from his job at the Honda plant. So mom, my brother Andy, and I, Sarah, made our way to the cottage. The day was beautiful. A hot, sunny day. Mom was out for a stroll, soaking her feet in the river, basking in the sun while Andy and I were already at war with each other on who got the unicorn floaty. I did, by the way. Andy was just starting his apprenticeship in plumbing. I was just entering my first year of high school. As a gift for me, Andy bought me some of his college's sweatpants and shirts, which were roughly three sizes too big. But they made perfect pajamas. Mom just loved that her two babies were wearing matching clothes. She constantly teased us about it. We started a fire when the cold air began to come through and the sun began to fade. Mom fired up the barbecue and made us some amazing ribs and a honey barbecue sauce, along with fried taters and an absurd and frankly unnecessary amount of onions. I love her so much. We sat at the fire, naturally making fun of Dad. The smell of the wood burning, Mom and Andy drinking Moosehead, one tall boy after another. The crackling and hissing the firewood bellow when we threw pine needles into the flame because Mom wanted nature's Febreze. When the moon began to settle in and the sky beamed with stars, we watched the fireflies flicker and do their illuminated dance in the starry night. I love this place so much. The coy wolves howling in the distance and the wind rustling between the trees in the twilight of this natural harmony. We stayed by the fire for another hour before we heard the sound of a yelp from the distance. The coy wolves were done singing. Now the harmony had stopped, and what was likely a fight over their dinner had started. I quickly dozed off on the couch while my mom and Andy took to their own rooms, after a heated game of exploding kittens. I remember sleeping so peacefully until I heard what would change me for the rest of my life. No, 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 no. My mom shrieked from the door window, locking it quickly. Mom? Andy asked, scratching his tiresome eyes. What's wrong? Mom was shaking so bad. I had never seen her scared before. Now I was nearly crying. I could see tears forming in hers. I could see her chest moving in and out. She was trying to control her breathing. I looked up from the couch and I could barely make out the fireplace, a few embers still clinging to life. The wind would catch the embers, the flame would give off a bright enough glow for a fleeting moment that I could see it. An open dollhouse sat outside. A knock came from the sliding door behind us, his pale face, clear blue eyes that were wide open, pupils wide and dilated. He had this unwelcoming, horrid smile. He was wearing a black hoodie and a camo toque, along with faded, dirt-covered blue jeans with blood. His face pressed against the window, his smile gazing over us in a putrid, perverse manner. He jammed his finger on the glass, pointing at my brother, then slid his dirty, bloody finger across the glass, 
causing it to screech till the tip of his finger was pointed at me. I'm going to collect you. I'm going to collect you. I'm going to collect you. He screamed so loud the glass shook. We all jumped back terrified. He kept muttering that as he walked around the cottage home. First it would be silent, then loud as he would bang his head against the window. Each time he would walk around the house he became more and more aggressive in his tone. My mom would follow him to each window, never getting too close but her eyes always watching him. Andy and I sat on the couch, shaking out of fear until my mom spoke up. He went back into the bushes. She whispered. She ran to the sliding door, making sure it was locked. She covered the window with a quilt and then grabbed both of us and pulled us into her bedroom. Kids, I love you, but this is real. This is happening. We have to stay together and stay alive. Do you understand me? You do whatever I say. Do you understand me? Her voice was shaky. Her hands quivered as she held us. We both nodded our heads, softly crying into her arms. Please protect us. Please, God. I don't want to die. I'm so scared. I said to her, No, baby, you're not going to die. I promise. You're okay. But you need to breathe and be strong. We won't be as fucking statistic, okay? She asked me. I shook my head and tried to control myself. Kids, lean in close. I need to tell you something. Andy and I huddled around our mom. If he comes in, I need the both of you to get to the crawl space. Your father and I made a trapdoor in the closet in case we ever got locked out and needed a way in. You stay in the crawl space and leave only when I tell you to. A loud bang came from the sliding door. We all rushed out of mom and dad's room, listening to himself smash against it. Quietly, I tiptoed to the other window. Outside, he had a fire axe buried in the dirt, along with a blood-soaked, rolled-up carpet. I put my hands to my mouth. There was no doubt in my mind it was a dead body. It had to be. Mom, there's an axe. And a body. Mom, what do we do? I remember whimpering to her. Mom, what do we do? What do we do, Mom? He screamed at the top of his lungs. Just shut the fuck up. Andy cried out at him. The sound of footsteps went around the house till a sudden smash came through the old wooden door. The hinge on the inside began to give in. I'm going to collect them, Tara, he said. He knew my mom's name. Tara, I'll let you live. You can live. Just let me collect them. Sarah, Andy, you don't want your mom to die, do you? Don't you love her? Don't you love her? You know what I will do? His hand kept smashing against the door. His voice was not so calm. Disgusting attempt to be soothing. Convincing. You can all live. Just need the rest. I just need the rest. I'm so close. I'm so close. You really want to die, Sarah? You want to never see again? Breathe? See anyone? Anything? Really, Sarah? Are you that greedy, Sarah? You want mom to die, Sarah? Andy pushed himself in front of us. You're a sick piece of shit. You will kill all of us. You're just a twisted, broken little boy. Did mom and dad not give you a hug so you have to kill? Fuck you. Andy was right in the face, screaming at the door. Another loud crash against the door. The wood began to split. All of us were silent. The door was old, wearing down. Hinges rusted and the wood had seen too many winters. The dollhouse murderer made his way back towards the sliding door. Andy walked over to the window I had been looking out. He turned to us. He's just staring at his fucking axe. Glass shattered. The sharp silver of the axe collided onto the right side of Andy's face when he had turned back around. He fell to the ground, writhing and screaming in agony. Mom! He screamed out to which the killer shouted back, laughing. My mom looked horrified at her baby boy that she had carried for nine months in her body, raised with his adorable smile, held him when he first scraped a knee and cheered for him when he graduated high school, her boy that she scolded when he came home high or tried to sneak a girl into his room without proper introduction. Sarah could see in her mom's eyes the 
heartbreak that her baby boy, my brother, now laid in his own blood, rolling around in agony, his right eye gone and his face disfigured. She helped Andy into her room, dousing his wounds with alcohol and bandaging it as best she could. I'll never forget the look on her face, that look of enough. She pointed at the trapdoor to both of us. He's going to come in. When I leave, you get your butts down there. Sarah, when you see an opportunity, you take the keys and you run to the car and you get out of here as fast as you can. I love you. I love you both. The last time I would ever see my mom. She grabbed a knife from the pantry and waited near the door for him to come in. The crawl space on any normal day would be uncomfortable. Spiders, snakes, mice scurrying around. Yet in that moment with my brother, it was our last resort to feeling some form of safe. There was a crash, a scream, and then silence. An unpleasant, harrowing silence. I needed to hear mom's voice, her tapping on the crawl space door to let us know it's okay. All I could hear was him. You killed her. You killed her, Andy. You killed her, Sarah. I began to sob. Andy put his hand around my mouth. You know what happens next. The same thing I told you from the start. I cry underneath my brother's hand. Then we hear tapping from above us, then laughter. What I forgot to mention before. My brother's hand was getting colder, his head nodding off. I tried to shove him, but he slumps over. The blood on my hands, it was Andy's. The dollhouse killer was back outside. I could hear him grunt and mumble to himself as he stumbled his way up to the steps and inside the cottage home, our home. Another tap from above and then something that leaves goosebumps with me to this day. Look behind you, Sarah. He whispered through the cracks of the trap door. I will bury you here. Written in dried blood behind me. How could he have had time to do this? How long had he been waiting for? I could feel my heart pounding. Shortness of breath. My chest was heavy. I shook Andy, pleading with him to wake up. Begging, but all there was was laughter from above. The crawl space door snapped open and I left my brother behind as I began crawling to the nearest grate. I looked behind for my brother, but within seconds, the dollhouse murderer was there, crawling after me, that grin on his face, laughing as he squirmed towards me. I felt him grab my ankle. I kicked as hard as I could. He laughed and continued after me. I continued to kick and fight him until I was finally free from his grasp. I ripped open the grate. It was already loose likely where he had snuck in. A blue beam of light came streaking across the midnight sky. Sounds of sirens and officers storming out of their cars pulling me into their vehicle. One ordered another officer to drive, followed by laughter. Then the sounds of gunshots. The dollhouse murderer was a 50-year-old chef at an Italian restaurant. He was a man of zero significance. A man who was despised by his peers at work, verbally violent and unhinged who would often take days off and extensive holidays to commit his violent acts. The one summer home that my family and I cherished was tainted ground. The detectives were appalled when they arrived on scene to see what the dollhouse murderer was making. Each murder he took a different trophy. An arm, a leg, a hand. It was always a piece of the human body. He stitched it all together. All he was missing was another green eye and a left leg. He made a dress and turned a pile of victims into a putrid doll. His only reason for stalking each victim was because he was so attracted to certain parts of their bodies that he would hunt them down and kill them to begin his sick creation. Him and I never met. He found my family on social media and stalked us relentlessly. The only reason he followed us so far was to finish his doll, his human victim doll. I have no idea why I volunteered for the midnight shift. The extra 40 cents per hour wasn't really worth it. Everyone I was working with had good reasons to not take the shift that week. 
Me, being the nice person I am, took the shift no one wanted. If I didn't, it would have gone to someone with less seniority in the company. I knew that everyone below me either had kids to look after or college classes. The person who was meant for the midnight shift had a medical emergency the day before they, and it was such short notice I knew it was causing problems. They had to find a body to fill the shift, and I stepped in knowing it would be a hassle for others to change their schedules around. I really should be more selfish in the future. My job was out of the town I lived. Because of that, I had to drive at least an hour on the highway each way. It was two hours of my days listening to audiobooks or podcasts, so I wasn't a waste. Plus, the pay was stupid high for such an easy job, I couldn't complain about the drive. But even so, I found the highway at night super creepy. For long stretches, there was nothing but endless trees on either side of the road. Driving in the pitch dark, only being able to see a few feet in front of you, and most of that few feet was just trees. It wasn't pleasant. At least for me. I watched The Blair Witch far too young. I know it's not a scary movie for anyone else, but seeing trees at nighttime? No thank you. But somehow my kindness outshone my fear of the woods. I was driving in my shift around 11.30pm. I needed a speed if I would make it to work by midnight, but I saw something I could not ignore. On the side of the road, I saw a car pulled over and the driver's side door open. I didn't see anyone around the car as I came up on it. I saw the car was a taxi, and that gave off some red flags. A few months ago, my car needed to be taken in for some work. I hitched a ride with a co-worker and we got talking just how expensive it would have been if I got a taxi or an Uber to work even for one night. I didn't even want to think about how much it would cost if the taxi went by the meter. I had heard that sometimes they do a flat rate between cities, but once you're off the highway, the meter starts. I never bothered to find out if that was true. Seeing a taxi on the highway was weird enough. Seeing a taxi on the side of the highway, top light on and door open with no one around was super weird. I think anyone would think that. But I may be the only person to pull over and see what was going on. I was already going to be late for work, but I knew it would bother me if I didn't at least check to see if someone needed help. I pulled over, but I already passed the taxi when I decided to stop. Instead of backing up, I just got out of my car taking my cell phone and flashlight out from my trunk. This could be some sort of scam, a way to get people to pull over to be robbed, but I honestly never heard of that happening, like, ever. At least not where I lived. My flashlight weighed at least 5 pounds. I could get a good hit into someone and just make a run for it. Kicking up dust as I walked over, I could tell something was very wrong even before I reached the car. I hadn't noticed before, but one of the back doors was open as well. I already had my phone out and dialed trying to get help on the way, but only got static, which I thought was also very weird. I've never had issues with a signal out on the highway. My phone connected to my car. It would read text while I was driving. A signal had never been an issue before. I think any normal person would have just left, but I guess I'm stupid. I looked inside the car looking for anyone or anything that would explain why the car was just sitting there. My stomach dropped when I saw some red. I knew it was blood over the driver's seat. I shone my flashlight on the ground to follow a trail of blood droplets with some hurried footprints leading off into the woods. It wasn't a lot of blood, but it wasn't a little either. Someone was hurt, but it was hard to tell how badly. I looked in the back of the taxi trying to find a weapon, but I didn't touch the car. I just leaned over trying to get a good look inside. The window of the rear door that was open had been smashed. Glass littered the back seat and spilled onto the ground outside of the taxi. Something had happened and I still couldn't get my phone to work. That was when I heard it. A scream. A man screaming for help from inside the woods. He sounded close enough for me to reach him. After everything I had seen and now heard, 
I really should have ditched the whole thing, but like I said, I'm stupid. Stay there. I shouted back. I'm coming to help. Without a second thought, I took off running into the woods and where I thought I heard the scream. And it honestly was my worst nightmare. In the woods at night is so unsettling. I don't know how people go camping. My flashlight was bulky and had a good beam of lights, but it could only go so far into the woods. The darkness where my light could not reach made my palms sweat. I couldn't stand not knowing what was out there in the dark looking back at me. I scolded myself mentally, saying the only thing out there is someone who needs help. It was only when I was a few feet into the woods and to the point where I couldn't see the light of the taxi was when I had actually just done sunk in. If a man was hurt out here, what had hurt him? Who had hurt him? It wasn't just him. Someone broke the window. Someone had been in the back seat and I only had a hefty flashlight and a cell phone that was still not working. I wanted to find the man and get the hell out of there when I heard something else. A woman's voice. Please, can you help me find my son? I looked around trying to figure out where that voice came from. My beam of light scanning the dark trees but seeing nothing besides creepy trees that I hated. Please, can you help me find my son? The voice came again, then again. She repeated herself three times and fell silent. I started to shake. I just couldn't help it. The woman's voice sounded off. Have you ever seen that video of a bird talking in Japanese? It sounds so human and yet not. So close to human speech, but the tone is so slightly off you're aware you're not talking to a human. The woman's voice sounded human and yet not. Run! I screamed at the voice. Of course I screamed. The older man came running out from the trees, his lip torn and still bleeding. He rushed past me and made a grab for my arm to drag me along. He missed but didn't even pause in running to try again. He just ran trying not to trip over fallen branches and tree roots. He looked like a man who just saw death itself. I was so shocked still seeing him, I may not have ran after him if an ear piercing scream hadn't come from behind me. That sound motivated me to run as fast as I could from behind that man. That scream. That sound I still hear in my nightmares, or even if I just let myself sit in silence for too long. I've been over hundreds of wildlife recordings trying to prove to myself I heard an escaped exotic pet, or anything that would logically explain that scream I heard. It wasn't made by a human, or an animal. It was nothing I have ever heard since and I hope to never hear again, and it was right behind me. I somehow caught up to the man. I felt like we had run so far and yet we hadn't reached the road yet. I had to stop because my chest burned from running. We both stopped, gasping for air from fear and from running through the hard-to-navigate forest floor. The flashlight beam was powerful enough to light his face covered with blood even if I wasn't pointing it directly at him. He nervously ran a hand over his face. It didn't wipe off anything, only getting his face bloodier. I had only heard a voice and a scream. I did not want to know what this man had seen in the woods. We need to keep going. I told him once I was able to talk again. It's not my fault. He was running his bloody hand through his hair, clearly out of his mind from fright. I wanted to reach out to try and calm him down, but wasn't sure if that would upset him more. I decided to let him talk while I looked around trying to find a way out of the trees. It's not my fault. I mean, she's pretty. She was pretty. She got into my cab, right? You understand, right? By some miracle, I spotted a light through the trees I was positive came from the taxi from the road. I was just about to tell the man we needed to walk in that direction, but what he was saying made me stop. I had never been so afraid in my life being in those woods, but I still stopped to look over at him. What are you talking about? I asked slowly. Girls like that don't mean no, right? If they are so nice like that, and smile at you like they want it, right? I didn't even do anything. I just parked. I didn't even get in the back seat. She was the one who leaned over. 
damn bitch bit my lips off. She was the one who wanted it. As he spoke, his voice got more and more frantic. I stood in place watching him lose it. He was running his hand through his hair, tearing at it. His body shook and his eyes darted around wildly. That bitch isn't human. He shouted. He grabbed at his head with both hands and started to sob. This man... I didn't want to think of what would have happened to the woman in the back seat of his taxi if she was human. If he just picked up a normal person that night, what would he have done? Over his sobbing, I heard a branch crack, then another. I raised my flashlight to look into the darkness and finally saw her. She was pretty. That much was true, and also not human. Long brown hair fell over her shoulders. She was only wearing a flower print sundress with the driver's blood down the front. Her face looked normal aside from her eyes. They were eyes of a dead woman. Blind and pale. She was only a few steps away from us. The sobbing man hadn't noticed her creep up behind him. She stood in the beam of the flashlight, almost curious what I would do. I did something I never expected of myself. Well, keeping the flashlight on the woman, I took a step back, then another. The taxi driver was in so much distress, he didn't notice me slowly backing away from him. It was only when I was a decent distance away from them, when the driver finally raised his hand. I saw the horror on his face when he noticed I was now so far away from him. Almost in slow motion, I watched as he reached out a hand for me, and at the same time, the woman took him. Her mouth ripped open, causing her head to look like a demonic Pez toy. With her hands suddenly long claws, she grabbed his shoulder and latched onto his neck. Her eyes stayed on me the entire time. Blood soaked the front of the driver's shirt before he could even scream. That woman never took her dead eyes off me as she tore flesh away from the men. I did not stay around to see her rip him apart. I turned and ran as fast as I could towards the light coming from the taxi. I got out of the woods without being followed. I kept running to my car and flew in. My hands were shaking too much to even start the damn thing. On reflex, I checked my phone. I saw I had a signal and without any delay I called the police. I don't know why I stayed in my car or why I didn't just leave after reporting my story. Even in my states, I knew I couldn't tell the truth. I told the operator that I spotted the taxi pulled over, saw some blood, and when I was about to go into the woods to try and help, I heard screaming that freaked me out and I ran back to my car. Even after the cops showed up, they just took my story again and my info then dismissed me. I was very late for work, but after telling my boss a very abridged version of the night's events, they forgave me. I still have trouble sleeping. I no longer do midnight shifts and I hate driving along the highway before the sun comes up on my early morning shifts. I looked up the case but didn't find much detail. They only found blood from the driver but not enough for them to be positive he was dead. I was not a suspect even though I found the car. I looked up the driver's name once I found it out and saw he had assaulted other women before. He had just been released and wasn't even a real taxi driver. They had no idea where he got the taxi from, but the police were sure he was using it to hunt other women. The bit of information about the case that made it impossible to sleep at night was who the women was. They found her DNA on the broken window glass. The thing was, she had disappeared three years ago and was assumed dead. She had gone missing in the woods with her son. Maybe I should get a new job. One much closer to home. Did you know that most networks across the country do not have a Channel 37? The reasoning behind this has to deal with the search for life outside of our universe. When the television networks were being set up, the Federal Communications Commission had designated Channel 37 in every city, state, and town to be allocated for radio telescopes. These radio telescopes searched the galaxy for signals from intelligent life. 
All this information was found out after the fact, and if I had known this then, maybe my predicament could have been avoided. This all started around four months ago, as our typical Saturday night ritual had gotten cut short by my friend Mike. He stated he had an emergency that he needed to tend to, but we all knew it was his girlfriend being extra clingy. This killed the entire buzz of the evening, and we decided to go our separate ways. Instead of catching a ride or a taxi, part of me was thankful my apartment complex was within walking distance from the light rail. Back in my apartment complex, my intoxicated mind started manually flipping through the channels. When I had gotten to channel 37, instead of there being static, there was an actual show playing. The scene resembled something out of a bad horror movie, as this was shot in someone's basement. There were crude Halloween decorations scattered on the walls, as well as some unidentified stains on the gray, concrete blocks. A man stood in the center of the frame clad in something that was akin to tactical gear that either SWAT or Special Forces might wear. Every part of his body not only hid his physique, but gave him a sense of anonymity as he was dressed in black from his boots to the tips of his gloved fingers. The only thing out of place was a white hockey mask that adorned his face as the areas around his eyes had been blackened out in the shapes of triangles. A blackened, stitched smile stretched from edge to edge of the worn mask, completing his look. Looking at the camera, he greets his audience in a voice that is a cross between gravelly and smooth. My first thoughts were that his voice should be muted, but he must have a small mic hidden behind the mask. And welcome back, my maniacs. We will get back to Invasion of the Blood Farmers in a bit. For those that are tuning in for the first time, I am your host, Skullface. Welcome to the Skullface Spook Show that starts every Saturday at the stroke of midnight. So this is the part of the show that I know a lot of you love. Yes, my lovelies. It is time for the Wheel of Punishment. The camera pans as something out of a bondage's lover's dreams. As a man in his late 30s is chained to the wall, he tries to speak. However, there is a gag pushed deep into his mouth as he looks at the host with fear in his eyes. This, my lovelies, is Miguel. He is a drunkard and a womanizer, as he has repeatedly hit his wife and his kids. He is a really horrible person as he barely supports his family, and while he was out in the world, I offered him a drink. Unfortunately for him, it was laced with a drug, and he was out in a matter of minutes. So I dragged him back here to face the Wheel of Punishment. Muerta, can you please spin the wheel? The black and white spinner wheel fills the screen as various words are written upon it as a beautiful young woman walks into frame. She is dressed in all black from the bustier to her miniskirt, as her face is painted in a variety of colors. Her makeup resembles those sugar skulls that are meant for the Mexican Day of the Dun. As she spins the wheel, it clicks on and on as it lands on two words. Slit throats. Giving a feral grin and taking out a straight razor that was tucked in her bustier, she opens the blade and stalks up to the tied up victim. With one quick motion, she slices through his neck as blood begins to pour from the wound, crying out in anguish. At this point, I was bored and was thinking of turning in early, so I clicked off the television and went to bed. This was an old trick that special effects guys used to use with a dull razor and a squeeze bulb filled with fake blood. One of the books in my collection was Grande Illusions, written by the great Tom Savini, and he showed how to do this trick. There wasn't a real horror movie I couldn't pick apart, either through cheap CGI or practical special effects. Next Saturday, most of my friends went to a local sci-fi con, and I had zero interest, as well as funds to go. Most of the day was spent either doing chores, playing video games, or looking at weird stuff on YouTube. After getting some takeout from my favorite Chinese place, it was around 10pm and part of me wondered if that channel would come back on. Turning to channel 37, there was nothing but static right now, but Skullface said it would start at midnight. Finding a movie to watch to occupy my time until the watching hour was easily settling on some early Jackie Chan flick. The movie was still going at 11.55pm, and not wanting to miss a second, 
I decided to turn back to Cable. Punching in the number 37, static was still there until 2 minutes to midnight, when that was replaced by a test pattern with a typical high-pitched whine. As the stroke of midnight, the skull face spook show roared to life accompanied by Rob Zombie's Super Beast. The visuals were various horror movies ranging from classics to forgotten horrors, interspliced with shots of the host and co-host. The credits didn't run for long before the same interior showed up from the last time. Skullface stood there motionless as he seemed to look directly at me through the television. Welcome to another episode of Mayhem here at the Skullface Spook Show. I am your host Skullface, along with the beautiful Muerza. Come and say hello, my dear. She steps from out of frame, dressed in a dark red bustier and matching short skirt. Her makeup, while well, it wasn't the same style, was in different colors to accentuate her look. She looked more devious in this makeup rather than beautiful, as the reds played off the ones of her outfit. Muerta looked at the camera and gave a sly smile, waving her right hand in a greeting. Folks, we have a great show for you tonight, as we are premiering a new movie with Nicolas Cage. Cage is forced to work in a rundown children's restaurant while animatronics try to murder him at every turn. Yes, folks, strap yourselves in for a wild ride as we take a journey to Willy's Wonderland. Holding up in my seat, my mind couldn't comprehend what I had just heard. This movie hadn't even made it to the theaters yet, and somehow this low-grade show managed to snag a copy. At first, my expectations were going to be it was some other rip-off or something else, however. When the film started, those suspicions were laid to rest. They were really showing this film and without giving away any of the plots or story, this is a film that needs to be experienced. Interspersed between the movie were short segments that cut back to the studio. Skullface would give his opinion on the movie, rifing off on what happened before the last break. Other breaks would be filled in with either short horror films or cartoons that fit in that genre. Recognizing some of the shorts from YouTube coming from Crypt TV, and the cartoons were pulled from hell of a boss. At around halfway through the film, the camera cut away to a view of the floor of the studio. The camera quickly panned up to see a young woman strapped to a hospital gurney. She was bound and gagged as she squirmed against the worn leather restraints. As the camera turned to a fixed position, Skullface stepped into frame addressing his audience. Welcome back, friends. For those of you watching for the first time, I am Skullface, and you are watching the Skullface Spook Show. We will get back to more Cage Carnage in a few moments, but for right now, this is the parts I know most of you sick fucks love. It is time for the Wheel of Punishment. Moving over towards the gurney like a big cat stalking his prey, Skullface looks down at his captive. This here is Alyssa. Her boyfriend Sean was loyal to her without a fault, however... She was less than faithful, so much in fact that she had gotten pregnant from another man and then lied to him about it being his. The father wasn't the most stable of people as they were being treated for a few things including suicidal tendencies. This was enough to push him over the edge and he shuffled off his mortal coil. Alyssa wasn't remorseful at all, in fact, she gloated about getting a hefty insurance payoff as she managed to con her way into being his beneficiary. So, what fate is in store for dear Alyssa? Well, my dear psychopaths, it is time for Muerza to spin the wheel. Sauntering up to the wheel, she mimes an exaggerated pull as the wheel spins before clicking to a halt on one word. Disembowelment. Skullface produced a very sharp knife as he seemed to leer at his captive. With one quick stroke, the knife cut deep into her flesh, exposing her guts as blood sprayed the white linen laid upon the gurney. The blood looked fake, of course, and I had seen this gag done twice in Day of the Dead. What happens is there's a fake part of the body with fake guts, so when the knife cuts, it looks real. I thought it was real for a few seconds, but then laughed repeating the mantra of Last House on the Left. It's only a movie. It's only a movie. It's only a movie. As soon as the body finished thrashing, screams of anguish muffled from the gag, the screen faded to black, and the movie started up once more. 
The last half of the show was only interrupted twice more. Once for some more commentary, and the last with announcements including a sneak peek at next week's episode. At that point, I was hooked. This became my weekend ritual as I tuned into the Skullface spook show every time. Each weekend, a different movie. As some were schlocky messes like Plan 9 from Outer Space or Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. Others were either classics or modern horror like Night of the Living Dead or Color Out of Space. It would be the same thing each and every weekend as the Wheel of Punishment was spun each and every time with different victims. Robbery, murder, kidnapping, torture. Each of these crimes were dealt with in the same way. The wheel was spun and it landed on a different punishment each and every time. Chainsaw, acid, mummification embalming, decapitation. Part of me stopped wondering how this was being done and just went with it. I knew it was fake and there was always an explanation to how this was done. However, the weird part was that this show wasn't available anywhere else other than Channel 37. There weren't any partial broadcasts on YouTube, Twitch, Dailymotion, or Vimeo. And not even torrents of the show existed. Google searches either brought up local festivals or makeup tutorials on how to do a Halloween makeup. There were times that I wanted to record this show, however, I would either forget or something would go wrong and it wouldn't show up on my DVR. The last episode I watched was last week, and it never made me want to tune in for another episode. At midnight, the show started as it usually did, as the movie was announced. I think it was Hellfest, and things progressed normally. That is, until the Wheel of Punishment. Strapped to a wooden structure in the shape of an X was someone that I recognized almost immediately. However, before I could speak, Skullface appeared on screen. And welcome back, my lovelies. This here is Sam, and he has been a real bad boy. Sam works for a major multinational corporation, and he has been embezzling from them for at least three years. My jaw hung open as we had gone to the same college together and were roommates for a semester. He was a good kid, never getting into trouble or getting out of control at the various parties that we went to. How much did he steal from his workplace? Ten million dollars. And he wasn't going to stop there as he used this money for drugs, women, and partying. He did not care that he was stealing from other people who worked harder than he had. All he wanted was to have a good time, and now he is here. Muerta, please spin the wheel for this thief. Muerta seemed to glare at Sam as the wheel clacked by the various outcomes that would befall my friend. I even saw one of the spaces go by slowly that just read, Go Free. However, it did not land on that space. The space it did land on had only two words. Nail Gun. Skullface's voice picked up an octave, as if he was an excited kid on Christmas morning. Oh my, this is a rare treat, folks. Usually we use maybe two or three nails to take care of our guests, but for someone this naughty... We're going to use ten. One for each million he had stolen. Sam's whimpering was cut by the clack of the nail gun's clip behind slammed home. Frozen in my seat, all I could do was watch Skullface come up to him and push the nail gun against his calf before announcing. One. The nail gun jerked as Sam's muffled screams could be heard as the nail was embedded deep within his calf. Before anything else happened... I scrambled to reach the remote to turn off the television. Now flooded with adrenaline, my mind whirled with the possibilities of what just happened. Picking up my phone and calling Sam only resulted in it going straight to voicemail. This was all real. It had been all along. I was just blind to see the truth. Storming out of my apartment, I ran the four blocks of the police station fueled by both fear and rage. Busting into the lobby at around 1am, the front desk clerk looked at me with a mix of horror and confusion. You have to help my friend. It's the only thing that I managed to blurt out. He motioned for me to have a seat and stated that someone would be with me shortly. 
After 30 minutes, part of me wanted to leave and go back home and sleep the rest of the nights off and forget this ever happened. A detective from the back offices motioned for me to follow him back. Winding through rows of cubicles that were mostly empty, we came into his office as he asked me to have a seat. He asked me what had happened. What was I going to say? That my friend was on some type of pirated broadcast torture show? They would lock me in here with the rest of the crazies, so I made up an explanation about how I had not seen my friend in days. This isn't a joke, is it, son? Stated in a gruff tone. No, sir. He then pulled out a folder and spread a bunch of photos out on the table. Each of these people were victims on that accursed show. All of these are missing person cases that we are currently working on. Do you recognize any of the people in these photos? My eyes went wide as I had recognized some of these as victims being on that accursed show. All of these people had gone missing that spanned from a few days ago to weeks and months. The detective saw that I was shaken. He also believed the lie that I told him that was so convincing that I believed it myself. No, sir. I was just worried about my friend. I'm sure he'll turn up soon. Sorry to waste your time. He nodded me, giving me one of his business cards on the way out. If you think of anything, please give me a call. There are a lot of missing persons in this part of the state. Wandering home in a daze as all of this hit me hard, I collapsed onto my bed a little before 3 a.m. The alcohol-fueled haze allowed me to drift into a deep sleep that lasted a little past noon. Not knowing what to do next, all I could think about was all those missing people. Didn't their families deserve to know what happened to them? Maybe I could decipher where this show was and assist the police in capturing these murderers. The next week vanished in a blur as part of me dreaded what would happen on Saturday at midnight. I managed to set up my laptop to my television to record everything that was seen and accumulate it as evidence against this skull face. At 11.58, I waited for the test pattern to appear and there was nothing but static. What the hell? was my only thought as I continued to watch nothing for a half hour, somehow waiting for this show to magically appear. It never did. Not that week, or the week after that, and for at least two months I had tuned into Channel 37 to watch that twisted show. There was nothing. Maybe this was all in my head and there was never a show to begin with. Sometime during the next week, I had seen a plain, padded, white envelope propped up against my front door. The envelope had no postmarks or addresses, so I thought it was something that was ordered and left at my doorstep. Opening it revealed a clear DVD case along with a disc that only had two words on it. Watch me. To this day, there is some part of me that wishes that I turned in that envelope to the police. I could have gone to the main office and asked where this came from, or snapped it in half and never watched it. Watching that disc has made me move from state to state and not live anywhere for more than a few weeks. Jobs have ranged from construction to line cooks, as all of my pay is in cash as I am trying to live off the grid. What was on the disc was the following. The set of the Skullface spook show was in the background as he stepped into frame and started talking directly to the camera. Hello there. I take it you didn't like our last episode. And while we can accept criticisms, we cannot accept you going to the police. We know you live at... As you can see by this disc that we had left at your doorstep, we will always be watching you, and waiting for you to slip up. After all, everyone knows. The camera pans to a corpse on a table that has been stitched together from various body parts. Sam's head sits on top with a nail driven right between the eyes as the arms and legs have come from various people that were executed on the show. All I could do is look in horror as the disc finished as it panned up Skullface's mask, taking up the entire frame. Snitches get stitches. Sleeping in my bed always used to make me itchy. It was an annoyingly predictable cycle. I would fall asleep with an odd, 
tickling sensation on my skin, one that would vanish when I rubbed at the spot, and when I woke up, my arms and legs would be crazy itchy, almost burning. I once sat in the bathroom for almost 30 minutes, looking over my skin with a hand mirror, my butt slowly going numb, obsessively examining every spot, but there was nothing I could pinpoint. My dad scoffed at my problem. He was frustratingly skeptical of just about everything, and every time I complained to him, he would shrug it off and suggest another fruitless solution I had already tried. Truth be told, I think he just hated hearing anything bad about the house. It has been in his family for generations, and he was always reticent to change anything about it. I sometimes wondered if my bed had been in the family for generations too. It creaked if you so much as looked at it, and had all sorts of lumpy spots. And it smelled permanently musty, no matter how much air freshener I hosed it down with, or how many times I washed the sheets. It rubbed off onto my skin, oozed onto my pores. My friends always joked that I smelled like their grandparents' houses. At first I thought it might just be something weird with my skin. But then one time, my cousins came to visit. One got my bed and I was banished to the couch. At first I was upset, but that visit was the first time I could remember that my skin didn't itch when I woke up. The morning that my cousins were leaving, I approached the one that had slept in my bed. Hey, did you sleep alright in my room? Yeah, she said. I slept fine. And no weird reactions? She cocked her head. Now that I think about it, I woke up really itchy. Oh? Yeah. She brushed a hand over her bare arm. It felt like something was tickling me just as I was falling asleep. Once I turned on the lights and checked the bed, but I didn't see anything. Well, probably nothing. Probably? Yeah, I mean, I might have. She trailed off, then shook her head. No, nothing. So it was the bed. It was the damned bed. I begged my dad to replace it, but he always refused. Why replace a perfectly good bed? He'd ask me. So I slathered my skin in anti-itch cream, tried not to scratch myself raw, and got on with my life. One day, though, I had had enough. When my parents weren't home, I attempted to break the bed. I jumped up and down on it as high as I could, feeling like a giant five-year-old, sure that my dad would have to replace a broken bed. But as I stopped and rested for a moment, a sharp pain shot into my foot. Like a needle jamming into my leg, I cried and fell onto the bed clutching my foot. The spot was bleeding lightly. I must have jammed a box spring into my leg or something. I looked down at the spots I had jumped on. It wasn't hard to spot. There was a small splotch of blood there, and I could see the spring sticking up. A little black speck. I lightly touched the spot wondering if I could push it back down. Then it moved. Beneath my finger, it slid back under the surface without any pressure on my part. I thought I must have felt the skittering movement of something, like a sea creature returning to the depths. I scrambled back and re-examined the spot. Nothing. Just my blood now. I swallowed hard and tried to rationalize. The spring must have just sprung back into shape, right? Yeah, that sounded realistic. My foot had already stopped bleeding. I decided I was done with this endeavor and left the room, unable to stop my skin from crawling. That night, the tingling was worse than before. I tossed and turned, certain I had angered the spirit of this accursed bed. And then the pain began. This was nothing like before. It was like pins were stabbing me all over my body. I flung my blanket aside and leaped up fleeing down the stairs and waking my parents. And when my dad flipped on the lights, demanding to know what was happening, I saw it. My skin was covered in strange black smears and painful bumps. I tried to talk, but all I could do was cry. My skin burned so bad. Even my father could not think of a good way to explain this. I ended up in the shower for ages, trying to cool my angry skin with icy water. The one good thing to come out of this incident was that I was finally getting a new mattress. 
My parents took me to buy one the very next evening. I was elated. It was dead simple. My dad picked one out. We strapped it to the roof of the car and drove home. I helped haul it up to my room, squeezing it through the narrow door. I glared down the horrible old mattress that had tormented me for so long and scratched idly at the bump still on my skin. All right, my dad said, clapping his hands together. Let's get moving. We heaved the mattress out of the bed frame and it hit the ground upside down with a thump. I could see that the bottom had a sheet of gauze covering it. The staples holding it in place rusted almost to nothingness. To this day, I have no idea what possessed me to do this. Maybe, looking down at the bed, seemingly defeated, I wanted to see what had allowed it to torment me for so long. Maybe it was a childish instinct to harm it in some way. But I reached down and tugged at the gauze. It came away easily, and at first, I did not quite understand what my eyes were seeing. The inside was coated in a fuzzy black and white substance. Mold, I thought. Of course it was mold. But then the mass moved and I realized in horror what it really was. Spiders. Hundreds and hundreds of huge pitch black spiders and their fuzzy white egg sacs. They began to swarm out of the old mattress like flies deserting a rotting corpse. I screamed and leaped onto the side table but it was no use. They crawled onto my bare legs, biting and biting and I desperately tried to shake them off. My dad tried to stomp on them. But there were just too many. It coated the floor almost as thick as carpet. Finally, he sprang across the room and hefted me over his shoulder. He stampeded down the stairs, ran out the back, and leapt into the pool, mercifully ending their attack. As we surfaced, I could see them floating on the surface of the water, either curled up and twitching in their death spasms or skittering away on the surface to elsewhere. We called an exterminator insisting they had to come that day. The whole house was fumigated while we stayed in a hotel, and I tried not to twitch in my bed, desperately trying to reassure myself that I was just imagining tiny legs tickling my skin. Before the exterminators left for good, I asked if they had ever seen anything like this before. Once, one son, scratching at his salt and pepper stubble. Not as bad as this, but I've seen it. Really? Yeah. Another old box spring. He chuckled. Makes you wonder what's really under people's beds. Makes you wonder indeed. I got my PhD from the Stockholm Royal Institute of Technology and finished my postdoctoral work at the University of Bern in Switzerland in 2015. I won't go into detail, but my work centered around electromagnetic distribution and practical electromedical application. Chances are that if you check Google Scholar for these keywords, my name will pop up as a co-author on at least one of the top five results. However, in early December of 2016, I was in an accident. I was staying overnight for a conference in Copenhagen, where a colleague of mine had rented a large apartment. However, due to an electrical error, there was heat buildup in the main water heater, causing a steam explosion. I was sleeping pretty much wall to wall with it. My face and shoulders took the main brunt of the boiling water, steam, and pressure. The last thing I remember seeing was a bright light, followed by a sudden and complete dark. I had to go through evisceration and inucleation of both eyes. I lost eight teeth on the right side of my face and most of my nose. At least 20% of my body fat in my right arm was burned off. The reconstructive surgery of my face took a team of surgeons 18 hours. This was followed by months of just trying to survive moving back in with my family, and going through cosmetic surgery, mainly for my face. To this day, I still have no idea what was said at the conference. After a few months, I was fitted for double eye prosthetics. 
It took a total of three months before I was even given the option to start therapy. I'm not gonna lie, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Most people who are legally blind can still perceive some kind of light, but complete blindness? About 7% of us is one step further. One day, I could be suicidal, and the next I was determined to learn braille. Because of the damage to my eyelids, the surgeons opted to connect new tear ducts to my nose. So, crying just made my nose runny. Three years later, I was in a much better state of mind. Although sudden blindness isn't something you ever really adapt to, I was doing better. I still wasn't ready to go out on my own, but with a friend or family member just to help me along, I could go pretty far. I also learned to appreciate all those weird accessibility options that come with most computers. You have no idea. In the autumn of 2019, I was contacted by a man who told me he represented a group associated with Renewable Energy Research. Living in Sweden, renewable energy is a big deal, and it is something I've personally been interested in. In fact, it was going to be the subject of my next article, just before the accident. The man offered me a job. He told me that he worked at a lab with disabled scientists, and that my expertise was in high demand. The pay was more than generous, and as a benefit package, I would be given a personal assistant. Pay for an off-site two-bedroom apartment was also a part of the benefits. I agreed to have an interview. The man who was going to interview me was clearly from another country, but he was ready to fly out to meet me at short notice. He came to visit the very next day. We had a private conversation at my parents' house. He asked a lot of questions about my work, and I could hear him tapping away at a touchscreen. We discussed some of the details, but there was one thing he consciously seemed to avoid, where the main lab was located. He seemed uncomfortable talking about it, but he promised that I would be given a private flight wherever I wanted during downtime off-site. There would be four weeks of work on-site, living in the apartment outside the main lab, followed by two weeks off-site, kind of like paid vacation. I would be in rotating shifts with one morning, midday, evening, and night shift. The weirdest thing was revealed just as I was about to accept the offer. Every single scientist at the main lab was completely blind. I accepted the offer. The next week, I was picked up by the same man, let's call him Samuel, and taken to a private flight. I still had no idea where we were going, but other passengers were speaking in an Asian language. Indonesian, I think. On the flight, I was introduced to my personal assistant, Mila. I think she was Australian. Mila was a darling. She knew exactly what to say and when to help me, but most importantly, she knew when to give me space. It was as if she could read discomfort on my, albeit reconstructed face, and just acted on it immediately. She must have had a lot of experience working with the visually impaired. My first days were mostly orientation and introductions. I would be working with a team of two other scientists and seven assistants. Two each, one general. Apparently, our personal assistants would not be available while in the lab, but... They would be on call as soon as we went off-site. They would also help us with cooking, cleaning, whatever we wanted. It was a big operation, a total of 40 people just in the main building, all completely blind, at least a hundred others. With the pay we were getting, and the benefits, this was a very expensive project. We're talking millions, possibly tens of millions. My team would be working with material research. As Samuel explained, they were developing a new type of material as part of renewable energy tech. They weren't completely clear on the possible end result, but the metal we would be testing was told to be unique, extremely valuable, and uncomfortably bright. Apparently, it could cause blindness during prolonged exposure, which was the main reason they'd put together a team of blind scientists. During my first day at the facility, I was given plenty of time to adapt. 
The other members of my team were just as new as I was, but we were given radio instructions how to move through the various corridors. There was a decontamination room, without protective suits, and we were told to follow guiding pipes along the walls. On the left were cold pipes, on the right were warm. Three pipes on each side, leading to a total of six rooms. The pipes had square, circle, and triangle engravings, making it easier for us to find our main room. We were team warm triangle. The work itself wasn't that bad, mostly just repetitive. The test object was isolated in a separate room, but we could check it through samples, material exposures, and readings. We were all given separate workstations and hearing equipment so we could isolate the sounds of our specific assistants, and just to make sure our computer equipment wouldn't read over one another. We had buttons on our headsets to adjust who we could listen to, and to mute certain sounds. It took a lot of time to adapt to it. There were at least 50 codes to memorize. I got to know my assistants fairly well. There was Aaron an American, and Holger, a Norwegian. They were both older than me, and both had master's degrees. They were quick to follow directions and equally quick to offer suggestions. I could tell they were having some authority issues, but they didn't make it a problem, and the first three week-long shifts were fine. We went from midday to evening to night. The night shift was, of course, the toughest, by now, I was getting to know the place and routine. I had noticed a few things during my testing, but also just from the context of what was being talked about in the facility. The seventh assistant would come down with lunches for us, and we ate in a small common room, warm circle, where we would talk more freely about what we'd learned. We never changed from warm triangle as our main room, even when we changed shifts. The whole setup was weird. The material was extremely reflective. From the way it was tested, it seemed rectangular in shape and thin. My colleagues talked about it possibly being similar to a pane of glass. The material had several strange properties. It would absorb light, but dissipated it almost instantly. It would, to some degree, also absorb electric energy, low-level radiation, and radio waves. I'd never seen anything like it, if you pardon the expression. By chance, we also discovered a peculiar feature. The object, by now called the pain, briefly absorbed sound waves and would reflect it back after a few seconds. Like a delayed echo, but slightly distorted. Kind of like it had been run through an underwater filter, bouncing between sheets of metal. If I said, hello, I would hear a clear, but lower, hello, right back after about 8 seconds. This being despite me standing no less than 10 feet away from the object. It made no sense. Once, during the night shift, Holger fell ill. It wasn't bad, just a light case of pneumonia, but the company had a zero tolerance policy for sickness in the workplace. He got the week off at his apartment, and I had to work with one less assistant. It delayed my progress somewhat, but Aaron was eager to make up for lost time. Too eager, it turns out. On the second to last day of the night shift, Aaron accidentally caused a power outage. We were pressure testing the object when Aaron slipped and knocked over some volatile materials at another workstation. Nothing happened, explosion-wise, but the entire room went into immediate lockdown, and the power was shut off. The door is shut and locked from the outside. I didn't notice the lights go out, but I could feel the room quickly growing cold. It occurred to me that the object was probably absorbing the warmth, and there was no climate control to compensate anymore. Then something weird happened. We were all sitting quietly our headsets being turned off, and waited for the power to come back on. That's when I heard something. Hello? It was the same off-putting distorted voice that I had thought was a delayed echo. One of my colleagues, 
Gertrude responded with a hello right back. I heard four quick footsteps, like the start of a drum roll, and something slammed into the glass separating us from the object. Something squishy. Hello. Now we stayed quiet. The footsteps came in quick bursts, pacing back and forth, looking for weaknesses in the glass. We usually use small airlocks to put in samples to test. We had two airlocks, and the leftmost one of these was attacked. I could hear something rattling the airlock, trying to rip it loose. Hello? I could hear the grinding sound of metal being bent. I pressed myself against the wall, holding my breath. A power came back with a vengeance. My headphones were full of people screaming. Evacuation protocol initiated. Proceed to... Get out! Get the fuck out! Warm triangle. Respond immediately. I repeat. Half the voices were in a foreign language. We ran for the door. I didn't need to follow the pipes to get back to the decontamination room. But only then did I notice we were one person short. We lost Gertrude. Once outside, we were separated and isolated. Standing outside in freezing temperatures. I was stripped naked. Several people, all screaming in a foreign language, lifted my arms and legs and checked me from my feet all the way to my hair. I was forced into a plastic tent where they shaved my head, forced my mouth open, and checked my teeth. My ears were cleaned with some sort of antiseptic and my eye prosthetics were discarded completely. It was quick, violent, and terrifying. I was locked inside my apartment the rest of the night. Mila came around to help me, but she told me she was instructed not to talk about my work under any circumstances. That's when I first suspected that my apartment was bugged. I spent a week in that apartment with daily checkups. I felt fine, but the entire ordeal was stressing me out. Having my head shaved was uncomfortable, and I was scared they might find something they wouldn't like. After that one week, I was suddenly told that it was necessary to terminate my position. I didn't recognize the voice of the man telling me this. I was given four months of full pay, an apology, a non-disclosure agreement, and an immediate flight back home. Mila was holding back tears, trying to help me. She seemed frightened. I've been home ever since, but I come to you to share my story. I've been doing my best to stay financially independent, but life hasn't been treating me well. I'm still having stress reactions, and there has been a recent development that I don't know how to deal with. Last night I was brushing my teeth. The power went out. I could hear the air conditioning and dryer suddenly go quiet, and the entire room felt colder, except for the bathroom mirror which radiated a slight heat. I stretched my hand out to touch it. This might be hard to understand for someone who doesn't think about their sense of touch too often, but I've touched that mirror every night for years on the end by now. I know exactly where my hand was in the space of the room, and there was no mirror where my hand was. Still, I touched it. Every part of my finger touched something extruding from the mirror's surface. Something with rounded edges. Then it made a sound. Hello? All of my co-workers have been complaining lately about how early it gets dark now. At least, they have over Zoom. Small boxes, making small talk, about the weather and weekends before our morning meetings. I don't blame them though. Talk like that is easy, structured, a formula with exponents that are easily filled in by Jake and management and Talia from QA. What I have to talk about is not so easy. I disagreed with my co-workers though. I liked how early it got dark. The nights have become a refuge for me. A differentiation from the days I sit at home. In monocompromised and still afraid. Behind the screen of my laptop. Always behind a screen. 
My town is mid-sized, but it's also filled with people who still believe in conspiracies of tracking chips and vaccines. Posted an angry rants about privacy on their Facebook. The irony completely lost on them. So I stay home. I live alone and I'm used to being alone, and it's okay. The only thing I miss are my walks, and seeing as the entire town shuts down around 9, I can still get them in. I leave my home around 10. I leave all my technology and I stay out for up to two hours just wandering the neighborhoods around my apartment and enjoying nature. The streets are empty then, with sidewalks illuminated by dull, buzzing street lamps and traffic lights cycling through their colors without any cars there to notice. Occasionally I see other people, but any signs of life are usually just nocturnal animals possums and raccoons and skunks, sniffing and stalking and living their lives in the nighttime as much as I do. Maybe that's where I went wrong. Maybe I considered myself too much a creature of the night, when in reality, I was just a visitor in it, a tourist. One night, I met a true creature of the night. When I first saw him, he stood at the outskirts of a street lamp's beam, almost a full block ahead of me. He was difficult to make out, but so was everything else on that night's walk. I had left later than usual, and the moon was just a sliver of a crescent, the sky cloudy with the empty threat of rain. I recognized the corner he stood on, even with it being about a half hour's walk from my apartment. I almost always saw some sort of wildlife there, a wild animal investigating the lawn beside where he now stood. He had a dog with him, leashed and crouching on the grass, the universal pose for defecation. I assumed the man was older, as he leaned on a walking stick, waiting patiently for the dog to finish. I slowed my gait, hoping to avoid him. I don't know if it was based on just allowing them space or some sort of instinctual fear. It felt like the latter, like when I mistake a hanging coat in the dark for a person. It wasn't even necessary. The dog finished and the man crouched down with a grocery bag picking up after it. Then he reached down and removed a muzzle from around the dog. It shook an appreciation. From his pocket, he drew out a handful of something and then held it to the dog's mouth. The dog lapped it up, its tail wagging. The man had obviously trained it well, and his affection was even evident. He patted its head several times before remuzzling the animal, throwing the rest of his pocket's contents onto the yard, and with a quick shake of the leash, they were off. The dog seemed to be just as old as the man in the way it walked, hobbling with joints that seemed to cause it pain with each step. They rounded the corner, and were gone. That must have been it. The end of the encounter. The end of the story itself. If I hadn't kept moving forward. But I didn't stop. I had no reason to. All I had seen was an old man and his old dog. I made my way to where he had been standing. Not for any particular reason, other than it was the direction I had been walking. I glanced over at the grass to see what he had scattered there, and my suspicions were proven correct. A smattering of dog treats littered the yard. But there was something else. Not on the grass, but the sidewalk itself. I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't investigated the treats first, but there were dog prints on the cement. Like you see on sidewalks after it's rained, or there's a leaking sprinkler. However, these were not the faded gray of water the ever-evaporating shadow stamps I was used to, but their color was still familiar. It was the rusted red of blood, and it made my own blood thicken. There was a pair of dog prints following the direction the two had walked, smeared in places like they had been dragged, becoming lighter and lighter as they continued. The shape seemed off, too, kind of swollen and out of place. Recognizable, but only barely. 
Something must have gotten into its paws. Maybe a rock or a twig. And the old man must have not noticed. I tried following the prints for as long as I could, but the trace of them disappeared after a bit. The blood clotting or the veering off the sidewalks. I couldn't tell which. It made me uneasy. Part of me wanted to go home, but the other part of me was still restless. Still not finished with my nocturnal living. Both parts of me were in agreement, though. I did not want to see anyone else tonight. There's a new neighborhood being developed near to where I was. All vacant lots and construction equipment. I like to go there sometimes when I really wanted to be alone. Like now, so I pointed myself in that direction. It was exactly what I needed. It was empty. An emptiness that had yet to be broken. Shells of homes that had been lived in lined my periphery. Rising out of the ground like half-finished anthills. I began to relax. My shoulders slumping after a time of not even knowing I had them tensed. There was a big home deep inside the development being built. The model flagship. And I wanted to see its progress. I made it about halfway, enjoying the sound of silence the streets had to them that only comes when there is no other human there, until that silence was broken. I don't know what alerted me to his presence. It was like inspiration. One moment, there was nothing, and then it hit. The neighborhood had no artificial light installed yet, so I saw the shape of him more than anything else. He was standing on the front stoop of a half-built home, the wooden frame of it creating the structure of a jail cell behind him. His dog sat behind him, almost hiding like a toddler does with his mother. He leaned on his stick and just stared forward at me. Hello? I called out to him. He didn't speak back. He didn't even acknowledge that I had spoken, just kept his gaze on me, unflinching. I didn't know what to do, so I kept talking. I... Uh, sorry, but I think your dog is hurt. Who? Sparky? His voice was rough. Raspy, like he didn't use it much. If Sparky is your dog, then yeah. I saw some bloody paw prints earlier, and I think maybe... Ain't nothing wrong with Sparky. He cut me off with a declaration. An authority in his voice that mirrored his own decisiveness. I rescued old Sparky here. He was a stray. Found him out here real late at night and take real good care of him, don't I, boy? He scratched Sparky's head, but the dog didn't move. You want to meet him? He don't bite or nothing. Well, not unless I tell him to. He laughed a quiet chuckle that told me his joke was not really a joke at all. That's okay. Just wanted to let you know. There was a silent flashing in my head and... A fire alarm without the siren. The same one that I've learned to trust in the past. I've got to get going anyway. Yeah, what's a pretty bitch like you doing out this late anyway? That was it. This was no longer a conversation. I turned around and started walking away. As quick as I could without running. I expected him to keep talking to me. To yell to my back as I turned to him, but he didn't. What I did here was even worse. There was a shaking sound, a jangle of a collar and leash, a clicking of his tongue. Come on, boy, I heard him say. I glanced over my shoulder without stopping. He was no longer on the steps, but about 20 feet behind me. The man walked quicker than I had thought he was able to, Sparky trying to keep up with him as best as he could. The man was still bathed in darkness, but there was something about the way he moved that was jovial. Childlike. Like he was playing tag. There were no thoughts in my mind other than to get away. The main road wasn't far away, and I knew that once I was there, I could get someone's attention. It was useless out here. I started to run. Would be impossible usually over my own pounding heart and intake of breath to hear anything behind me. But my senses felt heightened. 
And it was like I could hear everything. The steps, the jangle of the leash. It kept getting closer and closer. I was sprinting at my full speed and he was gaining on me. My face burned. My lungs were on fire. I knew I couldn't keep it up forever. But the man sounded like he could. And then suddenly, it was silent. The sound of his steps behind me were gone. The leash's rhythmic jangling ended just as quickly. I checked behind me as I kept running. Once, twice, three times. He was gone. I don't know where he was, but he was gone. I stopped, my chest ready to explode, searching the area around me. Nothing. I wanted to cry and scream from relief at the same time, but then he was there again, inches from me. The chase was over. He held the walking stick by the middle and for the first time, I noticed it wasn't a cane at all. It ended with a knitted plastic, one made to string around necks. It was a dog catching pole. He held it with a practice finesse as he smiled at me. Atta girl, he cooed. You're doing real good. I stepped back, but he only took a step closer to me. I searched the ground for something, anything that I could use as a weapon against him. Instead, my eyes landed at his dog's feet. Only they weren't dog feet. They were the right shape, sure, but they were gnarled and bloody. Infected. They were hands. Human hands. The thumbs had been chopped off and the other fingers were bent at the knuckle and sewn together there. A crude approximation of a dog's paw. Screws stuck out in front of them like they were hammered through the back. A replacement for claws. His back legs were stumps cut off at the knee, sweatpants covering them, the legs of it tied off on the ends. He kneeled there on all fours, a muzzle over his mouth. It was unnecessary, though, because he didn't even try and make a noise. He just stared, eyes wet with tears, his head and eyebrows shaved off above them. Well, looky here, Sparky. Looks like we've got ourselves a new friend. I gasped for air. Told you he was friendly. I think he likes you. There was something of an aluminum wire stuck into his lower back to mock a tail. The man took it and shook it like it was wagging. Below the muzzle, Sparky winced in pain. Maybe we'll even get puppies out of this. Won't that be something? Something in me broke. I pushed myself back and sprinted out from him, out from the tortured creature on the ground and out of my own mind. There was a numbing sensation, like I was just watching this all unfold on a screen, like it was on my laptop back home. I heard him try to run after me and looked back only once. Sparky wasn't moving. The man was trying to drag him, but he refused to budge. He looked at me. That same mournful look in his eyes. The man hollered and even hit Sparky with the stick, but he still didn't move. And yet, even for all this, he didn't attack the man. He healed. His training hadn't been for nothing. I made it back home. Although I don't really remember how. The next thing I really remember is a howling sob I let out on my bed. Behind locked doors, back inside where I was alone. He couldn't find me here. I was safe. It took me weeks before I could go on a walk again. The next time I did, it was around dusk, just after the workday ended. I made my way to that street corner to where it all started. I don't know what I was hoping to find. Maybe whoever Sparky actually was standing there escaped. A man again, but it was empty. I stood there for a few moments wondering what happened to him and the man. If it was all just some sort of twisted nightmare. Below me, a chipmunk scampered by. He picked up something from the grass and stored it in its already overstuffed cheeks. 
I leaned in to look, already knowing what I would see. The yard was covered in treats. I went back home before nightfall. A young woman stood in the doorway, hands cupped as though protecting a baby bird. She was waiting, it seemed, for an invitation. Hesitance like that is a common sight at the food bank. It's tough for people to ask for help, even when they really need it. It breaks my heart to see how many hang their heads trying to hide tears of shame when collecting a meager box of supplies to see them through. It's not their fault. The government should do more. Starting with knocking off all the poor people are lazy rhetoric. Especially now, but I digress. The girl was slim, gaunt even, and barely out of her teens. The faded yellow dress she wore hung off her bones, several sizes too big. I doubt it did much to keep her warm in the damp January air. She looked around for a bit and I did my best to give her space, busying myself by taking inventory. Lots of folk get spooked if you're too keen, and often the courage it takes to walk through the door is brittle. I try to feign indifference as a kindness. After a minute or so of steady observation, she appeared in front of the table as I was stacking bags of pasta. I glanced up with a practiced smile. Her eyes had a strange, still quality that caught me off guard. I don't remember ever having been looked at like that before. So coolly or so thoroughly. Hiya. Suddenly my throat contracted and I sputtered, seized by a violent coughing fit. Sorry about that, I said patting my chest. Can I help? The girl hadn't moved, hadn't blinked, her face impassive and inscrutable as a statue. She simply stood, boring into me with her flat, gray eyes. I'm not very good at silence and to ease the discomfort. I fiddled with the string on my hoodie, trying to think of something to say. Thankfully, she spoke before I embarrassed myself by babbling. I have things to give, she said in a steady, measured tone. Great, I gushed. We are grateful for whatever you can spare. I gestured at the table of rice to my right and began to tell her which bits we were typically low on. Tea bags, mostly. Those stock cubes were always welcome. She raised a hand to stop me. And I did stop, compelled by her gesture. The way she moved was considered, commanding even. It was peculiar to see authority like that in someone so young. In many ways, she still looked like a child, playing dress up in her mother's clothes. I offer this. She placed a small brass tin about the size of my fist on the table between us. I wasn't sure what to say. It was tiny, but I didn't want to seem ungrateful. And after all, every little really does help. Thank you, I said, trying to keep the disappointment from my face. It is for everyone, she said, then turned away, walking back out into the cold, the flimsy cotton dress gently lapping at her calves. I regarded the tin with vague contempt. It looked like the one's old-fashioned pastilles came in, and I highly doubted that would be any use to us. Still, not looking a gift horse in the mouth is good advice, and I resolved not to be so dismissive. Perhaps it would be something we could divide between a few boxes, or find a use for it in one of the trickier dietary bundles. To say I was astonished when I twisted off the lid would be a phenomenal understatement. Inside the tin, on a layer of plush, sooty-looking fabric, sat a single suite wrapped in bright purple foil. What the? I muttered, tilting it slightly in my hand, bemused. I screwed the lid back on and strode across the room, eager to share my peculiar experience with the other volunteers. Mark, come see this. I called on my way over. Mark was the project lead who had recruited me, a perpetually cheerful man in glasses that always seemed to be trying to escape his face. He held them in place with a well-practiced forefinger, trotting to my side. What you got, D? I handed him the tin without a word. Alice's curiosity had peaked, too, 
and she used the carton of UHT milk in her hand to nudge Mark slightly, angling for a better view. He frowned and turned the tin over, probably looking for an expiry date out of habit, and gave me an inquiring look. I just shrugged, telling him it was a donation from a walk-in, while Alice tutted and went back to her boxes, grumbling softly about people taking the piss. Twisting the lid off, just like I had, Mark brought it up to his face and sniffed at the shiny wrapper like a bespectacled truffle pig. The absurdity of the whole thing tickled me, and I let out a snort when I laughed, about to ask him what he thought we should do with it. A family sheepishly entered the hall, their confusion and worry drawing my attention enough that I abandoned Mark to his investigation and headed over to greet the newcomers with a welcoming smile. I wish I hadn't left him like that. If I'd have stayed, it might have worked out differently. We would probably have had a quick giggle and then chuck the wretched thing. It would have been just a fun, odd little story to tell each other. An inside joke about the weird woman and her tin. Now it's so much more. When I left that afternoon, I'd pretty much forgotten it. The day had been busy and my mind was already on tomorrow's supermarket delivery. I was completely ignorant of what was coming, of what I had done. When I went in the next day, Mark's car was parked outside. This wasn't unusual. Part of what made him great at the job was his commitment, and he often was the first one in and the last one out. It was strange that he hadn't heard me open the door, though. Normally, I'm greeted by his terrible, if enthusiastic, singing, or at least the sound of him babbling about in one room or another before setting up. I figured he must have been in the loo or something and set my stuff down, preparing for the day to start in earnest. After fiddling with my phone and tracking down the sign-in sheet, movement across the room caught my eye. I was hoping Mark had heard me come in and made me a cuppa, but there was no one there. He wasn't in the room, but something else was moving. A brassy glint danced on the floor, and a sharp whirring noise grew louder. The tin from the day before was spinning, as though someone had twirled it like a coin between the far tables. I frowned and watched it slow, eventually falling still with a hollow clink. Mark? I called. No reply came and I felt silly for allowing a little prickle of fear to creep up my spine. He was probably just mucking about. I still don't know if the thought was genuine or a subconscious effort to soothe myself. Mark, stop playing silly buggers and put the kettle on. There was a shuffling sound from the direction of the kitchen, and I let out the breath I didn't know I'd been holding. Ten minutes went by, then fifteen, and twenty. Every so often I would find my eyes sliding back to the tin. I don't know what I expected from it, but my nerves were jangled, and I gave it a wide berth as I stomped to the kitchen, annoyed at Mark and myself in equal measure. It was empty, but the whole room was in disarray. Cupboard doors were open, coffee granules were spilled all over the countertop, sugar crunched underfoot. My irritation dissolved into worry, and I shouted for him again. Mark? Are you okay? Where are you? Another clang came from the hall and I headed back the way I came. There he was, finally. I was awash with relief. His back was turned and he was hunched as though looking for something. I assumed he had dropped his glasses like always and started to head over to help. Hey. I wanted to ask him what was going on, what had happened in the kitchen, but before I could get the words out, he stood and turned. My hand flew up to cover my mouth on instinct. The man in front of me was indisputably Mark. There could be no doubt. The clothes were the ones he'd been wearing the day before, but his face... There was something wrong with his face. At first, I thought he must have fallen and injured himself somehow. It was like I could only take in flashes of what I could see. Partial snapshots, like I couldn't process it all at once. His face looked raw, but it wasn't blood or bruising. The color was all wrong. His mouth was smeared with a deep plum stain, spreading out across his cheeks and chin. I reached a hand out to him, then faltered. The color wasn't on his skin. It was under it, and it was moving. I could see clearly now, 
thousands of tiny capillaries writhing around his lips, pulsing with every beat of his heart. My own hand hadn't moved, and I could feel the pressure of it, grinding flesh against teeth. It took all the strength I had to tear it away and speak. I'm going to call an ambulance. You'll be... The next part is a blur. I tried to reach my phone, worried he might be having an allergic reaction. I was scared. Not of him, but for him. I should never have turned my back. My head hit the back of a plastic chair as his weight slammed into me from behind. The impact turned my vision to static, and everything else was a tangle of limbs and agony. He grabbed me by the temples, kneeling on my thighs, fingers tangling in my hair, and lifted my head to his as I tried desperately to blink away the involuntary stream of tears. I could see him, not clearly but well enough as he loomed over me. The wine-colored threads had spread up the side of his nose, twisting the contours of his face into something monstrous. Their throbbing made me want to retch, and I clawed at his hands, struggling to free myself. Mark yanked my head back, making me yelp in pain and pulled me closer. Close enough I could see his dilated pupils and smell the copper tang of his breath. The veins in his face were twitching as though they were alive, some distending to the point of bursting. A few at the corner of his mouth split, spilling thin blackberry at core down his chin. He tilted my head back pulling at my hair, silent and merciless. Alice burst through the door with armfuls of shopping, walking straight into the chaos. For a second, we were all caught in dumb shock. Mark and I startled by the noise, and Alice trying to make sense of what she saw. It was enough for me, though. Mark was distracted, and taking advantage, I grabbed the closest thing to hand, smashing it into his distorted mug with all the strength I could muster. The same revolting liquid that had erupted from his skin splattered all over me and the floor behind, but I kept on hitting and screaming until Alice pulled us apart. For the first time, she got a good look at his face and gasped in horror as he lolled on his back, barely conscious. I just panted, clutching the can of value grapefruit segments to my chest. While Alice called the paramedics, I caught my breath. The adrenaline combined with the taste of his blood in my mouth made my stomach churn and I heaved myself up into a more comfortable position in case I needed to be sick. As I shifted my weight, I felt something cold against the heel of my left hand and I flinched. I knew what it was without looking. Mark was still lying prone, seeping dark fluid from his wounds. And Alice was here now. Help was coming. I was safe but still something about this tiny object frightened me. I thought about throwing it across the room. One fierce lob to get the wretched thing away, but I couldn't risk Alice picking it up. I didn't want her anywhere near it. Hesitantly, I closed my fingers around it without braving a glimpse, only to snatch my head back in surprise. The lid was off, and spread out neatly on the velveteen lining was a square of bright purple foil. Something inside me knew Mark had opened it, even before I touched it, even before I noticed the embossing inside the foil. He had peeled it apart so perfectly there wasn't even the slightest tear. He had even smoothed the creases. The only imperfection left was the word at its center. The rest of the day is basically blank. I was taken to the hospital. That much I know. I have some vague memories of tired voices warm hands, and the hem of a yellow dress, though mostly all I can recall is a muddle of noise and confusion. My injuries were superficial, barring a concussion, but they've kept me in for testing because the doctors don't know what's wrong with Mark. They did what they could, Alice said, but there is something very wrong. He's in a medically induced coma right now, and I can't help but hate myself for it. I did that. I hurt him. Not with the can, but when I left him with that tin, I handed him something evil and he was corrupted by it. It should have been me. When I woke up this afternoon, the nurse told me I'd had a visitor. I hadn't been expecting anyone and shrugged in response. You're very lucky to have such nice friends, she said, pulling the lid from my gift to show me a single, perfectly wrapped orb. I forced a smile as she chattered cheerily about how expensive and fancy it looked. 
I didn't have the strength to argue, or explain, or even cry. I couldn't bring myself to tell her that if she were to look very closely at the gleaming purple wrapper, she would find a word etched lightly in the center. A single word. A name. She'd only have put it down to my head injury, I was certain. Hours have passed since then, and I'm mindlessly tracing the new thread veins blossoming on my cheeks with my nails, trying hard to ignore the sunlight reflecting off the brass beside me. It won't be long now. I just wanted you to know. Wanted someone to know. For Mark's sake. As well as mine. That we tried to be good people. He'd want me to reach as many as I can so you can keep yourselves safe. That's why I wrote this, so you can learn from our mistakes, before it's too late. Learn from my mistake, please. Refuse whatever the girl in the yellow dress offers you. The skinny girl I thought was strange but harmless. The one I worried for. The bundle of thin bones and thinner clothes. The one who gave a little but cost us so much. Do not take anything from her. I'm begging you. Her name is on the foil. Her name is flooding my veins. Her name is killing me slowly. Her name is Pestilence. Last week, a beautiful girl moved into the rundown house next door. She has long blonde hair and a slim figure. She's maybe 18, 19. The first time I saw her, she was sitting on her porch wearing denim shorts and a t-shirt and gnawing on a chicken bone. She stripped off the meat and chewed on the actual bone before crunching it in half and swallowing it down. I was attracted and disturbed in equal measure. Still, I wanted straight away to ask her out on a date though maybe for a movie rather than a meal. I would have been amazed if she said yes. I'm 21 and still live with my parents. I went away to college for a while, but dropped out. I stayed up all night watching horror movies and playing games and spend a good chunk of each day asleep. I know that my parents' patience is stretched to the limit. I have promised them that I will get my act in gear, find a job, and move out. I mean it. I really do, but if only there weren't so many distractions in life. With the sunset on another day, I was trying to decide what film to watch, a classic, or try something new, when I noticed something moving in our backyard. My parents' house is modest. They don't have much worth stealing, and there isn't anything fancy such as security cameras. I pressed my face pretty much against the window to try and see what was out there. There are cats, foxes. I was hoping for one of those. I think they're cool. I was surprised to see it was the girl from next door. Slipped into shock as I watched her lift the lid of our trash can and start to poke around in there. And not with her hands, but with her face. She stuck her head right in there. Her hair was tied up in a ponytail to stop it getting dirty. I thought, and then my mind went back to reeling. What the hell was she doing? My question was answered when she stood back up straight. In her mouth, she had the remains of the joints of meats we had for dinner three nights before, and had been providing snacks and fillings for sandwiches since. There must have been only scraps of meat left, and fat bone and marrow. The girl glanced around. I tucked down nervously, as if I was the one doing something weird. I chanced to look a minute later and saw her climbing back over the fence which divides our properties. I did not watch any movies that night. I was staring at an empty screen. By dawn, my heartbeat had almost returned to normal, and I had worked out what was going on. She must have been starving. Maybe it was poverty. Maybe she was being abused. Whatever it was, she had been driven to scavenge in trash cans just to get something to eat. I had always wondered if there were people in our country living in hideous conditions like these. Their suffering hidden. 
Well, I had seen it with my own eyes now, and I was determined to help. Blinking in the morning light, I really was not used to being up and around before mid-afternoon. I went over to her house. She must have seen me coming just as I stepped onto her porch. The door opened and she came out. She put her fingers to her lips. I could hear movement inside the house. Her parents, I guessed. Had she just warned me not to disturb them? I had no idea what the right thing to do was, so I decided to plow on. I cleared my throat. I'm David, I said. I live next door. I would start with us getting to know each other. I would gain her confidence and then be there for her, be the person she needed. She stood on her porch and looked at me. Her eyes were emerald green. I'd never seen close enough before to see this. Sweat trickled down my neck. Nothing to do with the heat of the day. I managed to go on. Could I ask your name? She tilted her head in response to my question. Her eyes grew wider. She did not speak. I'm David, I said, and pointed at my chest. Pointed at her. You? Still nothing. My shoulders sagged and I sighed. Sorry, bad joke. I don't know if there had been a moment, any connection between us, but if there had been, it was gone. I joined her in silence before finally admitting defeat. It was nice to meet you, I said and turned tail. The rest of that day was horrible. I could not stop thinking about her for even a few seconds. I kept glancing out to see if she was back out on the porch, but there was no sign of anyone. I spent intervals staring at my laptop. At one point, I drew two overlapping hearts, wrote trash can girl in one, clicked in the other, typed D, then A, then deleted the whole thing. I had never felt so dumb in my entire life, or so sad. Around dusk, I dragged myself out of the house. I walked the streets. Was this what being in love was like? If it was, it was pretty lousy. Then I had a brainwave. The weight of this girl's heart was clearly her stomach. I had just about enough in my account to buy a pizza. Meat feast seemed the obvious choice from what I had seen. I would buy a pizza, take it round. She would devour it, and I would try again. My name's David. What's yours? Genius is simple. I thought as I carried the pizza to her house. I waited for a moment at the base of the porch expecting her to have seen me again, make an appearance. My heart was beating ten to the dozen. Nothing. No swinging open door. Not even a creak. The smell of the pizza was drifting up at me. I went to knock on the door, and when I touched it, it moved. It was not locked. I pushed it open an inch, called out quietly, Hello? There was no reply. I can't really tell you what I was thinking apart from the prospect of seeing her again. Hello? I tried again. Still nothing, so I opened the door and went inside. The room I entered was dark and kind of smelly, to be honest. To be very honest, it smelled like a public toilet on a hot day. There was not much furniture. No carpet. My eyes were adjusting to the darkness and I thought I could make out terror marks across one of the chairs. As if someone had slashed in. They're going through hard times. I reminded myself. That was why I was here. The knight in shining armor. With his greasy cheese and tomato and pepperoni and beef and salami and chicken treasure. Hey. I said. My voice was getting shaky at this stage. It was pretty creepy in there and no one appeared to be at home. I could make out the shape of another open door at the far end of the room, but I could not see where it led, and did not have the backbone to find out. I decided to call today. I would find somewhere to leave the pizza, and next time I saw her, I would explain it was from me. It's the start of a beautiful conversation. I was looking around for a surface that was closest to clean when I heard a snarl. My guts tightened. They had a dog. Sounded like a big one. 
I was considering dropping the pizza and running when I saw two specks of red coming towards me through the gloom from the direction of the open door. Something on four legs. That snarled again. The pizza box was shaking real bad in my hands by now, and my fingers had dug into the cardboard. I had the heat of the pizza burning my fingertips, but I could not ease up. I was terrified. And then things got a whole lot worse. A second creature padded out into view. It too walked on all four legs. Its eyes were red, bloodshot, and it brought with it a stench of stale urine and much worse. It started to gag. I wanted to scream because now my eyes were fully adjusted to the darkness. I could see that this was not a dog, but a woman. She was smeared in filth. She crept towards me, paused, sniffed. The first creature came up to her side. It was a man. A feral, dirt-encrusted man, but human. His hair was matted and jumping with fleas. He was staring at me. Suddenly, he bared his teeth and reared up. My bladder let go. Sure, love can make you lose control. Fear? Raw, pure fear can do much worse to you. And then she appeared. She walked out into view. The girl next door. My trash can girl. She was wearing the same t-shirt and denim shorts. Her face was fixed into an expression of pure concentration. She was struggling with something. I had no idea what until she said, No. Her voice was cracked, strained. She was clearly finding it a fight to speak, but she persevered. Mom, Dad, please. No. The man who had reared up dropped back onto all fours and began to circle me. Drool hung from his mouth and left a trail across the bare floorboards. I stood there shaking, trying not to move, trying not to breathe. The girl remained very still. The only thing she did was tilt her head to one side, as she had done that first time we met, and I realized that she wanted to know what was in the box. I lifted the lid so she could see the pizza, held out the box to her. She moved towards me until we were close enough to touch. She took the box from me and walked away. The man and the woman followed me. She on two legs, they on four. Left alone, I started to cry. Over the last few days, I have got my act in gear. I've written a resume and I'm spending all my time applying for jobs. I've also emailed my old college, asking them if there is any way back for me. I am determined. More determined than I have ever been in my life. And as soon as I can, I'm going to get the hell away from here. I'm going to ask her to come with me. In an increasingly gig-based economy, you take on the jobs you can, even the ones that send alarm bells ringing in your head because you can tell that something just isn't quite right. I was having that very same thought as I looked up at my Uber passenger, who was waiting on a street corner. It was about 11pm and I could only just make out his profile in the dying lights of a blinking street light. He was standing next to a bus stop flanked by a field of corn stalks. That wasn't an unusual sight in the Midwest where the back roads seemed to be covered by pockets of farmland, but it just so happened to be the length of the corn stalks that helped me figure out that this dude was tall. I'm talking six and a half feet at least. He was wearing dark clothing, almost like a dress suit, but he seemed gaunt and drawn in on himself. A wide-brimmed hat helped to secure his face, so I couldn't be certain about how old he was. In his left hand, he was clutching a black bag. I was tilting my head, wondering if I still wanted to take him on as my passenger when he looked up at me. I crept up to the curb and stopped there, the engine running idly. According to my phone, he was a first-time user without any reviews. Oh well, money is money, right? I'd already accepted the ride anyway, 
and it was only about a 15 to 20 minute drive. I parked my car and unlocked the doors. He seemed to take stock of my car, then seemingly satisfied, nodded and walked to the passenger side door. He was extraordinarily tall, so he had to carefully duck down to fit inside of the car. When he climbed into my back seat, the strong smell of menthol flooded the cabin. I wonder if he'd been smoking while he weighed in. I just smelled the strong odor of antiseptic. And not the bitter sting of smoke and tobacco. One of the big drawbacks of being an Uber driver was that your occupants tended to bring interesting odors with them into the vehicle. I'd often spray the back seat down with Febreze at the end of my shift, and even then, there would sometimes still be the smells lingering in the cabin for a few days. So, in the scheme of things, I guess I didn't mind the hospital smell. I'd take an overly clean smell over something like swamp ass, marijuana, or piss. Hello. He said with a voice coated in gravel. He moved his bag and I heard the sound of metal on metal. Like there must have been tools inside. Evening, I offered. Then shifted the car into drive. I tended to follow my passengers by example. If they were interested in chatting, then I'd make small talk, but otherwise, I'd mostly just listen to the radio and mind my business. Tonight's entertainment was provided by one of the local jazz stations. I was following along with a rhythm line when the passenger suddenly spoke up. You normally drive late at night? He asked. His voice was peculiar. It was deep, but he also spoke very deliberately, like he had found the exact words he was about to use before he said them. The word to describe it would come to me later. Calculating. Yeah, I'm somewhat of a night owl, I said. This wasn't entirely true. I was behind on bills, and my day job as an office clerk just wasn't enough anymore. So I was whoring my car out to strangers a few nights a week. And I felt guilty about it every time. At least I kept up on vacuuming the floor mats. I saw your bag. You a doctor or something like that? I asked. I felt like I had reached a bit too far with the prying question, but I was really curious about what the hell the guy was doing out in the middle of nowhere with that bag. He tipped his head down and said, Yeah, you could say that. Well, thanks for being candid. Has there ever been something you've wanted to do but haven't? He asked me all of a sudden. Hell, if that wasn't a question. There were hundreds of things I wanted to do. Hundreds of places I wanted to go. I was 35 and driving a goddamned Uber in the middle of the night. Sure. My son. Who doesn't? Not something small, he said. But something that haunts your dreams makes you feel alive. The way he drew out his words as he said, alive, sent a chill through me. Well, there has been a movie I've wanted to see for a while now, but I just haven't had the time. He laughed, but it sounded almost more like a shuddering cough. It is good to not have regrets, he said. You must like games. If you don't mind amusing me, what if we play a game of heads or tails? That was a new one. Sure. I called back, not really thinking about it. What are we playing for? I heard a rattled cough and assumed it was him trying to laugh again, like his lungs wouldn't work quite right. Heads or tails? He croaked. I caught his eyes in my rearview mirror, and something about his gaze terrified me. He wasn't looking at me, but almost straight through me. His pupils were wide and deep, like black pits. He was smiling so hard I could see his teeth gleaming against his gums. Wasn't that a thing your eyes did when the light was low? I thought I had read it in a magazine once. And the pupils are black because light almost never escapes. Call it! He shouted so suddenly that I jerked the steering wheel. I could feel his breath on my neck. God, that menthol smell was so strong. He was leaning all the way up against my seat. The coin clutched between his fingers. Tails. I stammered without thinking. I glanced down at the routes on my phone. 
scanning for how much time was left on the ETA. A few minutes. The coin flipped through the air with a metallic ding sound. The stranger caught it out of the air and leaned in close as he slowly opened his hand, but then his face filled with disappointment. He leaned back in his seat and crossed his arms. Which was it? I asked, still feeling a bit shocked by his sudden outburst. Guess I had won, but what did I win? He remained silent, and the sudden silence creeped me out. I started to think about what he was doing at the bus stop so late. I reasoned that he must have taken a bus from wherever he had been working, and the bus didn't run by his place. But why would a doctor not have a car? Maybe it was in the shop, I thought. Maybe it broke down somewhere. The things we tell ourselves to calm our anxieties write stories of their own. A few minutes later, I reached the end of the route which stopped at a two-story house in a neighborhood I sometimes traveled through, about a city over from where we had started. I'll never forget what he said, or how he said it. It is good to be home. Climbed out of the car and slowly walked up the front steps towards the dark house. I waited a moment with the engine idle and pretended I was checking my phone. He seemed to fumble at the front door for a moment, but then the door opened, and he closed it shut behind him. Almost imperceptibly so. I expected the lights to slowly turn on around the house, but that didn't happen. It just stayed dark. My phone beeped with the promise of another rider, so I turned up the jazz on the radio again and left. I did a few more fares that night and forgot all about Mr. Tallman who reeked of menthol. In fact, he didn't cross my mind again until the next day when I was driving through the same neighborhood and spotted the house again. But this time, there was yellow police tape draped around the lawn. My heart sank. I slowed to a crawl in front of the house and leaned back. Hey, sorry. I just want to take a quick look here. To my passenger. Oh my god, replied my passenger. I think I heard about this on the news this morning. Morning news? I shifted uncomfortably in my seat and felt myself breaking into a cold sweat. What did you hear? I asked. A neighbor saw the front door hanging open this morning and peeked inside. The whole family was butchered. Like, there was blood everywhere. You serious? I asked. I just dropped the dad off here last night. That's... Jesus. Oh my god, really? You should probably tell the police. They probably have a lot of questions. She reached over the seat with her phone and showed me an article she had pulled up from the local news. Family of five slain in grisly murder. I looked at the headline, and then the accompanying image of the family. All of them smiling with no way of knowing their lives would soon be ending. The thoughts made me sick. Wait. I looked at the father. I mean really looked at him. That was not the same man I had dropped off last night. I was almost sure of it. For one thing, he wasn't towering over the family like my passenger would have been. Even though I hadn't gotten a great look at his face, the face of the father in the picture looked far less harsh and defined. The tall man... My passenger, even though his face had been mostly hidden by his hat, what I did see almost resembled a crude wood carving. A wave of nausea washed over me as my mind tried to balance an equation that seemed impossible to rectify. I kept coming to the same conclusion over and over again. The father was not the same person who had been riding in my back seat last night. I knew that for certain. I handed the phone back to her and said nothing. I sank into my seat, screwed my face up to not give anything away, gripped the wheel until my knuckles burned white and drove. I played back the memory in my head of the stranger entering through the front door. The slow, careful action I had assumed had been him fumbling with the key must have actually been him breaking or picking the lock, something I wouldn't have noticed as I flicked through my phone and casually glanced up at him. My pulse throttled against my shirt collar, and my stomach began to cramp. 
How could I have known that he didn't actually live at that address? I just did what I was told. I just did what the route said to do. This was not my fault, but... Maybe if I hadn't picked that guy up, no one else would have given him a ride. Maybe something else would have stood in his way and prevented him from ever reaching his destination. Maybe that family would still be. After I dropped off my passenger, I pulled off the road and went through my phone. I had to report him to the police. Even if he might have falsified all of his information. Even if he might be halfway across the state by now. It was then that I noticed I had a review I hadn't looked at yet. It was from the man. And he had left me a message. Thanks for the ride. You're lucky it wasn't heads. It's taken me quite some time to decide whether to tell anyone about this. With Mardi Gras coming up again soon, I wanted to make sure people were warned and know what happened. Something happened at Mardi Gras last year, and it's being covered up. Every word of what follows is true. My friends and I decided to go to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. I've always heard that the city was a non-stop, 24-hour, year-round party. I've also heard that the days leading up to Mardi Gras take this to the extreme. There were three of us all together. Myself, Chris, and Sam. We decided to arrive three days early and build up to the actual day of Mardi Gras. We drove down, taking turns at the wheel so we wouldn't have to stop at any hotels along the way. The first night. Saturday was our first night there. We are from New Jersey, which is about... 30 degrees Fahrenheit when we left, but when we arrived in New Orleans, it was in the 80s, and very humid. Our hotel was right on the Mississippi River, and our room had a waterfront view. We settled in, cleaned up, and went out to walk around and check things out. We slowly aimed ourselves toward the French Quarter, checking out as much as we could along the way. I was a bit shocked that we could just buy beer from vendors right on the street and walk around, Unbothered by police. You can't do that in Jersey. All in all, we had a great time, great food and drinks, and retired to the hotel around 4 a.m. while the city was still buzzing. As tired as I was, it took a while to fall asleep due to the loud people partying in the hallway and surrounding rooms. The second night, Sunday, we went to check out Hara's, the casino. And when we made it back to the streets for the atmosphere and alcohol once again, while walking around, we met a girl named Tony, who told us that she was a local, and that she was going to college there. Tony suggested we all go to a little restaurant just slightly out of the area, called Le Bata. That translates to the good times in English. We all headed down together, and it was a pretty cool little place. While we were there... I witnessed something that I had previously thought was only done in sitcoms. In the middle of our dinner, the door to the kitchen flew open, slamming against the wall. Out from the kitchen walked a large man, using one hand to carry a smaller employee by the back of his shirt collar. The guy being carried looked like there was something wrong with him. His eyes were half closed and bloodshot, while his face was almost pure white, completely void of expression. The larger man carried him by the back of his shirt all the way across the restaurant to the front door, where he pushed him outside and shut the door behind him. On his way back to the kitchen, the large man said, Sorry folks, but you just can't show up to work stoned out of your gourd like that. There were some giggles from the patrons in reply. We all drank quite a bit that night, and I ended up staying at Tony's place, about a mile away. Chris and Sam said they were going to stay out for a while longer then go back to the hotel. Third night. The next day, Monday, I texted my friends that I'd meet up with them later that evening. I spent the day with Tony, and we had a great time. I started wondering if this was too much for me to be getting into, allowing myself to get involved with a girl like this when I lived so far away. She was definitely someone who I would want to pursue a relationship with, but I knew I'd be leaving town without her in just a few days. I decided to push these thoughts away and let the proverbial chips fall where they may. 
We had two more days. Anything could happen. While Tony and I were walking back downtown later, I noticed that there was a girl walking about a block behind us who seemed to be pretty out of it. I couldn't tell if she was drunk, high, or what. Tony told me to just ignore her as she hurried me along. Once we got to the corner where we were meeting up with Chris and Sam, things began to get strange. As we were crossing the street, I felt a hand on my back, almost like someone was pushing me, although rather weakly. I turned around and realized that it was the girl who was walking a block behind us earlier. She wasn't actually pushing me though. It appeared that she needed to hold on to something to avoid falling over. We stopped and asked her if she was okay, and she just sort of grunted. At this point, I think we all became concerned. She started mumbling a bit, saying things like, My name is Emily. I was with friends, but now I'm here. And, I live here, that way. Pointing in a direction that was blocked by a parade round, I asked her, What happened? Did you lose your friends? To which she did not reply. We were standing right in front of a Burger King. I asked the crowd if someone could get a cup of water for her. Everyone who heard me just looked the other way and kept walking, some giving me the evil lie, as if I had done something wrong. A BK employee near the door said, You get her out of here, now, slamming the door shut. I noticed that Tony was staring at Emily with a very serious look on her face. Tony whispered into my ear, She isn't drunk. We should get out of here. I replied, But shouldn't we help her? She's really messed up. We can't leave her here to die. Tony begrudgingly said, All right, let's make this quick. We each got on one side and carried Emily along with us down the block, where we came across a security guard standing in front of a parking structure. I stopped and asked the guard if they could help. I explained that we didn't know what was wrong with her, but that she needed attention, and possibly a ride to the hospital. The guard looked at me like I was stupid. Tony gave her a shrug. The guard then refocused on Emily. She reached into Emily's backpack, rifled around a bit, and pulled out an ID card. The guard then said, I'll take care of this, and get her an ambulance. You can go on your way. Tony started pulling me along as I said thank you to the guard. As we were all walking, I asked Tony, What did you mean when you said she wasn't drunk? Is there something going on we don't know about? Tony just said, There's a lot of strange things going on around here that you don't want to know about, and neither do I. My friends kind of laughed, and we moved along. We had some drinks and got back into the celebratory mood. Chris mentioned that he had been wanting to check out one of the New Orleans cemeteries that he had read about. Tony did not look enthused, but Chris was already in motion. He walked over to one of the police officers who were standing guard and asked, Hey, do you know where the closest cemetery is? The officer looked him dead in the eye and stared for a few seconds. Then, and no, this is not a joke, even though it sounds like a bad slasher movie line, he said, There's one just a few blocks over that way but you don't want to be going down there. Chris smirked. Why not? The officer replied, and again, he really said this. It's not just a cheesy line from a horror movie. They don't really like your kind over there. I have to be honest, I was kind of freaked out by this interaction, and Tony wasn't looking happy. Chris said, come on, what's going to happen? This isn't a horror movie. After a long sigh, I replied, I guess it can't hurt. I've heard that the cemeteries are a sight to see around here. We embarked on Chris's quest, much to the chagrin of the rest of the group. There was quite a change in the look of the city as we got closer to the cemetery. We went from historic New Orleans cheek to something much less visually appealing. As we drew closer, I started to see and feel eyes on all of us. As we walked the final stretch of the cemetery entrance, there were at least a dozen people standing on their front porches and in their front yards, looking at us like we were about to do something really stupid. We shouldn't be here, Tony said quietly. Well, we are here, so let's just be quick about it, I said. When we got to the front gate, it was locked. Apparently, visiting hours were over. Oh no, I guess we have to leave. Too bad, said Tony. Despite our misfortune... We could still see all of the large, creepy, and wonderful burial structures 
through the wrought iron fencing. Because New Orleans is below sea level, bodies are buried above ground. The arrangement of the structures in the cemetery actually look like a small city. A city of the dead. The eyes were now piercing the back of our heads. And we knew something was going to happen if we didn't get out soon. But Chris started walking the perimeter of the fencing until he happened upon a crevice big enough for him to try and squeeze through. He told us to follow him. I was hesitant, and Tony was telling me that we need to leave. But I figured a quick adventure inside couldn't hurt. We'd be gone in a few minutes. Not even enough time for police to arrive and catch us. So we all squeezed through, one by one. It was getting pretty dark now. And this was really starting to feel wrong. I was just waiting for the doors to start opening and the dead to come out and greet us. I decided I was done with this place and said to Chris, Alright, we're going back. This is just disrespectful, and the locals obviously don't want us here. He shot back. Scared, huh? I ignored him. We all squeezed back out one at a time. Tony went just before me, and I was the last one out. I had a feeling like someone else was behind us, even though I was the last one. Before going through, I looked behind me, and I could swear that in the darkness, the door of one of the structures looked like it was sliding open. I could even hear the faint sound of a cement block scraping across the ground. I'm sure it was just my imagination, but this made me decide to get the heck out of there with the quickness. We walked silently at a much quicker pace back to the more populated downtown area. The noise and lights in the French Quarter seemed to welcome us home. Tuesday. Mardi Gras, Carnival, a farewell to the flesh. Today, the streets were twice as crowded as they had been the night before. This was the big day. Tons of new tourists filled the streets, to the point that we literally couldn't even walk on Bourbon Street. We attempted to, but got stuck in the crowd like someone had tried to fit 100 crayons into a box that was only meant for 50. If anything happened here, we simply wouldn't be able to move or get out of the way. For the rest of the day, we stuck to the side streets. As the parades carried on, it became more and more difficult to even go anywhere else, as they were blocking the streets, and thus blocking any way for us to go in the direction that we wanted. At this point, we kind of gave up and decided, if we can't beat them, we join them. Let's just go watch one of the parades, I said. The others were indifferent. We all grabbed drinks and walked toward one of the main streets of the city as nightfall was beginning to close in on us. On our walk, we came upon some sort of dance troupe in the street. There were probably a dozen people in the troupe, all dressed in dark red, tribal-looking outfits. Along with their dance, a few played hand drums, and they were all singing in what may have been French. I couldn't understand what they were saying, though. At some point... The woman in front who appeared to be the leader of the troop caught my eye and stared with a look as if she was not happy to see me. I saw her look over at Tony, then avert her gaze as if she had been caught. Let's go, said Tony. As we walked away, I looked back and saw that the woman was staring again, with the same unhappy look on her face. A few minutes later into our walk, we started to see a head down the street where it was looking more and more congested with people to the point of it looking like the main floor of a sold-out rock show. I wondered how these people could deal with being so compressed together. Tony spoke up. We want to stay away from anything that crowded. She said. The rest of us agreed. I said. Well, let's just get a little closer. We don't want to get right in the pit, but I do want to see what's so exciting over there. We kept walking. As we got closer, something started to seem a bit more clear. Not all of the people were making noise because they were having fun. Some of the merry making noises turned out to be screams. As we moved closer, despite Tony's objections, I noticed a small huddle of people in the center. Someone was on the ground. I hurried up to the circle and pushed my way to the inside. What I saw there left me frozen in my tracks. There were two people. One was laying on their back, motionless. The other was on their knees, hovering over the one on the ground and it looked... Like they were eating their face. Blood was spewing everywhere while gawkers screamed in terror. Tony grabbed my arm from behind me and said, I told you, we have to go. She pulled at my arm, but I couldn't avert my gaze from what was happening. Eventually, she pulled hard enough that I lost balance, sort of fell over, then got back up and started retreating with her. When we got back outside of the circle, 
we saw that there was another of the exact same scene happening maybe 20 feet away from us in another direction. What's happening? I screamed. Then, the first circle we saw was dispersing rapidly as the flesh eater abandoned their meal and started seeking dessert in the crowd. Just like that, another was incapacitated on the ground, becoming seconds. But there was something else that I noticed while the thing was rising to look for its next victim. It was Emily, the girl who followed us the previous night. Tony told us that we were going to need to get to her place. As we began running, there were more and more of these things attacking and eating others. Where were they all coming from? If this wasn't horrifying enough, I then received the answer to my question. Some of the flesh eaters were missing faces themselves. Just bone, blood, and remnants of skin where their faces used to be. And they were using these skeletal faces to eat those of others. They weren't coming from anywhere. They were being created by the other flesh eaters. As one walked away from their meal, I saw the body of their victim rise and begin chasing their own mark. I was transfixed on this horrific, spontaneous, public meltdown of society happening right before our eyes. When I was suddenly thrust to the ground with great force, I never saw it coming. I had no idea what was happening. I eventually focused and realized that I had one of these faceless flesh eaters hovering over me. Blood was dripping from their jowls onto my face. I knew it was all over for me. Before I could even scream... Tony suddenly appeared face to face with the creature hovering over me, except she looked different. Her eyes were blood red and she appeared to have a large set of fang-like teeth protruding from her open mouth. She used one hand to pick up the creature, bringing it face to face with her. She stared directly into its eyes and let out a guttural, terrifying sound like I've never heard. Whatever this was, the creature was afraid of Tony. She dropped it and scrambled off immediately. She looked at me with her new face and shouted, Get up and follow me. They won't touch you now. I ran behind her the rest of the way. Tears in my eyes, I tried to figure out what was happening. When we got to her place, Tony locked the doors, and then shook some sort of liquid out of a bottle onto the floor in front of each of the doorways and windows. This won't be over until morning, she said. Her face was back to normal now. We all stayed together in the living room that night. I knew that Tony would keep us safe. When daylight broke, she alerted us that it should be safe now, but that we needed to leave the city and go home immediately. We piled into her car so that she could drive us back to ours at the hotel. As we drove, I noticed that the streets were now empty, save for what appeared to be cleanup crews picking up the aftermath. Some were power washing the ground where there appeared to be dark stains. There were no bodies and no flesh eaters out seeking breakfast from what I could see. We were all dead silent for the entire drive, focused on what was happening outside our windows. Tony turned on the radio to a news station. They were reporting that several people had died in what they called parade float accidents the prior day. As Tony said goodbye to us, she hugged me and put a note in my pocket. I haven't had the courage to read it yet. She looked just like my mother. That's what I thought when I saw her crouching in the gutter, vomiting God knows what into the road. The streetlights illuminated a giant figure with stringy blonde hair, pale skin, and a huge patchwork cardigan. My mother had been a kindergarten teacher before cancer took her. She always wore bright, soft clothing like that, even on her days off. I don't usually approach homeless people. Maybe that makes me a bad person. But you hear all these scams about people begging, then getting into a brand new Mercedes when the night falls, or wasting their money on booze and drugs. My mother would never have done any of those things. I think that's why I approached her. Ma'am, are you okay? Was the most stupid question I could have asked. But I went with it anyway. Up close, she looked a bit less like my mother. 
Her green eyes were darker, and she had a thin, pale scar stretching from the top of her eyebrow to the beginnings of her hairline. Do I look okay to you? It's something my mother would definitely have said back. My face reddened. The woman, not my mother. I tried to remember, wiped her mouth on her sleeve as though I wasn't there. Well, should I take you up to see a doctor? Up close, she looked about as exhausted and miserable as any person I have ever seen. The bags under her eyes were heavy and dark. When she belched, I saw a couple of teeth were missing. I'd rather have a roof over my head. These nights are cold, you know. She stopped and gave me a long once-over. I was wearing a thick fleece jacket, gloves, a scarf knitted by my best friend. My arms were laden with gifts bought for the festive season. My face turned even redder. I felt like a glutton under the gaze of this woman who I had only just met. The woman stood up and stepped closer. This close she reeked of unwashedness and a stale something I couldn't place. But there was something else underneath. Lavender. Beneath the dirt, she had the exact same scent as my mother's old lavender perfume. Poppy Poppin, have you got a place for me to stay? Her whisper was hoarse but kind. Poppy Poppin, I hadn't heard that nickname since the day my mother died. I set her up in the guest room, making sure the nicest sheets were on the bed. It's a small room, but cozy enough with room for the odd bits and bobs the woman had brought with her. Somehow, I hadn't noticed her bag at first. It was huge, more like Santa's sack than anything. It contained blankets, small bags of snacks, tobacco, and some strange things too. Like a picture of a woman and her child. Too blurry to make out any strong details, but the child had bobbed blonde hair and a pink dress I remembered throwing a fit about wearing when I was seven years old. Inside a small Ziploc bag, she kept a small cluster of baby teeth. I tried not to stare at them too much, but of course she noticed. From a little girl who looks just like you, she said cackling. I reckon if I plant them someday... Something might grow. The other things were equally bizarre. There was a clay figure of a fox, missing an ear, wrapped in newspaper. My mother had loved watching the foxes in our garden at dawn, running back towards the woods. Had I made a clay fox for her once? Finally, she had a small coin purse. Inside were coins, of course but also some other things. A tiny square of paper folded many times. I was too polite to ask to see, but again, she saw me looking. This? She asked. This now is my most prized possession. Since you're so nice and gave me a room, I'll show it to you. When she unfolded the picture, my heart leapt into my throat. It was a child's drawing of a woman with bright yellow hair and green eyes. She wore a rainbow jumper, baby blue jeans, and had bright orange circles for feet. In one hand, she held an ice cream cone dripping onto the floor. In the other, she held the hand of a familiar little girl. Mummy, I love you forever from Poppy. I didn't need to see the wax scribbles to remember that day in art class. I had been upset because Danny Keenan had broken the best green crayon, so I had to use a different shade for my mother's eyes. I also remembered taking it home to share with my mother. I was bursting with pride when she pinned it to the refrigerator. Love you forever. The woman didn't say anything. She just smiled. She stayed in my house for six days. During that time, she was a model guest. That first day, I woke up thinking she was going to have robbed me in my sleep, or been waiting around the door with a kitchen knife and my wallet in hand. Neither of those things happened. 
Instead, I woke up to the smell of freshly cooked bacon. She raided the fridge and put together an almost passable English breakfast. Just like my mother. Never too good at cooking. We settled into a routine quite quickly. She left the house when I went to work. I never dared to ask where she went, but she always came back with her coin purse a little heavier. On a couple days, she came back with stranger things. One was another small photograph in black and white of a little boy and his white-haired grandmother. Pride when giving me that. She announced proudly through a mouthful of cottage pie. Another was a child's plastic charm bracelet, with pink and purple beads spilling out the name Jennifer. She didn't want to talk about that one at all and buried it at the bottom of her sack. But every night the woman vomited, around midnight, some perverse Cinderella's curse. I heard her run to the bathroom every night to throw up whatever she had eaten. It reminded me of my mother's long days of chemotherapy. A few times I called out to see if she was okay, but never received a response. Perhaps she was sick and too embarrassed to tell me. I considered calling a doctor, but really, she seemed perfectly well at all other times. Maybe she had an anxious stomach. I tried to bury it in the back of my mind. Those six days seemed like a blur now. It felt like I had my mother back. The first day I was at the shop right as it opened and bought lavender scented everything. Soap, shampoo, conditioner, body lotion, the works. After she showered, my house reeked of my mother's son. I also gave her a few things to keep her busy. A romantic novel my mother had read a hundred times while waiting for chemotherapy, and a pair of slippers she'd worn around the house for as long as I could remember without them ever getting faded or dirty. The woman accepted these gifts like treasures, but she never asked what they meant. Sometimes I thought I saw tears in her eyes. I never thought to ask for her name. The answer seemed so clear in my head. On the sixth day, I took the day off work and cooked my mother's favorite meal. Roast beef, potatoes, vegetables, Yorkshire puddings, and thick gravy. For dessert, I spent hours carefully rereading her old recipe book to make the cake she'd always prepared for my birthday. It was chocolate filled with jam and cream, and covered in small red and white piped flowers. Instead of an age, however, I just piped the word mother. That's the only time I ever saw the woman look angry, but only for a second. It flashed into her eyes so quickly I thought I had mistaken it, but her mouth hardened into a line and her eyes seemed to tear up again. Quickly, I realized she wasn't angry with me, but with herself. Mother, ma'am, is everything okay? Yes, Poppy Puppet, she said, though the smile on her face seemed to tremble. You have done me good, ever so well. Any mother would be proud to have a daughter like you. I couldn't hide the happiness in my face. I only wish that hers didn't look so tired. I almost asked a question. Almost, but something was still stopping me. It didn't matter. On the seventh day, the woman told me everything. I'm not your mother, Poppy. The woman spoke while buttering some lightly burned toast the next morning. I was halfway through a mouthful of baked beans. Trying not to choke, I struggled to answer. What? Look, I know I look just like her. We have the same habits and clothes. Hell, I even smell like her now, thanks to you. But I am not your mother. Her smile was the kindest and most painful I have ever seen. I am so grateful to you and so, so sorry. But I can't be her forever. My mind was racing. I remembered a hundred little things. When she read the romance novel, she folded the corners of the pages just like my mother used to do, to my deep annoyance. 
Neither of them could cook anything without it coming out a little bit wrong. Her cardigan was identical to one my mother wore in a school photo. Secretly, I had scoured through photo albums and found the match. They both had a slightly nasal laugh, brushed their hair behind their ears with the same gesture, belched like pigs after a good meal and didn't care for anything cooked too spicy. They wore the same clothes and shoes, before my mother's chemotherapy, I mean. Blonde hair and green eyes, the baby teeth, the drawing, poppy, poppin'. But the drawing. It shows you whatever you want to see, darling. Take another look. She took out the same piece of paper and held it in front of my face. Think of your happiest memory. Something that always brings joy to your face. Go on. As I thought, the crayon scribbles seemed to rearrange themselves. I saw myself, my mother, and my father on a trip to the zoo. My parents had bought me a stuffed lemur almost as big as myself. I had wrapped a striped tail around my neck like a scarf. My father was doing impressions of the animals to make us laugh. My mother wore the same cardigan as her kindergarten days and held ice creams for all of us. How is this possible? Now think of your worst memory. The one that makes your heart feel broken. You know it. I didn't want to, but it flooded back so fast I could barely keep up with the flowing crayon scribbles. First I saw my father lying in a hospital bed after the accident. He'd been crushed by a forklift at work. His lower half was covered by many thick blankets to stop me seeing the gore, but a little blood seeped through. He'd wanted to see me one last time, knowing he was too hurt to survive. Next, of course, was my mother. The sight so many tubes and wires attached to her, like Medusa's snakes, turned me to stone. I couldn't look away from the beeping of the machines or the paleness of her face, or the baldness of her head that looked so vulnerable beneath the fluorescent hospital lights. I wish someone had given her a cap to cover it. Tears ran down my face into my breakfast. The woman was crying too, but her tears were strange. I was a mess of tears and snot, but her tears ran down her face perfectly straight. Her nose didn't run, nor did her eyes look red. It was as though she had a computer animation running on her face. We call ourselves the Sorrows. We come from nowhere, and we have nobody and nothing. We don't know what we are. We live as humans and change to meet how humans wish to perceive us. For some, it's their parents. Others, even their children or ex-lovers. It's the only way we can receive any kindness in this cold, cold world. I thought of every poor street beggar I had ever turned my nose up to. I thought of not my mother. Vomiting into the gutter like a round of chemo gone bad. Why do this? Why pretend to be my mother? How can you do this? It's how we survive. It's remarkably easy to get any information from your brains. I know all of your likes and dislikes. I could describe any life story in great detail. For example, your 16th birthday. Your mother had baked a cake just like the one you made yesterday for me. But you were angry because of an argument with your best friend and wanted to cancel the party altogether. Your mother tried to be patient, but in the end, both of you were yelling at each other. When the first guests arrived, you were still arguing. But half an hour later, when the party in full swing, you had forgiven each other completely. I smiled. And then... And then your best friend arrived an hour late. Amy was never on time, but she had brought you a present. Two, actually. One was a kid's friendship necklace. Two hearts that fit together as an ironic kind of apology. The other was a CD you'd been wanting for months. 
You gave her the biggest slice of birthday cake and turned your living room into a nightclub filled with dancing and the smallest glasses of wine. I could feel the gift paper pressed into my hands. The pounding of that year's most popular song echoed in my ears. Amy, always smelling of vanilla perfume, and her hands on my shoulders as we slow danced, giggling and pretending to be madly in love. Only, I wasn't quite pretending. People like you are kind, but you'd never let any old stranger into your home. I understand that. Humans can be dangerous, but you also turn your eyes from us on the streets. If I were an old man, would you stop to see me vomit in the road? If I were a runaway, would you offer me money or a hotel room to stay in? I didn't need to answer. My shame spoke for me. You are kind to me because you want your mother back. That doesn't mean you are a cruel or ungenerous person. It simply makes you human. But I can't bring her back. Your mother will always be dead. And I really am just a sorrow. I can't stay here forever. My head snapped up. What? Why not? I gestured to the kitchen scene around us. We looked as comfortably domestic as any other mother and daughter. We could pretend. You'd have a roof over your head and maybe I'd have... have a family again. The shaking of her head broke my heart again. You'd start to notice the cracks. The parts of me that aren't quite like her. You still don't like to see my scar, do you? I blushed. It was true. I always averted my eyes from the thin line striping her face. And darling, my eyes will never, ever be green enough. These are all little things, but I promise, those would increase in time. My grief was a physical thing, just like it had been when my mother really died. It felt like hands were gripping my heart and squeezing out all the good and bad memories of my mother with it. The strength of it made it hard to breathe as I fell back into my chair, willing the memories to either stop or take me away for good. So what will you do now? I was surprised I could even manage the words. The woman finished eating her toast. Today, I will go walking again. Tonight, I will pack my things and leave in the morning. It is time for me to move on, but it has been lovely knowing you, Poppy Poppin'. She rose from the table and began to wash the dishes. The best china I'd set out especially for her. I stayed put, my mouth now shut tight, thick tears still leaking from swollen eyes. I was only vaguely aware of the woman moving around the kitchen, drying dishes, scraping away the abandoned food from my plate, and finally fishing out some tissues to dry my face. I blew my nose and looked up at her face. Her scar seemed more severe than before. Would that make it easier? If I focused on all the wrongness and none of the right? I still had a hundred questions to ask the woman. At this time I chose only one. Why do you go walking? The woman stood still. Emotions played over her face like a child flicking through a flip book. Sorrows like us need to eat. And not your ordinary kind of food. It's best if you don't ask too much. A few minutes later, the woman was ready to go walking. I stood by the gate and waved her goodbye. She was wearing my mother's cardigan and clutching an empty sack. Before the woman left that night, I crept into her room. I knew she was awake and could see me. I didn't care. I tiptoed over and opened the sack she had filled with belongings again. I saw some of the same things. Blankets, baby teeth, the drawing that showed my mother again. Also, some new things. A man's watch, old but still ticking, a thin wad of cash, a generic greetings card that looked like it had been written in a hurry, 
with a 50 pound note folded inside. Also some scraps of clothing. They look like t-shirts and jeans, all covered with blood and bits of gore. I think Sorrows must have quite the appetite. Holding back tears, I added my own bundle to the sack. A bottle of lavender perfume. A box of the biscuits my mother had always bought whenever they went on sale. A bottle of red wine gifted to my mother one Christmas and still untouched. A bundle of her t-shirts and long flowing skirts. And of course, the patchwork cardigan. When I left the next morning, it was as though the room had never been touched at all. I've met other sorrows since then. I try to give a little money or food to any homeless person I see. Sometimes it's clear they're drunk or on drugs. I don't let it bother me. We all have our demons, but we still deserve care. I've met some familiar faces there too. One looked like Amy. She also stayed for six days. We talked about the argument we'd had that birthday. How I'd had a huge crush on her, but she was as straight as a ruler. I found the matching friendship necklace she'd bought and wore it under my shirt. We made mooncakes together and talked about how much she'd missed me as a child when she went back to Taiwan every summer. She even taught me a little Mandarin. After the sorrow left, I called the real Amy for the first time in years. She's married now with twin sons and a wonderful husband who volunteers at a homeless shelter. I still haven't found the nerve to ask him about the sorrows. Another sorrow I met looked like my grandfather. I only knew him for the first few years of my life. When I think of him, I remember the smell of peppermint sweets and the endless carpentry he'd do in his garage. We spent a lot of time together doing things we never had a chance to do. Him teaching me how to drive, hearing his own father's stories about the war, and me learning a hundred little stories from discovering his love of carpentry to discovering his love for my grandmother. After his six days, he left me an immaculately carved wooden poppy on my kitchen table. I never tried to look through their things. Sometimes they came home with blood on their clothes. Each sorrow apologized profusely, and I never saw so much as a speck when it came to do the laundry. It took a lot of effort not to wonder where it came from. When the last sorrow left, I followed him. He looked like my uncle, the oldest child of his generation. He'd passed away in my teens after a wild life of alcohol and parties. I remembered him as short, dark-skinned, pot-bellied, and with thick, bleached blonde hair that never seemed to thin or turn gray. He always wore the same jacket to family reunions, purple suede. He always jokingly compared him to Prince. We had parties every night for the six days we spent together. He drank enough wine to drown a man and showed me drinking games even my university days hadn't taught me. Even with his stature, he danced effortlessly with the grace of a rock star too cool to acknowledge the audience cheering at his feet. He always called my pops, never Poppy, and made jokes about the heavy lidded eyes and strong jaw I'd inherited from my father. I didn't plan to follow him, I just did. After I heard the door close that seventh morning, I put on my warm winter jacket and packed a bag full of warm blankets and snacks, just in case I met any homeless people on the way. The thick snow falling from the sky made it easy to follow his footsteps from a distance. The air was so chill, I shivered in my winter coat. I doubted the sorrow's purple suede was enough to keep him warm. But as he walked, he seemed to blur. It happened like my glasses were steaming up after entering a hot room. He grew taller and thinner, and the purple suede jacket faded into a thin, navy shirt. His hair was gray and straggly. I couldn't see his face, but I knew it had to be creased with wrinkles. Was this the sorrow's true form? 
Even from a blurred distance, the pity I felt for him was overwhelming. He looked just like an elderly man with nowhere to go, bumbling about the streets of the city. Eventually, he stopped outside a coffee shop and put down his sack beside the nearby bench. It had bars built in, so he couldn't lie down. Instead, he looked out a blanket and wrapped it around his shoulders. Entering the coffee shop, he had a short conversation with the barista. I could see the pity on her face. She gave him two cups, one steaming with coffee and the other empty. When he settled on the bench outside, he left the empty cup perched in the snow before him. He didn't need to write a message. I walked over to him and unzipped my backpack. Silently, I gave him another blanket, a packet of crisps, and a handful of coins. He nodded slowly and said nothing. I went into the cafe and chose a window seat. Lots of people walking by paid the sorrow no interest, even as the snow gathered upon his shoulders. Still, some were kind. One carefully dumped the snow out of his coffee cup and wiped the coins inside dry with her scarf. Another helped him shake his blanket free of snow. Some gave him loose change, and twice he was given drinks from the coffee shop. But few of the passersby seemed to recognize him. The first one looked like she'd been hit by a truck. She was an older woman with thick black hair and dark eyes. The moment she saw him, she stopped dead. People complained as they moved around her. The sorrow himself had changed so fast. It took me a moment to notice his own thick black hair and olive skin. The woman babbled something excitedly in Spanish and the sorrow replied, laughing as though he weren't sitting up upon a freezing street. Though I understood little, it was clear she was offering to help. Strangely, though, he seemed reluctant to follow her down the street. Eventually, the woman opened her purse and emptied the contents into his cup as the sorrow thanked her profusely. Then she took the scarf from her neck and wound it around his. Both seemed to cry a little as this one little gesture. I made eye contact with the sorrow as the woman left. He showed nothing on his face. The other was a man who looked to be in his late 60s. He was a tall Asian man who walked with a cane and held a bundle of Christmas presents in his other hand. When he saw the sorrow, she was a young woman with long braided hair, dark eyes, and a school uniform that looked foreign. I saw the exact moment he spotted the sorrow. He didn't quite stop dead, but he moved towards her, slowly and carefully, until they stood watching each other closely. Neither of them exchanged words. Cautiously, the man opened one of his shopping bags and pulled out a pre-wrapped gift, handing it to the sorrow. He muttered just one sentence that I was able to lip read. You look just like she did. Please, take care. The sorrow unwrapped the gift after the man struggled away. It was a stuffed toy of a popular children's character. Attached to it was a note I could just read from the window. I remember and miss you every day. I hope you have a wonderful, heavenly Christmas. With love from your doting father. It was late afternoon when the sorrow began to change again. The streets were packed with people returning home from work. Clutching my third hot chocolate of the day, I held the book half-heartedly in front of me as I pressed my nose to the window. The blurring was easier to see at this angle. He became younger and female with long, curly hair and beautiful dark skin. As she blurred, the sorrow's clothing changed to a stained red woolen dress with a gray cardigan and matching red mittens. A hole in one of them meant her fingers poked through. She wore battered brown boots with the laces missing and drooping knee socks patterned with hearts. More than anything, she looked like a student fallen on hard times. 
as soon as she began to move. I discarded my book and followed her. She moved slowly, as though walking caused her pain, and I noticed one of her legs was slightly shorter than the other. I followed her through the increasing snow, across streets, down alleys, until we were in a completely different part of the city. Still, no one but me seemed to have noticed her. We reached a park. The sorrow sat on the bench. I sat on the one opposite. We simply sat and observed each other. For a brief moment, I saw my father's eyes in her face. It was as the sun set when the man appeared. He looked rich, tall, tanned, blonde, and muscular. He wore a suit that looked like it cost more than my monthly rent. His shoes were polished leather, and his scarf had to be cashmere. All that he needed was a briefcase to complete the look. He had barely turned the corner before he saw the sorrow. He stopped dead. His voice was weaker than I had expected. Julia? Is that you? The sorrow said nothing. She only looked at him with cold, emotionless eyes. A bruise started to form just below her left cheekbone. The man looked on the edge of panic, but he seemed unable to move. Julia, this can't be you. Say you're not her. How can you be here? How did you find me? With every word, something new happened to the sorrow. Her nose caved in as if struck by an invisible punch. Her clothes looked more and more tattered. One of her eyes was filled red with blood. One arm hung loosely, clearly broken at the wrist. Answer me. What is happening? How are you here? When the sorrow spoke, her jaw unhinged like that of a snake. Her teeth were pointed. You thought you had killed me and gotten away with it, Brian. The man clamped his mouth shut. He seemed unable to move. You beat me day and night. You said it was because you loved me so much. You couldn't bear other men looking at me. Or my male friends texting me. Or my parents disliking you. Or a hundred more petty little things. Sometimes you just had a bad day, so you beat me, but I loved you, so I stayed. I wasn't sure if the man would ever speak again. But one day, you came home from work drunk. You'd had a fight with your boss over a missed promotion, then stopped at a bar on the way home. You were very drunk and very angry. I tried to embrace you. You pushed me into a wall. A horrific injury was forming at the back of the sorrow's head. It was like someone had caved in her skull with a bat, or maybe a bottle. Old, black, and blood matted her hair. I tried to apologize, but every sorry seemed to make it worse. You hit me again and again, and I begged you to stop. The more I begged, the worse it got, so I became quiet. I wanted you to leave me alone, but my silence seemed to give you a different idea. You left me broken and sobbing on the kitchen floor, and came back with a rolling pin from the kitchen. The only other sound was the snow falling gently around us. The sorrow stood up. That was a real dick move, Brian. I had been using that rolling pin to make biscuits for my mother's birthday, but instead you used it to cave in my skull. You beat me so many times. It stopped feeling like a wound and more like the pounding of my poor, broken heart. When I died, I wasn't even mad at you. I only wondered what I had done to make you so angry. Have you ever seen a rabbit? Knowing it's about to be caught by a fox. That's how this man looked when the sorrow approached him. Julia wasn't mad at you, Brian. But I am. Her jaw shot out, and her teeth seemed to extend as they punctured his face. Screaming, the man sunk to his knees, the sorrow descending on him like a monster's desperate to feed. I sat and watched as she devoured him without mercy. Blood, guts, bones, and all. I expected the snow to turn red, but his blood seemed to fly towards the sorrow with a magnetic force. 
His wailing only ended after she clawed the heart from his chest and stripped it into pieces with her new, talon-like claws. With every piece swallowed, her injuries seemed to heal a little, until the only sign of the man was the shredded, expensive suit on the ground. Finally, when it was over, the sorrow looked over to me. Panic seized me. Would she let me live, knowing what I had seen? But I too felt too paralyzed by fear to run. I didn't want to become another bundle of fabric on the ground, but my knees refused to let me stand up. The sorrow came and sat beside me. As she moved, she blurred and morphed and changed again. Finally, she became an image of my father. You have helped many sorrows in this city, providing you live a good and kind life. We will never harm you. The man you saw was a killer who ruined the life of a wonderful young woman. You know how poor the justice system is when the killer is white and the victim is not. I nodded. This was a familiar conversation with my mixed-race father. He got away with everything. I decided he needed to pay. Do you think I made the right decision? I stared at the mass of ruined clothing across the park. Brian Redfern was the oldest of three children. He has two living parents, both of whom doted on their children. He grew up upper class and became a leading professor in neuroscience. His research saved many lives. He has a family who loves him, a close group of friends, and a new girlfriend who he has never so much as struck in anger. Do you think I made the right decision? The sorrow put his hand on my knee. It felt warm and familiar. The same gesture my father used to make. After he killed Julia, he hid her body in a reservoir. It was found and he was a suspect, but the evidence wasn't enough. He had too many loyal supporters. Eventually, he was cleared of all charges. Julia's killer was never named and her family misses her every day. She deserved better, was all I could think to say. She did. The sorrow nodded. Brian felt remorse. Not enough to confess, but some. He quit drinking the day after he murdered Julia. He donated a great deal of money to help Julia's family. They were much poorer than his. He still keeps in touch with her sister and listens to her grief. Is that kindness? It's grotesque. Brian thought he could redeem himself. I have to feed Poppy. All sorrows must feed. We eat humans and we try to eat the ones who we think deserve it. The murderers, the rapists, the child abusers. But it's horrible work. Even though we're genetically meant to kill, it causes us great sorrow. Maybe Brian could have been redeemed if he'd turned himself in one day, and faced the consequences of his actions. Do you think I made the right decision? Yes. My answer was instantaneous. You killed a monster to stay alive. That's what heroes do in books and films. Sorrow smiled sadly. I'm no hero. I just want to live. No sorrow understands where we came from, why we have to feed, and even how long we will live. I have lived a very long life, Poppy. I have fed upon many people and been treated kindly by many more. Indeed, it's the kindness people like you give us that sustains us as much as the people we consume. Tears stung my eyes. But we're not good people. We only help you because you remind us of people we love. Humans are complicated beings. That much we understand. It's good to help people for any reason. But it's also good to help people for selfish reasons. The most important thing is just to do good. Goodness will keep us alive until the end. I still had a hundred questions, but my head was buzzing. The sorrow stood up and walked over to the shredded clothes. Whistling a tune from my childhood, he swept them into his sack. I chose one question, the one that mattered the most. 
Excuse me. Will you stay with me? I have a room waiting for you. For my whole life, I had lived in that nowhere town, nestled in the woods of central Ontario, just off Highway 144, where the pines were tall and the days were cold. Since I was young, I'd wanted out, not only because of my fear of becoming a townie like my peers were destined to be, but because of my family. I had a rough childhood, one I'm not keen to get into. Suffice it to say, my home life alone was enough to convince me to leave and never come back. So at age 19, with nothing but a trunk of clothes and personal items, and my aunt hand me down 2007 Toyota Corolla, I did just that. That night was the straw that broke the camel's back. Things had been rocky since mom had passed away. After a night of beer, breath, beratement from my father, I just couldn't take it anymore. I remember being so angry I could have cried. I wasn't thinking straight. I know that now, but I don't regret it. The lights of the town faded out behind me in the rearview mirror. I should have been happy. I should have celebrated. Called up my friends from out of town and asked them to make a spot for me on their couch. Or recommend a good motel to crash in. But as I drove in the dark, all I felt was a crawling dread. My friends had offered me a place to stay countless times, even just for a night. I'd always turn them down, convinced myself that I could do this on my own, that I didn't need anyone's help to get out of here. I guess I was right, after all, though. That pit in my stomach just got deeper and deeper. It wasn't so bad that I needed to leave, really, but I shook my head. I didn't let myself cry or turn around. I didn't let myself feel a thing at all, honestly. I was just doing it to prove a point. I could leave, even if I'd be back eventually. I'd push those thoughts out of my head, though. I didn't need any distractions. But I should have seen it coming then, right? I wasn't distracted by any emotions. I was just staring straight ahead. I should have seen it, right? I have trouble recalling what happened that caused my car to crash. I must have just hit my head, but there was no bruise, no pain. There was nothing in front of my car, and then it wasn't there anymore. There was a bang as my tire popped and I swerved to the side, coming to a skidding halt on the dirt road. I jumped out of the car, looking around in confusion to see what I'd hit, but there wasn't anything there. Not a sharp rock or tire spikes. Not a deer or dog or any other animal. I swore to myself when I took my phone out, finding it unable to turn on. A welcome sign on the outskirts of town was right behind me, staring me down mockingly. I looked down the road, even though I couldn't see very far. There was a light in the distance, yellow and blue and white just within reach. I took the keys and walled out of my car and locked the door behind me and started walking down the road. It didn't take long to reach the lights, just off the side of the road. There it was. It was the size of a supermarket, with warm yellow light emanating from inside. It looked just like a normal grocery store, albeit an unpopulated one, with large glass windows at the front to entice those outside to take a peek at its wares. Above the entrance, there was the name of the store, in big neon blue bubble letters, Solo Mart. I'd driven out of town this way dozens of times and I'd never noticed it, but I wasn't about to look a gift horse in the mouth. I figured I could ask to use the landline and maybe get a snack for the road while I was there. I walked into the store, hands shoved into my pockets as I glanced around in search of a staff member. I've always hated asking for help at grocery stores, and being the only person in the store aside from staff only makes it worse for some reason. I started to slink through the aisles, hoping to run into someone. The place made me feel really on edge for some reason, like I'd been here before. The sense of deja vu I got just from standing in the canned food aisle made whatever appetite I had dry up immediately. Hello, sir. Welcome to Solomart. 
I nearly jumped out of my skin when someone came up behind me. I rolled around to face the employee. He was just a regular looking guy. Of course he was. What was I thinking? He was a little shorter than me with brown hair, wearing a blue polo shirt with a name tag clipped on his chest. Keith, the red. He looked familiar, but I was sure I'd never seen him before in my life. I knew I'd never met him, but he had the face of someone who I'd known since I was young, but hadn't seen in years. It made me feel something I can't describe. Hey, uh, sorry. Do you have a landline I could use? I asked. He blinked at me for a long moment like he didn't understand what I'd said. I was about to repeat what I'd said, thinking he hadn't understood me, but before I could, he cleared his throat. Landline? Right, yeah, of course, sir. He said, sounding confused at first, but something more aware as he spoke. He stood there for a long moment. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'll need to check in the staff room for a landline. He didn't meet my eyes, looking through me rather than at me, with a strange, glazed-over expression of bland, polite joviality. I'll go look for a phone. Why don't you take a look around the store while I do that? Are you okay? I asked. His expression didn't change. I got a strange feeling like something was on the tip of my tongue. Have... Have we met before? He didn't respond. Didn't even give me a look as he turned on his heel and walked away. Weird. I figured he was probably high. Or maybe just sleep deprived. I felt bad for the guy, but he still left me with the hair on my neck standing on end. And a wary feeling weighing on me. I figured I'd pass the time by walking around. The store truly was empty. The only sound coming from my footsteps and the music that played from the speaker system. It sounded old. Like someone had deep fried the sound quality of an old 50s commercial track. I rounded the corner of one of the aisles into the frozen food section. There was a stand with free samples where another person was standing. She had long blonde hair and brown eyes, wearing the same uniform as Keith. I squinted at her. Was she... Samantha? I asked, cocking my head at her. She stared straight forward for a moment, with a blank expression on her face, before blinking and turning to look at me with a bright smile. Hi, I'm afraid not, sir, she said. I blinked a few times and... Oh, I guess she wasn't her. I could have sworn she was, but when I blinked, she looked like a complete stranger. I glanced at her name tag. Jane. Oh, sorry. I thought you were someone else. I said. Embarrassment crept up my neck at the situation I'd put myself in, so I tried to curb my discomfort by looking down at her table of free samples. It was ice cream, I think. She had a big tub of the stuff on the table plastic container of pale purple frozen something. The container had the word Exy Whip written on the lid and sighed in loopy white script on a dark purple background with little white stars like a night sky. Next to the tub of ice cream there was a tray of little paper cups with tiny portions of Exy Whip. I'd never seen it in a store before. It's vegan. Would you like to try it? She asked jovially breaking me out of my contemplation. Yeah, sure, I said, picking up one of the little cups. She handed me a tiny spoon to eat it with. Thanks, uh, I'm just gonna walk around, I said. For some reason, the way she looked at me made me feel just so uncomfortable. She hardly blinked, just stared head on at me with that same blank smile that Keith had. I wandered away taking a tentative bite of the Exy Whip. It was sweet, marshmallowy, like some weird kind of blue moon ice cream. It had a strange aftertaste, like a sugar-free sweetener that made me grimace. Yuck. I tried another bite to make sure I didn't like it, and yeah, no, that's real fucking bad. 
I wondered why they even carried the stuff. I started looking around for a garbage bin to toss it in, wondering where the fuck Keith had gone and what was taking him so long. As I walked down the frozen food aisle, I started to feel strange. My steps got sluggish, and my head began to hurt, almost like a brain freeze right behind my eyes. I winced, holding my head with my free hand and looking down at the melting cup of Xy Whip with confusion. What the hell were they putting in this shit? My head spun, sparks appearing in my vision, my ears beginning to ring, and I think I blacked out. I must have. I remember falling to the cool tile floor and my vision going dark. I think I... I think I dreamed. I dreamt I was somewhere, like a void of dark purple. Ahead of me there was a purple spotlight, shining down on a spot far away. I think I tried to run to it. It was like running through syrup on a treadmill, not making any progress despite running myself dry. A shot awake suddenly. I expected to wake up in my room back home, the weight of blankets on my back and the smell of cigarettes and beer from downstairs. But I didn't. I woke up right where I'd fallen down, in the frozen food aisle of Solo Mart. It couldn't have been long since I fell, right? But when I looked around for Jane, she was missing from her samples table. I decided to go looking for her and Keith, my vision still swimming as I stood. I rubbed my eyes and, in the freezers where there would normally be all manner of brands and boxes, all that was there were boxes and tubs labeled with the same branding as I'd seen on the Xy Whip. Xy Cheesy Bread, Xy Fries, Xy Rolls, Xy Chow, all Xy brand, with that dark purple background and loopy white text. I turned to the shelves behind me. Xy chips, Xy munch cereal. You get the picture. It wasn't like that before. Everything was normal before. I held my head, starting to walk down the aisle. There was a squish under my shoe. I looked down, grimacing at the puddle of purple slime the Xy whip had melted into. I didn't pay it any mind, trying to wipe it off on the floor to no avail. I shrugged it off and kept walking. And kept walking. And kept walking. Had this aisle always been this long? It stretched out in front of me like it was a mile long, making my head throb. I turned around and started walking towards the free samples table, rounding the corner from the frozen section towards the bakery. The music was similar to how it had been before, but more high-pitched, faster, like someone was skipping through it. Hello? I called out, walking past a display of purple loaves of Xy bread. Jane? Keith? Is anyone there? There was no answer. Not a peep aside from my footsteps and the music overhead. I could feel anxiety rising in my chest. Fuck this place. I could. I could just go back to my car and hitch a ride off someone. Maybe go back home and just wait for my dad's drunken anger turned down the nearest aisle and stopped dead in my tracks. Down the aisle there was... someone. Something. I... I don't know what I'd call it. It was in the shape of a person, I think. Like a shadow, or the absence of light altogether. In the shape of a person carrying a basket. It was looking at products like it was just a normal customer. I felt sick. All my hair standing up on end, and my heart beginning to pound. I rushed away from that aisle, looking for a way past it, only to find the aisles filled with more and more of the things, all shopping like normal. I don't know why I was so afraid. I just ran, looking for somewhere away from the things, but they were everywhere. When I turned around to find somewhere away from them, they were in the places I had been before. I had to find Jane. I had to find Keith. At least they were normal. At least I knew what the hell they were. I felt like the store was stretching in front of me. Like I wasn't making any progress at all. Frustration and fear and despair all mingled in my stomach. A lump forming in my throat as my hands began to shake. And then in front of me, 
The staff room door opened. Those familiar but odd faces in front of me brought me the most relief I'd felt the entire time I'd been in this strange place. Jane? Keith? I called out, finally able to run towards them. I didn't even notice the strange expressions on their face until I was just a few steps away. What's going on? What? I tried to stammer out a question, feeling breathless. Keith reached out and gently patted my arm. It's okay, Andrew. We'll keep you safe. He said, that same glazed smile on his face, as if nothing was wrong. Jane grabbed my arm, gently pulling me towards the entrance of the staff room. You can hide in here until they go away. She soothed. With that same tone, her voice was so familiar it made my head hurt. I wanted to follow them. They were the only thing I could understand in this place, but my fear began to return. I looked past them into the staff room, but it wasn't there. A purplish starry void was all that was there. A familiar void, but a void all the same. I felt like throwing up, balling my quivering hands into fists to hide my fear. I don't. I can't. I took a step back, but Jane squeezed my wrist hard, still staring at me with that smile, only growing more manic. It's safe here, Andrew, she said. You'll only get hurt if you stay out there, Andrew. Keith said through gritted teeth, barely masking his frustration. I stepped back again, trying to wiggle my arm free. Let go of me, I whispered, my voice strangled by the tightness of my throat. Keith grabbed onto my other arm, trying to help Jane drag me towards the staff room. I leaned back, going dead weight and finally managing to yell, let me go. It startled them just long enough for me to get my arms free and stumble back, but I didn't make it far before Keith jumped at me. We both fell to the ground and I screamed, but I couldn't get much else out, because as soon as he righted himself, he wrapped his hands around my neck and began to choke me. His eyes were manic and feral, teeth gritted, drool dribbled out of his mouth and hit my cheek. I struggled under him, grabbing his arm but then Jane was there grabbing my wrist and pulling my hand away. She wrestled my arms down onto the ground and put her knees on them, holding me down. Then she gently held my face in her hands, tipping my face up to look at hers. Her eyes had gone purple like the void, full of white stars. Just relax, Andrew. It's better this way. She said in my mother's voice. I sobbed squirming under her and trying to pull away from them. She wasn't her. She wasn't. She wore my mom's face like a Halloween mask stretched to fit over an unfit base. It's better this way. It's easier this way. She promised. My breathing was getting short, my mouth gaping open like a fish out of water and desperately trying to drag in air that wouldn't come. Purple, starry ooze began to drip from the monster's eyes hitting my face and sliding down, mingling with my own tears. It hurt. It all hurt. I couldn't breathe. That sludge burned my skin. That thing's hands dug in harder. My eyes rolled up in my head. I was in that dark void again, purple light far ahead, out of reach no matter how hard I ran. I looked behind me, where the dark only got darker. More unsure. It would be easy to keep running. I'd get there eventually. It would be better, eventually. If I could just wait, I could fix it. If I just stuck around, I had to fix it. I looked back at the purple light and turned towards the uncertain void. I began to run, finally making headway through the slow, honey-thick air. Dark hands reached out to me. My eyes shot open with the air I still had left. I rolled my head back, closed my eyes, and screamed for help. There was a moment of nothingness. I thought I'd died, but then I heard shouting. I opened my eyes, looking around me, and those things, those shadows, they grabbed Keith and Jane off me. When I sat up to look, they were deflated, like they'd been suits that no one was wearing anymore, flattened 
and empty. I stared at them for a long moment. One of the shadows reached out to me. I flinched back, looking up at its featureless form. I reached back hesitantly and took its hand. It helped me to my feet, dusting me off and speaking backwards. A question. I nodded. They let me lean heavily against them. I didn't trust my legs to carry me. I was so tired. The other shadows parted for us to walk past, looking at us with reserved curiosity. I glanced back behind myself and they began to fade out of sight, until the one holding me was the only one left. They slowly shifted, letting me stand on my own. They gave me a thumbs up and faded away. I let my eyes close. I was standing in the middle of the highway when I opened my eyes. My phone vibrated in my hands. I lifted it to look. My father's number was displayed on the screen. I hit the cancel call button. I looked behind me and my car was right where I'd left it. I walked towards it shakily and got inside to shield myself from the cool night air. Melted Xy Whip smeared on the floor of my car under my shoes as I shut the door behind me. I scrolled through my phone to my friend's number and called them. I'd need a ride out of there. I wouldn't be coming back. I always wondered why ghost hunters never went to Chernobyl. I've seen movies where they have monsters or mutated animals there, but I have never seen anything on ghosts. You'd think with the nuclear meltdown and the amount of deaths that happened there, they would have some activity going on. It piqued my interest so much that I planned a trip over there. I've been on small ghost hunts all, all over the country before, so I was no stranger to this stuff. I've been to the supposed most haunted places, but never really found anything interesting. Yeah, I have seen some weird stuff on my journeys, but never anything like what I came across in Chernobyl. The ghosts are completely different there. I'm not sure if it's the radiation before their death or after their death that completely mutated them. For the trip, I had to make sure I went alone. That was my thing. I noticed you get more paranormal activity when you go alone. Maybe they feel more powerful over one person than over a group of people. But by choosing to go alone, it made the trip extremely difficult and much more dangerous. After months of planning and studying the land, I was finally there. I drove as far as I could and walked a few hours to get there. I arrived early on in the day, hoping to hit all the landmarks. The Ferris wheel, the Azure swimming pool, and the iconic rows of abandoned apartment buildings reclaimed by nature. When I finally arrived there, I immediately started setting up my gear. I set up my camera and started live streaming the event online. I had a few diehard fans that watched me live. I mostly did the live stream as a type of insurance. If anything bad happened, I was hoping someone watching would call for help or alert the police. The first few hours were uneventful. I didn't hear or see anything. My supposed voice box was not picking up anything. I was honestly about to start packing up my gear when I noticed a comment on my live stream. Who is that following you? Is that a cameraman? Following me? Nobody's following me. I assured them. I came here alone. It's just me. I panned around and retraced my steps, but nothing was there. I thought for sure someone was trolling me, but more comments kept popping up from different people. Who is that behind you? They asked. This made chills run down my spine, but I had to keep my composure. This could be a local, or worse, someone looking to rob me. I did have a few thousand dollars worth of gear on me. Being all alone in an abandoned city made me a very vulnerable target. If anything went wrong, I was fucked. But I had to find out who was following me. Okay, let's see how close we can get to it. I remembered entering a room with a mirror immediately adjacent to the door. Maybe I could catch a glimpse of whoever was following me using that. I circled around and made my way towards that door. 
When I had left the door was open, upon my return it was closed and locked shut. Fuck. This is going to take some time, I told my viewers. I left my camera facing the door and tried to force it open, but it felt like this door was nailed shut when I had just been through here. I decided to give it all my strength and three pushes then give up. I should probably be heading back soon anyway. One, two, three. And bang, it flew open. I landed a few feet in front of the mirror, laughing, brushing the dust off myself when I realized why I'm here in the first place. The follower. I looked up into the mirror and seen a pitch black mass floating behind me. I should have ran, but I was completely frozen in fear. This didn't seem like a ghost, but like a black hole had appeared behind me. Suddenly the mass reached out towards me. Before I could flinch or even close my eyes in fear, everything went black. I don't know how long I was passed out for, but when I woke up, I was in a completely different place. Everything felt different. The air was warm with a slight noticeable draft blowing in one direction. I stood up and noticed the room was now covered in an inch of dust. The room also looked different like someone had moved everything around, searching for something. I went to grab my camera and noticed it was gone. I reached for my backpack and that too was gone. Great. Someone fucking robbed me. I let out in anger. I was trying to piece back what happened, but I could only recall a black mass, not a person. Sadly, my head was throbbing with a headache. I could not recall anything clearly at the moment. I started to make my way out of the building when in horror, I noticed the sky was now dark red and orange. The first thing that came to mind was the reactor somehow exploded again. I could faintly hear a siren going off in the distance, but it sounded odd. It was broken and not repeating properly like it had been running for years. I started making my way towards the exit and my rental car, which I could not be any further from. I had to make my way through the whole town and pass who knows what with all this hell going on. If this was another nuclear meltdown, I was fucked. I was right in the exclusion zone with no protective gear. Nothing to defend myself with, and I had still had a long way to go. As I got closer to the town center, I started hearing the strangest animal noises I have ever heard. I thought for sure the radiation was slowly torturing whatever animals were left to death. I kept walking and I noticed the whole town looked different now. I don't know what happened when I was passed out, but everything was different. It was like people were still here ravaging through everything. It was so different, I decided I should just retrace my steps so I wouldn't get lost in all this new junk. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following me. Maybe that same follower from before. I entered into a hospital I had walked through earlier. In here, those ungodly noises were not as loud and terrifying. I swear something or someone is out there in agony right now. I did not want to find out what it was. At this point, I was feeling woozy. My head was throbbing and I decided I needed a break. I entered into a room with windows so I could keep an eye on whatever the hell was going on out there. I was sitting staring out the window when I noticed even the trees looked different the closer I got towards the reactors. They were now bare and deformed. They looked like large bat wings curled in, but all the trees and branches were being blown away from the reactor towers. Almost like a continuous wind was pushing them away. I wonder how long I was out for. Could I have been passed out a whole day and all this happened? I tried to ease my mind. This felt like a living hell. Could I be done? As all these horrible thoughts were racing through my mind, a mother holding a small child on her shoulder staggered past the window. Hello? I shouted, but to no response. She just kept on limping by in what looked like a great amount of pain. I ran outside in a desperate attempt to get her attention. Please stop. I can help. I kept running towards her, yelling and waving my arms. When I finally got closer, she slowly stopped but stared straight forward. This stopped me dead in my tracks. 
As I was closer, I could make out the details on her. She was horribly burnt. Her ears were nothing but holes, and her face was a blank canvas of melted skin. The continuous wind blew the blanket covering her baby to reveal a large mass of flesh and small body parts half mutated into her body. Her child was dead. As I was now close enough for her to hear me, I could now hear her. A whimpering cry was coming from inside her skin-covered mouth. I was petrified in fear. A mutated monster stood in front of me and I did not know what to do. In what felt like an eternity, she slowly turned her head towards me. She started motioning her head upwards in a sniffing action like she could smell me. That was enough for me to turn back towards the hospital and run as fast as I could without looking back. I could hear the muffled crying getting louder and louder as she chased me. It was almost like she wanted my help. I dashed inside and slammed the door behind me as hard as I could. Standing, staring at her, I felt a small wind. That's when I heard it. Screams of agony started howling from everywhere. The mother immediately ran towards the woods in fear. I was anxiously waiting to see what made that creature run off when suddenly from behind, the building's horrific flesh-looking creature started running and limping in my direction. I knew I couldn't hide from these things if they could smell me, so I ran towards the roof. I closed as many doors as I could behind me and quietly sat in an air vent as these creatures searched through the building. I tried to breathe as little as possible, but that was hard when you are terrified beyond belief. The building was so decrepit and old, I could peek through where I was hiding. I wanted to see what I was running and hiding from. The smaller ones had already left the building. Only the bigger ones were still there. As I was peeking through, a huge puffy man in a hazmat suit stumbled by. He was bloated. He looked like he could pop any second. His suit was sewn shut like human flesh. Like it was a part of his body. He was terribly burnt or mutated. I couldn't tell. Their flesh looked like melted candle wax. They all finally left and I was alone with my fear. I felt like prey here. I needed to escape whatever this was. I needed to get closer to my rental car and to a hospital. Now that it was quite enough, I left that building and slowly made my way towards the exit trail. As I was walking, I noticed it felt like time wasn't moving here. It had been the same time of day as when I woke up. I surely had been a few hours, but the sky was still the same red and orange. This gave me an uneasy feeling. While I was walking, I noticed a normal looking house far off in the distance. It wasn't old and abandoned looking. It had a lit torch on the front porch like someone was currently living there. Finally, some good news. I thought. But this was towards the reactors. A place I did not want to go. I decided that house was my best bet, so I carefully made my way towards it, not wanting to alarm any more creatures on the way. As I was walking, I could still hear the odd screams and howls off in the distance. I could hear the pain these creatures were in. As I walked towards the house, I looked up at the tall reactor towers. They looked enormous. I lifted my hand to shade my eyes from the glow that seemed to emanate off them. That's when I realized I could see the bones through my skin. This caused me to quicken my pace. I started a jog since I was finally getting closer to the house. As I arrived, I could see a fire lit inside the house. Someone was definitely living there. Hello? Anybody home? I need help. Please. I let out desperately. At that moment, a deformed dog came running out from beneath the deck. I ran back and stumbled as the dog was halted by a chain, barely getting me. The dog, missing all its fur and constantly scratching itself, stared me down a few inches from my face, growling and snarling at me. Suddenly, behind him, the door flew open. Who's there? Why are you here? Said a man as he walked forward. He was old and looked like a priest. He was wearing a torn robe and some kind of necklace around his neck. Who's there? He repeated, but louder this time. 
I... me. I'm here. I responded confused. Can you not see me? I asked. No, I cannot see. Come in, quickly now. He said while motioning his arms towards the house. His dog seemed to calm. I walked past the beast and inside his house as he shut the door behind me. His place looked old. Everything in here looked like it was from a century ago. Who are you? Why are you still here? I asked. Why are you here? You should not be here. He responded. I'm lost, I think. I don't know how I ended up here exactly. I was exploring the city when somehow I ended up in this place. You don't just end up here. What were you doing exactly? He sternly asked. Well, I was looking for someone. Someone was following me and I tried to see who it was. Then they touched me and I ended up here. Hmm. I see. So you were why all those things were riled up then, huh? I heard a group of those things dragging something up to the church. I'm guessing it was you. Me? What do you mean? I'm right here. You are here, yes, but they took your body up to the church, he said as he walked towards a window, pointing outwards. They sacrifice something every chance they get, the dirty bastards. He let out in anger. I'm sick of those things. I wish they could go away so I could rest in peace. What are you? Are you one of them? I slowly asked. No. I used to be a priest. I stayed back as long as I could to help the people pass on in peace. Long after the army left everyone behind. But I guess I stayed too long because somehow I ended up stuck here. I can't leave or move on, so I learned to live with those monsters. I stay near the towers because it's the one place they seem to hate. Is there any way I can leave this place? I asked. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe if you get your body before they tear it apart, we can. But I have never tried such a thing. Most who come here never make it out. People have been here before. A few, yeah. Lost souls like you. A few government scientists came here once but never returned. I think the monsters scared them away. Those creatures. The monsters. What are they exactly? Were they always here? No, they were people like you. They were left behind or chose to stay behind. Some tried to help. Some wanted to take advantage of the situation with Green. In the end, the radiation was too much for us all. The government hid from us how bad the situation really was. Am I dead? I asked suddenly. No, not yet. I am, but right now you are in between. You must hurry. I don't know how much time you have. We collect your body and try to put you back. He grabbed a walking stick, put a few vials of some liquid into his pocket, and we were off to the church. As we were leaving, he untied his dog and I asked him what that thing was. Man's best friend, he responded. I used to leave him beds outside my house. He seemed scared of those things out there. Eventually, we gained each other's trust and have been following each other ever since. Not all the things here are like him, though. Almost all those things out there will try to rip you to shreds given the chance. They take the limbs off anything and leave them at the altar. Like a gift. A gift for who? I asked. There's one out here who stays hidden, but all those creatures fear him. So they leave him gifts, hoping he won't go after them. What is he? I don't know, but he was close to the reactors when everything went down. I think he is the most mutated of us all. As we were walking along a path, I noticed a body mutated into the ground. Its limbs were cut off and it was slowly flailing its arms about. Like he was trying to get unstuck. But he was cemented into the ground. The old man walked past it without a notice. 
I wanted to try to help, but I'm sure it would have attacked me the second it was loose. As we got closer to the church, I noticed bones were scattered everywhere. Be careful, he warned. How can you see the way? I asked. I have been here a very long time, so long that I barely remember my life before the disaster. My memories slip away more and more every day, and I fear that soon I will become one of those creatures. I felt petty for this man. I wish I could help him. We walked towards the back entrance of the church. The windows were all broken and the front doors were barricaded shut. We slowly entered. As we rounded the corner, I could see my lifeless body laying on the ground. It felt odd looking at my own body. I ran towards myself. I was cold to the touch. I'm dead. I let out in worry. No, you are not, and be quiet. We're in its den, said the old man. Now lay down inside your body, he instructed. I followed along and laid beside myself. No, lay in your body. He angrily responded as he was gathering candles and some cloths. I moved a bit over and somehow I was able to lay in myself. It was an odd sensation. I was cold and I could feel a wetness all around me. Now what do I do? Nothing. You wait. He placed lit candles around me, started soaking some pieces of clothes with a liquid and placed it on my body. Stay quiet. And whatever you do, don't move. He took a few steps back and began to speak in a language I did not recognize. As he was doing this, I noticed the statue behind him began to move. It was the one he was speaking about. The one who they feed. I yelled to warn him when the beast attacked from behind, launching both of them to the ground. His dog immediately jumped to his aid when the creature threw him into the wall, leaving him lying motionless. He was terrifying looking. He had long skinny arms with legs that were backwards at the knee. Blood was leaking from its fanged mouth while its bloody fingertips wrapped around the arms of the priest. Don't move, he shouted. I was frozen in fear being near this creature, but I wished to help. While the priest was holding back the fangs from digging into him, he pulled out a vial and threw it into the monster's huge mouth. It released its grip from him and staggered backwards coughing a green glowing substance that released smoke from anything it touched. I thought for sure it was radioactive. The monster retreated outwards while the priest stood up examining his wounds. A son of a bitch dug deep into me. He said, Are you okay? I asked. I should be able to finish this, but just in case they come back, I'm going to make sure I get the last hit. He stood up and walked over to his dog. Don't worry, buddy. I'll be seeing you on the other side, he said while petting his hat. He then walked around the church, pouring something onto the ground, saving the most for the entrance we used. What's that? I asked. You'll see, he responded. He then walked back over to me and started chanting again. Are you going to be okay? I asked. He ignored me and kept speaking in that unknown language. Not a minute into his ritual, a screaming roar came from outside the building. He started chanting louder while pushing something out of his pocket. I could see through the holes and broken windows that a mob of creatures were coming directly our way. There's a lot of them. I shouted. He then lit a match and threw it into the substance on the ground. A purple flame erupted and lit our entire surroundings on fire. Arms and heads then started reaching into the building trying to grab at us. I felt helpless. I could feel the certain death on the other side of the walls. He took a step closer towards me as the fire grew and climbed up the walls. A strange glow began to form around myself. I pulled my hand up to look closely at my fingertips, illuminating when I realized my physical body moved with me now. It's working. I shouted. At that moment... More and more creatures began ripping open the building. The glow around my body grew brighter and brighter when the roof started falling down, nearly hitting us. He then knelt down while continuing his chant. 
I started feeling sick. My body suddenly felt extremely cold. As the light around me grew too bright to look at the monsters, broke through the walls, storming inside at a great pace. The priest ignored all of this and kept on his chant. The roof then collapsed. As it was falling closer and closer, and the creatures were within arm's length of both of us, I blacked out. I was surrounded by darkness. I awoke in a dark room. The sun was down and I was freezing. I sat up and realized I was back in that room with the mirror. My camera sitting on the ledge and my backpack laying next to me. Was that a dream? I asked. I stood up and looked at the time. It was 3.15 a.m. in the morning. What just happened? I asked myself. I gathered my stuff and walked outside. It was dead quiet. No sound except the wind rustling and leaves on the trees. I started my way back and everything looked normal. I was back in the world of the living. I noticed a collapsed church on my walk back and stopped by to look at it. It looked burnt. Graffiti covered one remaining wall. I stood there wondering if I had imagined everything that had happened. And as I was looking through the debris, I noticed old priest robes. Completely shredded to pieces. I turned around and walked as fast as I could towards my rental car. Not wanting to think of everything that had just happened. The car started fine. I made it home with a few bruises, but nothing bad. I looked over my footage the following week, and to my disappointment, it did not capture anything. Just me collapsing to the floor with nothing standing behind me. Did that really happen? Or did I just hit my head hard enough to think that happened? I have no idea. I still have nightmares of those creatures. And that place. I'm posting this using a VPN and whatever additional security precautions I can take to avoid being found. I'm posting this here so authorities have the grounds to doubt my story's authenticity. So my story isn't immediately litigious. But for the people, please listen to me. I wouldn't wish what happened to me on my worst enemy. I will never be able to see the world the same way, and I will probably never get an explanation for what happened. If I do, it will more than likely result in my death. Like, in a comfortable ignorance. I am not telling you this to poison you. I am telling you this so you can avoid confirming it for yourself. Treat this story like Schrodinger's cat. As long as you avoid any possible experience in which you may have to confront the reality I have, your comfortable existence will never be threatened. I rely pretty heavily on the MTA. The subway station in New York City for those who are unfamiliar. I use it every day to get to work, to get home to meet Tinder dates at restaurants, to go to friends' apartments. Before the pandemic, MTA cars in Manhattan were usually at least half full, sometimes even so full during the day, you were standing with your back and front pressed up against someone else's elbow or backpack. Once the pandemic hit, the number of subway cars dwindled, but the cars were still always sparsely packed. A heavy air of gloom hanging in the six-foot spaces between masked riders. As vaccination rates have been going up, and infection rates have been going down, the subway cars are getting fuller again. In my six years living in Manhattan, I'm not sure if I've ever been alone on a subway car. It drives me crazy to look back on now. I'm sure it must have happened at some point, but almost all of my memories in the subway are marked by the presence of other people. The bizarre interactions with strangers. The avoidance of the belligerently drunk. The search to find a seat in a packed car. It's hard to believe this has never happened. But I have no way of proving that it has. A week ago on Saturday, I was coming back from a friend's place. I was a bit tipsy, I'll confess, but nowhere near drunk enough to misremember any of what happened. It was around 3 a.m., Late, but not late enough for the entirety of Manhattan to be in bed. 
I had taken drunken train rides home from bars and parties plenty of times around the same hour and was usually surrounded by people doing the same thing. I was waiting for the Q train. I was at 49th and needed to go to 8th. It was only 6 stops. There was a good handful of people on the platform. A disheveled man sitting on a bench surrounded by stained bags. A clearly intoxicated couple lovingly swaying together. Some other folks I don't remember. I walked down to a part of the platform where there was no one else waiting. Just as COVID protocol. I was still near people, but they were far enough that I'd probably be taking their own cars. I was tired, heavy lidded, and I leaned against a pole while I weighed in. The subway came in about five minutes and I waited for a second as the door slid open in case anyone needed to get out. Upon walking in, I noticed the car was completely empty. Like I said, I can't confirm I've never been on an empty subway car. I can't even confirm the emptiness was the cause of what happened. My very human brain is just begging for some rational explanation, some conclusion to draw. It's the best I can do. I was surprised by how eerie the empty car felt. The fluorescent lights reflected off the plastic seats, highlighting miscellaneous stains and patches. The automated voice announcing the closing of the doors ricocheted off the walls with no low chattering to muffle it. I sat in the middle of the car, leaned my head back, and closed my eyes. Only for a second. I'd done it before. I had the incredibly useful and maybe explicitly New Yorker talent of being able to exist in the liminal space of sleep and still listen for my stop. Or I thought I did. When I heard 8th Street, I thought it seemed strange. I didn't feel like I'd fully drifted into sleep, but I also didn't feel like the train had already made it through five stops. I didn't hear any of them announced, and I could have sworn I hadn't had my eyes closed for more than a minute. But I chalked it up to being drunker than I'd thought. I opened my eyes, expecting at least a couple more people in the car. Having accumulated throughout the stops, but it was still empty. At this point, I couldn't think much of it. It was creepy, but so was 3am in general. My mom used to tell me nothing good happens between 3 and 4am. The well-documented witching hour. I just wanted to get back to my apartment. I got off the car, expecting to see a few people get off the other cars and a few people waiting on the platform. Nothing. It was completely empty. Okay. I thought, maybe the city does sleep. But then as I started towards the exit, I looked into the other cars out of habit. Completely empty. The cars I'd seen people getting into, I guess they got off, I reasoned. 8th Street was usually a pretty busy stop. It was near NYU and Lower East Side, attracting a much younger and more energetic crowd. And there were almost always people buzzing around at any hour. But again... I chalked it up to coincidence and walked out to the exit, through the turnstile and up the stairs. I spilled out to the street looking down at my phone and it wasn't until I looked up that my heart stopped all at once. And then crawled up into my throat and started throbbing so fast I was sure I would die right then and there. I struggled with pretty bad anxiety for a good portion of my life and that usually came along with episodes of intense dissociation. I read once, uh, Good grounding technique was to confirm to yourself that you're not in a dream. To do this, you could pinch the skin between your thumb and forefinger. If your fingers went right through the skin, it meant you were dreaming, and if the skin was real and tangible, you were awake. I quickly reached to pinch my skin, shaking with fear, knowing in my heart my hand would feel as solid as it always did. And of course it did. The city was recognizable in that nauseating way the weirdly familiar photos of empty grocery stores and movie theater th lobbies are. The sidewalks were still organized in grids, and the encroaching plethora of skyscrapers and vague storefronts still marked the skyline, but everything was built in ways I couldn't quite comprehend. The skyscrapers twisted and curved like knotty trees, in ways that seemed architecturally impossible. And they were dilapidated, empty stores with broken windows sitting directly next to glowing, monolithic buildings that looked newly built. 
The sky was cloaked in a brothy, muddy gray smog that was no doubt impenetrable by sunlight. It was so low it obscured the top halves of skyscrapers. I could see columns of thick white smoke funneling into the air in multiple places, coming from nondescript buildings. It was impossibly warm, the kind of smoggy warmth that sticks to your skin and bloats your lungs. I couldn't differentiate from night or day. The only light was that of the functioning storefronts, light that almost made me feel epileptic. Some storefronts played quick, looping video clips. Some had flashing neon lights that were so bright they didn't feel appropriate for human eyes. Some were entirely shrouded in what looked like floor-length computer screens that featured hyper-realistic graphics of scantily clad women beckoning in passerby, or a spinning wheel of the products the stores presumably sold. And there were passersby. That was the worst part. The city was still alive. The streets were thickly lined with tents, cardboard boxes, propped up sheets, overstuffed shopping carts, and cramped sprawls of sleeping or stupefied humans. It was so condensed some of them were sleeping on the limbs of others. They were all deathly pale with bloodshot eyes, and many of them seemed to be covered in what can only be described as full body cystic acne. It was only then I realized the constant gravelly sound I'd been barely processing the whole time. The sound of asphalt being crunched by tires was their coughs. They were coughing constantly, in between sentences, in their sleep. I noticed a few of them looking at me with dopey eyes like they could barely understand the visual information their eyes were feeding them. Like visual overstimulization had regulated them to a state of near blindness. However, right next to these people walked seemingly upright and healthy people, many wearing suits and carrying briefcases. Their clothes didn't seem to move right, like they were made out of some stiff, impervious material that fought the movement of their bodies. It took me a couple seconds to realize they were all wearing masks and glasses. The masks weren't the N95's coronavirus had made widespread. They looked more like the plastic sheaths that feed into an oxygen tank, completely covering their faces from just below their eyes to under their chin. They all had tiny blinking lights on the sides. Most were green, a few were red, but besides the masks, they were also all wearing glasses. Just like in the New York City I was used to, the glasses came in all shapes and sizes. Some wore tiny horn rim glasses. Others wore circular, tortoiseshell ones, but all of the lenses were tinted a cloudy gray, and all of the hinges featured the same pinprick lights on the masks. I noticed many of them looking at me as they walked by, but I was so overwhelmed by what I was seeing I wasn't yet able to feel threatened. The atmosphere was starting to affect me. My skin was prickling with sweat, but singing in a strange way I wasn't accustomed to. My lungs were foggy and felt filled with fluid. My eyes were darting around, trying to avoid the blinding blue light of the storefronts. It was only then that my brain moved on from visual sensory overload to an olfactory one. The air smelled. I could swear it was three or four smells wrapped into one invisible braid, rotating in the air and releasing each scent individually for a minute or two before releasing the next. First, there was the mechanical smell of gasoline and a nearby fire. Then there was the acrid tang of hot garbage. And then there was the worst one. Rotting meat. Maybe what I would imagine is the smell of sizzling flesh. The three smells shifted back and forth, churning my stomach. As the heat swallowed me and the smell singed my nasal passages... I turned back around to vomit when I was faced with what I still assumed would be the entry of the subway stop I'd come from, but the sign was no longer there. There was still the descending staircase, just as decrepit as before, but now there was a steel door frame positioned directly in front of the staircase with a battered sign hanging off the top. The sign read, 21. There was a red light blinking underneath the numbers. Now I really started to panic, and lost in a haze of complete bewilderment, I just stood shock still watching the flurry of well-dressed people, 
many of whom looked at me with raised eyebrows. I saw a few of them pull out phones, which were still surprisingly recognizable, although many of them were so thin they were almost pliable like fabric and appeared to melt into the hands of the user. And their screens glowed so bright the light coming off of them almost looked like a white pillar. I then noticed that, although everyone was wearing similar glasses and masks and stiff looking clothing, some people walked individually, while others seemed to be attached to people. It was mostly women attached to men. The man would walk in front and the woman would follow closely behind, attached at the waist by this diaphanous, almost invisible band that would retract and tighten with ease. I tried to see how many people were attached to others, but the band was so thin and they walked so fast that I quickly gave up. It all felt like a car crash I couldn't look away from. I just stood there, dumbfounded for an amount of time I am unable to quantify. It could have been a minute. It could have been ten hours. The light didn't change. The air didn't change. And the never-ending stream of almost identical people. That didn't stop. Neither did the perpetual throaty coughs of the people on the stream. Finally... Unsure of any other option, I turned back around to the staircase. It felt unnatural, and I almost expected to be immediately punished for doing so, but upon walking down, I saw the same turnstiles that were usually at the station entrance. Although now they seemed to be turned into some kind of exhibit, there was a plaque on one of them with a date and a small description of what a turnstile was. Next to the turnstiles... What was usually an emergency exit door with a push bar was now a giant plexiglass door that reached from ceiling to floor. Plain black lettering at the top read 21, and underneath it, small lettering that read $45,000. There was a blinding white screen next to it that looked reminiscent of a credit card reader or some kind of payment mechanism. I fumbled at it for a second before realizing it was a futile effort. I could barely see the screen. Nor did I have whatever payment method it clearly needed. In accordance with many of the New York nights I had before everything changed, I didn't have train fare and would have to jump the turnstile. Arms trembling so weak they could barely push me up. I popped myself up on the metal sides of the turnstile and prepared to push myself over. Where I would usually sail over the turnstiles and land on the other side... I hit some sort of invisible wall with an audible thud. Whatever I hit was freezing cold and launched me to the opposite side of the entrance. The wind was knocked out of me and my body landed hard on the gritty floor. As I struggled to catch my breath, I heard footsteps approaching. I was weak and sore and exhausted, and I couldn't look up to see who it was. I couldn't even be scared. I wasn't even sure I wanted to go back to whatever normal was after knowing this existed and was somehow plausible at some point in mankind's progression. I just laid back and stared at the blinking fluorescent light on the ceiling, which was eventually obscured by the head of what appeared to be a businessman leering over me. The mask and glasses erased any semblance of humanity. He approached me just as cold and clinically as his appearance suggested. It was terrifying to be acknowledged by him, recognizing I was truly here, in this moment, perceptible. But now, here, with this man addressing me directly, I could no longer pretend I was some invisible soul trapped in a temporary nightmare. You're not supposed to be here. I'm sure you know that. I nodded weakly. He turned away and I could hear his footsteps retreat, brief shuffling and then return. He looked down at me holding up a comically oversized syringe. This hurts less than you'd think. It'll only last a second and then you're done. It's worse than ending up as an attachment. He paused for a second. Probably. Before I could ask what an attachment was, I felt a jolt of searing pain in my thigh so intense it made my muscles seize and spasm. Then, within a second, I woke up in a sticky pool of, ostensibly, my own blood. Are you okay? I craned my neck upward to see a wobbling, elderly woman positioned above me, eyebrows knitted with concern. Above her was a clear blue sky, 
and the very visible tops of tall, dimly lit buildings. The streets bustled with cars, but the sound of gravel crunching was only that of the tires. The air was cool and dry and breathable. I looked down and could see the pool of blood, blossoming outwards towards my hands in crimson rivulets on the sidewalk. I looked back up and the woman was still standing over me. That's a pretty big fall. She motioned at the building directly in front of me. I can't imagine you're coming from that. My legs were broken. I knew that immediately. Maybe paralyzed. I was supposed to be dead. I knew that too. I would have to go through the rest of my life knowing I am supposed to be dead. Could you call an ambulance? Was all I could muster. It's a week later and although I am partially ambulatory with a wheelchair... My brain is permanently immobilized by the thought that I will come into contact with what I saw again at some point in the future, and even possibly have to live in it permanently. I'm not sure how long I'll be able to exist here, in the now. A few times I've left my apartment, I've caught glimpses of the well-dressed businessmen in their masks and glasses, following from a safe distance but quickly turning corners as soon as I look in their direction. I feel the suspicion from my friends. No one quite knows what happened, and my story has changed a few times due to the brain fog and general terror that have yet to lift. But I am terrified to tell them. I am terrified to tell anyone what happened. Knowing it's possibly the businessmen may just be waiting for me to tell. Knowing my entire future could be predicated on whether or not I cave to the unbearable weight of this one huge secret. Whether or not I actually want to live is something I'll have to come to terms with over the next few weeks. Found the suicide note they left in my apartment. In my handwriting. Addressing certain close friends and close family members of mine by name. In my voice too. Written the way I write. In a way that could only be emulated by someone incredibly intimate with me. Maybe only myself. If you were ever about to step in an empty subway car, turn around and never look back. Again, I can't promise the emptiness was the reason this happened, but it feels good to pretend I have some plausible handle on what happened. It feels good to pretend that there is a viable way for other, unpoisoned people to avoid the possibility of seeing what I saw. I can't promise you'll never go there, and I surely can't promise you'll make it back if you do, but I can promise you that there is something terrible out there waiting for us encroaching on us slowly we don't even notice it i can promise you hell is real and it is made by man if you have the ability just walk home I was a fool to think that this job was just a job. Everything from the advertisement to going and actually applying was way too trivial and inviting. I'm trying to tell myself that I'm going to be okay, but I just don't know. I have some time before it happens, so I'll try to explain how fucked I am. In light of the pandemic that's been around for more than a year at this point, I was extremely tight on money. Having moved out of my parents' house right before Corona started shutting down businesses and any possible sources of income for me was bad enough, but being a college student on top of that was absolutely not helping my case. For the longest time, after leaving California, I lived in one of those $15 a night, ran down motels while attending ASU, and living was undeniably a struggle. Cheap housing was fine. I could tolerate the dank and stained mattresses provided in the rooms. Granted, I had been smart enough to take some washable sheets and comforters, as well as Febreze from home. I probably washed those daily because of how hot it'd get in those old, barely ventilated rooms. The real problem came from the crime. In the city of Temp, Arizona, there were almost 1,000 cases of burglary in the year 2019 alone. Now, granted at the time, the stat didn't scare me because I thought I'd be living in the dorms on campus. 
So me as a high school senior thought nothing of it, but here I am. Four nights before I ended up in my current situation, there was a case of a uh, breaking and entering reported from the floor under mine. Someone was apparently abducted and had literally everything taken. The only items that remained were their toothbrush, still neatly placed by the sink of the small bathroom attached to the main room, and the key to the room, which had the name of the person staying there scribbled onto the paper tab. Even their bed sheets were taken, strangely enough. Maybe criminals needed hostages and clean bed sheets. Needless to say, that was enough motivation for me to start making some better financial decisions. I went through four job interviews over the course of the next three days. I was turned down by all four. They said I lacked intuition. Yesterday morning, however, I came across a neatly organized advertisement online from a company by the name of M-O-R-D. The bold font stood out from my computer screen, detailing, no experience required, great pay, call for interview. From the other advertisements I was looking at, I chose to pursue this one. I felt almost as if it was calling to me, or maybe it was beckoning my bank account. I called there and then, after a few rings of the dial tone, the sound of a young woman came through. Hello there, are you calling about the job advertisements we put out recently? She asked gingerly. Oh, hey, um, yeah, actually I am. I would, I, like to schedule an interview? For later today? I stumbled with my words. At times I find it hard to talk to people, and the quarantine was not helping me by any less socially awkward. Is that all right? I asked cautiously. Oh, eager are we now. That's no problem. Can I have your name? It's for filing purposes. She responded, clicking keys on her keyboard. She responded quickly. It somehow made my brain tick, but I ignored it as best as I could. Yeah, it'll be Jason Brody. Fabulous. I could practically feel that woman smirking at me. The best of the phone call was somewhat uneventful. I was told the job was hosted in a town somewhat far away from Temp. For your own safety, I won't tell you which town. I was told I could show up to their facility around 8pm. This left me the rest of the day to contemplate my decision. I'd somehow just then realized I didn't even ask what I would be doing at the job. I didn't ask for the girl's name either. Come to think of it. I have never heard of a company by the name of M.O.R.D. owning such a big plot of land out where they were located. What did M.O.R.D. even stand for? At that point, I couldn't care any less. I had dollar signs waving in my face, so I hastily went for it. Too bad, so sad, I thought as I went to prepare for later. I gathered the best clothes I could and took the evening bus to a stop relatively close to the property. Their facility was sizable, reminiscent of an office building, situated out away from everything. It was essentially a desert out here, even though the more urban areas were probably 45 minutes away. Still, there were some buildings scattered out along the road. MORDs, however, was strangely pronounced. Compared to the other dusty buildings, this one looked weirdly clean and pristine in the evening sun. As I got to the front entrance of the building, I was greeted with the reception area. The walls were painted in a bright and reflective shade of white, with black trim which met a marvelous red carpet with black and white patterns etched into it. It reminded me of a casino show floor. In the mostly empty and spacious room were some white leather couches. Some pillars spread equally across the expanse of the room, and some house plants in the corners. A young, blonde girl worked the front desk. Mr. Brody, I presume, called the girl. Yeah, I'm here. You must be who I spoke with earlier. I responded, doing my best not to stutter. Although the girl's facial features were hidden by a blue surgical mask, she seemed pleasant. Her nameplate read, Anna. Not even a last name. Alright, if you walk down that hall over here, 
It'll be the first room to the right. She pointed her finger to a hallway to the right of me. Much thanks, I replied. By her voice, I assumed she was probably in her early 20s, probably working some lame job to gather money, similar to how I was. Inside of the room was a wooden desk and some chairs. The decorative pattern of the lobby also seemed to flow into office rooms as well. On the desk laid a piece of paper and an envelope. Cautiously, I took up the paper. It read, M-O-R-D. Insert address here. Room 2. Good evening, Jason. It is truly unfortunate that I couldn't see you in person before you start. As you should know by now, you will be working overnight in our facility as an overnight guard. As mentioned in the advertisement, the pay should be satisfactory. You will receive $1,500 per working night. If you couldn't tell by my phrasing, you have already been hired. You will start tonight. Your job is quite easy as long as you follow the company rules. The envelope next to this page should contain said rules. Failure to comply with these rules may lead to unforeseen consequences for you, so be sure to work diligently. Your uniform can be found on the chair behind you in the corner. You will find your post for tonight using the map of the building provided on the back of this page. Be at your post by 11.30 p.m. tonight. You may spend the time leading up to your shift in any way you'd like. Do not go down the stairs. Aaron I laughed at the last comment. Way to be ominous, I thought. It was about 8 p.m. then, so I decided to get some rest in before my shift. I slept in the chair, where I had originally picked up my uniform. The pay was enough to cover my tuition in a matter of weeks. No way I was turning back. My alarm rang at 11.20 p.m. I shot up, put on my uniform, and followed the detailed fire escape route map of the building to my post. Aaron had kindly used a red marker to guide me through the hallways. I arrived at my post by 11.26 p.m. Just enough time for me to take a quick glance at the rules. I figured that since I'd been hired on the spot, I was in no rush to fret over these. The paper contained a list of 14 rules. The first rules were modest. Rule 1. From a time period of 11.30pm to the end of your shift at 6am, you must walk the ground floor's perimeter twice. You may choose the intervals at which these patrols happen. Easy. Rule 2. From a time period of 2 a.m. to 3.33 a.m., you must take a patrol of the second floor. Walking the perimeter suffices as a patrol. Oddly specific. Rule 3. You will also be tasked with observing the CCTV cameras stationed around the building. If you observe anything you would consider abnormal, please use the phone in your room to contact the front desk. They will know what to do. Connection number 999. I sighed. It's whatever, I thought. Must be some new guy hazing ritual. Reminds me of when my old burger joint used to decorate for Halloween. Oddly spooky, I laughed internally. Maybe they're just reusing some old supplies from Halloween. It's March though. I shrugged it off. Taking a look at my watch, it was now 11.30. I was officially on the clock. Looking up, I observed the room I had been stationed in. In contrast with other rooms on the first floor, the red carpet that had been present throughout the greater part of the building did not go past the door frame. Rather, this room had a bleak gray carpet, a color reminiscent of wet concrete. The walls of this room were a faded white. Numerous maroon stains laid in contrast from the color of the wall. Some long stains even followed onto the ceiling. Exactly across from the metal door was an industrial metal table. On the table sat 12 monitors, stacked 4 by 3. Next to the pile, laid a beige office phone. On the corner, in the room to my right were 4 blue lockers. In the other corner of the room, there was a small yellow bin, with something black inside of it. Classy. Flipping around, I decided to go out for my first patrol right off the bat. 
I took the envelope with the rules and kept reading. Rule 4. For your own safety, before exiting your room for a patrol, look through all of the camera feeds, then refer to Rule 3. Well, shit. I found it almost comical that this company was talking about my safety. After all, aren't I supposed to be the most dangerous thing in the building? I'm pretty sure I saw a baton in the bin. I didn't grab it, though. I found it funny how I kept messing up. Legitimately comical. Rule 5. While on patrol, you might encounter rooms where the doors are open and people are seemingly moving inside, but the lights inside the room are turned off. Do not enter these rooms. Do not shine your flashlight in these rooms. They don't like light. I stopped dead in my tracks, almost falling over with how hard I planted my feet into the ground. I read the rule over two more times thinking I misinterpreted it or something. I started to feel the creeping sensation of fear enter my body. Logically, this had to be a prank. I had to. I had too many thoughts to portray onto this note, but I kept reading. Rule 6. If you are on patrol and you encounter one of these rooms, and something seems to be exiting the room, do not look at it. If you must, stare at the ground and walk backwards until you can turn around and get back to your room quickly. Refer to Rule 3 before finishing that round of patrol. Rule 7. If you are in your room and you hear scratching at your door, almost as if a pet were beckoning to be let in, do not open the door. If the scratches intensify, you must ignore them. Do not attempt to look out the small window in the door. It is best if you keep your back to the door. Rule 8. If you notice that one of the cameras in your room has gone black or has started to show static, you must take the baton that was provided to you and smash the screen of the monitor. It can get in otherwise. Try to smash only the screen. The top of the monitor frame is labeled accordingly to where the camera was displaying. You must avoid that area whenever patrolling. Rule 9. If you sense something is following you, run into your room. Chances are it can't get past the door. Rule 10. If something manages to break into your room, remain completely and utterly still wherever you are and drop whatever you are doing. Do not open your eyes. It will try to coerce you. Rule 11. At no point before 6 a.m. should you consider leaving the premises of the building. You are locked in for your safety. I sharply inhaled upon the realization that I was locked in. This was undeniably the fastest my heart has ever beat. I was practically gagging on my own tongue. I wanted to say something to calm myself down but couldn't find the words. I managed to get a hold of myself soon after. Until the ground floor's lights shut off. I was surrounded by darkness. I stumbled backwards a few steps to find the wall of the hallway. I was utterly blinded by the darkness. I fumbled with the utility belt in my uniform trying to find which small pocket housed a flashlight. I got a hold of it after a moment, switched it on, and all I could think to do was look around me. Wide-eyed, I turned several 360s before considering taking a step forward to trudge onward. The lights must be on a timer, I thought. Shining my light into my black analog watch, the time read 11.40 p.m. This is absolutely terrible. As subtle as a mouse, I creeped onward. In a foot race, an ant probably could have beat me to the end of the hallway. I hadn't realized it before, but this building was quite expansive. In each hallway, there seemed to be doorways to at least 25 rooms total, and the hallways were probably each 150 feet long. The building was laid out like a grid, with hallways connecting at certain intervals every now and then, making it easy to navigate since there were all right angles. Having not encountered anything for the first 10 minutes of creeping, I quickened my pace to a slow walk. Surprisingly, I made a complete perimeter of the ground floor in about 45 minutes, while not having seen anything. Perhaps it's because I didn't dare to make a sound or look at anything but the hallway in front of me, but I made it back to my room safe. I peered around the room, Nothing seemed to be hiding inside. 
Stepping in, I close the door behind me. My watch read 12.44 a.m. Suddenly, the office phone on the table blared its ringtone. Almost stumbling over from a heart attack, I inched closer to the phone. I put my hand on the handle and held the speaker to my ear. The voice of a man came through. Hello, how are you? Asked the man in a deep and slow voice. I, it's good. Who are you? Ignoring my question, the man continued. What do you believe in? Static from the phone erupted briefly. Wait, I... What do you mean? I was sufficiently flustered. Like, religion? I'm atheist. There was a brief pause. What is your name? Asked the man. He sounded cold and lifeless now. There was no inflection left in his voice. His breaths were shallow, like his diaphragm could no longer push enough air out of his mouth. I... Jason? The man's voice became distorted past what I could ever possibly try to describe. It was similar to someone choking, or gargling on some thick liquid. It hurt my heart to hear somehow, but it was talking to me through the distortion. I didn't know what it was saying. The phone line cut. It was eerily silent around me now, and then it dinged on me. I whipped the envelope out and scanned the rules for anything mentioning a phone. I ran. Rule 13. If the phone in your station begins to ring, you must answer it. Answer any questions it may ask. If it hangs up before you do, resume duties. If it asks for your name, do not answer. Hang up and resume duties. My heart dropped. I really had nothing running through my head right at that moment other than dread. From the silence came a knock at the room's door. I flipped around instantly to face it. Before taking a step forward, I looked at the paper with the rules again. Rule 14. If there is knocking coming from the door to your room, it is most likely the result of not following one of the previously mentioned rules. Refer to Rule 7. If the handle to the door begins to jingle, refer to Rule 10. I looked up to the door. The handle to the door had silently been turning, and I had not noticed. I gasped and dropped the envelope somewhere on the ground from surprise. I instantly shut my eyes and crouched down trying to find it. By feeling the ground, I heard the door start to creak open, its metal hinges squeaking. Planting both hands on the carpet, I prepared for what was about to unfold. What I felt at first was a strange aura. It became seemingly colder inside of the room, but my body remained warm. Strange sensations coated my arms and legs. The kind where it tingles, and you'd expect to find a spider crawling on you, but there's nothing there. My head felt unfathomably hot compared to the other parts of my body. That's when it spoke. Its voice was reminiscent to that of the thing that spoke to me on the phone. However, it was not gargling. It had the same vocal tone as the thing on the phone, but this time it spoke with inflection and an accent. It sounded human. Hey, it's okay. Open your eyes and come with me. It repeated that phrase several times. And then, almost as if it were perplexed by why I wasn't responding, it started speaking again this time in German, and then in what I assumed to be Russian, and then in an Asian language I did not recognize. And then it went silent, but the feeling in my body was still present, along with the intense cramping of my muscles. I did not dare open my eyes. I remained in my crouched position for what seemed like an eternity. When the sensations in my body subsided, I finally mustered up the courage to open my eyes. There was no monster, from anything I could see. The door remained wide open. A light that illuminated my small room of salvation spilled into the hallway outside. I shot up and closed the door as quickly and quietly as I could, somehow thinking that it might still be outside somewhere. I don't remember exactly how I felt, but deprived of oxygen from forgetting to breathe is somewhat accurate. I was sweating profusely and trying to get a hold of my breath. My watch read 1.02 a.m. Spotting the envelope on the ground, I bent over and went to review the rules. 
Glancing over the ones I've already read, I recalled the cameras. Looking to the table, I began to switch on the monitors one by one. With the small on-off button next to the label of where the camera was shooting. All camera feeds displayed seemingly still images of the long dark hallways. Except for one which displayed one room in a hallway with the lights on inside. I figured this must have been the camera footage shooting of my hallway. And that illuminated room was the one I was in. The label on the monitor read, Hallway 4. Correlating that to the map Aaron had given me. It seems I was mistaken. I was located in Hallway 3. I, seeming as none of the rules I had read so far mentioned the lights being on, I looked down to the phone to call the front desk. Before picking up the receiver, I hesitated, almost as if the monster from earlier would start asking questions again, but I dialed 9 three times, and a dial tone began to sound. And after three tones, the voice of a young man came through. Hello, front desk representative speaking. He spoke with a distinct southern accent. Hey, there's a... Well, in hallway number four, there's a room with a light on. I responded trying to keep it together. Almost snottily, the man retorted. Is that truly abnormal? There are consequences for calling this line without a reason. I did not enjoy his tone. You listen to me. I have seen my fair share of fucking abnormal tonight. Don't you try to tell me. He gave in after my one-sentence verbal assault. We'll send someone over. However, I don't think that southern ass ever sent anyone. I never saw anyone walk through that hallway for the next 20 minutes. I guess I'll figure it out myself. I thought. Before I left the room, I remembered to grab the baton that sat in the bin in the corner of the room. Opening the door, I peered out looking left and right as if I were crossing a street. And I headed over to hallway four. Nothing seemed to be out of place, though. No doors were open, and all the lights remained off. I guess I've made it this far. Might as well do my second patrol. Through the rest of my patrol, I encountered two of the rooms described by Rule 5. I heeded the warning to the rule and simply walked past the room without investigating inside. These rooms were truly strange, though. Walking past the room, it sounded similar to the inside of a populated mall or a train station, where there was a lot of bustling. I took a quick glance inside one of these rooms as I passed it in the hallway. Through the darkness, I could see movement, but I could not relate it to anything I could comprehend. It had the form of a black mass, swirling around. Moving on. I walked down a flight of stairs, figuring I'd do an extra good job and continue onward. Everything seemed darker down there, but it was reminiscent of a copy of the ground floor from what I could remember. My feet made a small squishing sound while walking. The floor seemed to be slightly flooded by a thin layer of water. I felt like I had bad night blindness down there. My flashlight seemed to be losing power as well, or something to that extent because the beam dimmed the further I walked smelled old, rotting wood, and rusty metal. It was also quite humid, like an indoor swimming pool. I felt some of the water from the ground soak my running shoes. My hands were starting to get clammy, and the air seemed to get heavier with each step, compressing my chest, making it hard to breathe. I looked at my watch. It seemed to have stopped working as well. The time remained frozen at 1.07 a.m., but I knew it was way later than that. I stopped where I was and leaned against one of the hallway's walls. Pulling out the envelope, I gazed upon the rules. Rule 12 was quite vague. Rule 12. You are always being deceived. Remember. This left me quite confused. I flipped over the rules paper. Written in a pronounced bold font, sat Rule 15. Rule 15. Do not go down the stairs. A basement floor does not exist on this building. Upon descending the stairs, your safety cannot be guaranteed. In fact, our company does not know exactly what happens upon descending the stairs. We only know the result. Thus, we do not yet understand how to effectively combat this. 
You have a limited amount of time to pray to your deity of choice because you have just entered a portal to the fourth circle of hell. Signed, M-O-R-D. I felt my legs give out a little. I, looking to the darkness ahead of me, behind me, and all around me, I yelled from fear and backtracked as fast as I could. I jumped up three stairs at a time and hauled absolute ass back to my room. I ripped the lockers in the corner of the room from the wall and barricaded the door. I already tried redialing the phone. No one picked up. I don't know what's approaching me, but I can feel it. It's different than the creature which knocked on the door. My body is in pain, aching and writhing, burning. I can sense it, and it can sense me. It's coming to take me. I can see it in my head, dark and disfigured, eyeless, pale, soulless, and satanic. I am scared. I don't know what to do. I don't understand why I'm here. I don't understand why this is happening to me. Please, whoever may be reading my warning, if you ever agree to a job that seems too good to be true, it is. My phone buzzed in my pocket. It broke the blissful silence I was in. There's no place more peaceful than the public library. My favorite part is the complete absence of noise. The mind is a beautiful place. I love hearing my thoughts. And being in medical school doesn't leave a lot of room for doing such a thing. The constant studying and absorption of new information creates mental bricks that end up creating a wall around the creativity section of my brain. My mind is too busy focusing on learning that I can't focus on enjoying. That's why I love the library so much. Even if I'm doing schoolwork, knowing that there's hundreds of lives that I have yet to live sitting around me, waiting for me to open their pages, is so freeing to me. It makes me feel like I have control over my own life. I like that feeling. I took my earphones out and reached into my pocket before wrenching my phone out from my jeans. It was a call from my boss. Good afternoon, Mr. Clothorn, I said after clicking the answer button. Good afternoon, Atlas, he replied. We've just got a new offer from Kleinberg Realty. They've got a house on Quentworth Avenue that needs to be looked after. I didn't really enjoy taking care of houses before they were bought. It's always given me the creeps, but hey, to get a lot of easy money as a starving medical school student... That's an offer I wouldn't give up for the world. Sorry, sir. What was the address? I replied. 19 Quentworth Avenue. He stayed in. Please move in tomorrow. Quentworth Avenue? I replied in confusion. I live near there. No house has been built there within the past decade. Yes, it's a rather odd case. No one knows who built it. What? Sorry, sir, I must have misheard you. I thought you said that they don't know who built it. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. The house was reported there last week. No one lives in it, and no one had noticed its presence until then. There's no registry of the house, which means that we don't know what company built it. I sat there for a second, staring into dead space. How can no one know who built it? How can a house have just appeared only minutes away from my apartment? I would have noticed on my way to the library. I've been coming here my entire life, which means I know the journey here. There's something that would have caught my attention. Kleinberg Realty have somewhat adopted it, in a sense. Filled a registry under the company name. Now the house belongs to them, and they've instructed me to get a caretaker to move in tomorrow. Pack your things tonight. I'll send you the details later. Okay, Mr. Clawthorn. Have a good day, sir. You too, Atlas. He hung up the phone. I sat there for a second, thinking about my plan for the night. I was to be living full-time in a random house for an unknown period of time. 
That's just what my job entails. But who's going to want to buy a house that has no original registry? Who's going to want to buy a house with no known creator, no known age, no known past residencies, and no known origin? That night I fell asleep with everything I need for this day. I packed clothes, toiletries, and entertainment. Let's hope it's not as creepy as the old abandoned loony bin on the hill. Fort Wright Asylum. I thought. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I woke up bright-eyed at 6 o'clock that morning. I've always been a morning person. It's one of my better qualities. I started to drive to the house, completely unsure of what was to come. My phone buzzed in my pocket. I pulled it out and saw it was an email from my boss. I'd been looking forward to learning a little bit about the house beforehand, just for peace of mind. Siri, read out this email. I said aloud. Good morning, Atlas, she chimed. Thank you for your patience. Here is all of the known information on the residency you will be taken care of. It's a four-bedroom, two-bathroom home built in an unknown area. My stomach dropped. The builders and history of the house are both unknown. Good luck. I sat there with my mouth agape. How could so little be known about the origins of this house? I pulled up to the house. It was really nice, but there was something so wrong with it. I'd driven past this land most days for the majority of my life. Never had I seen this lot occupied. It had always been vacant. I stepped out of my car, pulled the keys out of my pocket, and walked up to the door. I pulled the door open and glared inside. Again, a very nice house. Old, but modern. Small, but big. I walked around the house accommodating myself for maybe ten minutes before I set myself down on the couch and turned on the TV. That's how I spent most of my time if I wasn't studying. Slowly, the world around me faded, and I fell asleep. I'd survived the first night at 19 Quentworth Avenue. Several days had passed. Nothing interesting at all had happened, other than several mice I'd found living in the property. It was when I was going to bed on the fourth night that I noticed a sticker on the bottom of the counter. That's odd, I thought. I pulled the sticker off of the marble countertop and held it under my phone light. It ran. Night 4 and Co. I'd never heard of such a thing. I sat down on the couch and pulled out my laptop before looking up Night 4 and Co. on the internet. After I'd clicked enter, I was shocked to see that nothing came up, except for one lonesome website. A website that was titled Inquiries of Humium Masonry. I clicked on the site on instinct. After several painstaking seconds of slow internet and buffering, a page pulled up. Page not found. Thoroughly disappointed, I shut my laptop and made my way to my bedroom. The next morning I texted my friend Aisling. Aisling had been my friend since primary school. I asked him if he wanted to join me and get some coffee that morning, to which he replied with an emphatic yes. Although I did care about seeing him again, the prime reason for meeting up with him was to inquire about whatever Humium was, and whether he knew anything about the business Night 4 and Co. How did I know he'd have the answer? He was studying stonemasonry in college. After we'd caught up, taken our seats, and ordered our coffee, I propped the question. So, last night, I noticed a sticker on the bottom of the marble countertop on the house I'm looking after at the moment. There's no formal registry on the house, which means that no one knows when or how it was built. So, I looked up the company name on the sticker, and it came up with only one thing. A broken website that mentioned a material called Humium, which I'm guessing is what the marble countertop is made of. Can you give me a little detail about when or if Humium was popular in housing? Aisling sat there for a moment with a bleak expression on his face. 
I learned about humium on the first day I started studying stone masonry. Someone asked about it in my college lecture. Humium was a type of marble discontinued in 1962 because any people living in a home that had it for more than a week were found so severely scarred and traumatized by something unknown that they could no longer speak. People couldn't connect it to Humium, but that was the only thing in common between the 18 houses that the victims of it were found. I sat there in shock. But that doesn't make sense. People were found scarred and traumatized in their houses because of a countertop. The problem was global. There was absolutely nothing in common between each of the 18 houses other than the fact that they were all recently built and that Humium had been installed nearly a week to the day before. I sat there in silence, contemplating the information. It's dangerous material, my friend. In the construction industry, it's somewhat of equal to saying Macbeth before a show in the theater. According to my college professor, it's less and less known nowadays. People have been trying to keep it on the down low to stop people freaking out. It's never been used in any construction since. It's literally impossible that it was found in your house, man. Maybe you dreamt it. You always talk about how caretaking for new houses exhausts you. I wasn't listening. All I knew was that what I saw was real. If that material was discontinued after 1962, then the only possible explanation is that the house comes from before that year. As soon as I got home that morning, I immediately sat down on the couch and opened my laptop to do my own research on Humium. As soon as I looked it up, endless articles from decades earlier propped up on my feed. Most of them were photos of old newspaper articles from the late 50s and early 60s. I clicked on the top one. Yesterday at 19 Whitworth Avenue, a family of four were found paralyzed and petrified inside of their own home. Reports from the neighbors had stated that they hadn't seen them out of the house for several days. Each of the four members were found crouched in the same corner of their living room, with a stationary and chronic look of petrification upon their faces. So far, none of them have uttered a single word since they were found. What could have happened? I clicked on another link dated several weeks after the initial article. The family of four found petrified in their own homes nearly a month ago have shrunk in numbers. After 30-year-old Roman Delting hung himself and his children using bed sheets from their hospital wing, the mother of the two was moved to an asylum. Nurses and doctors of the hospital had stated that their mental state was worsening, and it would benefit her and the others around her if she were sent to a psychological treatment center. After reading that, an answer propped into my head, something I'd been looking for this whole time. A solution. I clicked out of that article and sorted my search from the most recent. I clicked on an article dated merely 10 years earlier. The famous Whitworth horror story continues with 81-year-old Agnes Delting, who still resides in Cell 19 in Fort Wright Asylum nearly 50 years after the well-known mysterious event and death of her children and husband. That was all I needed to read. Fort Wright Asylum was a half-hour drive from where I lived. After an extremely intense and anxiety-inducing car ride there, I pulled into the parking lot and made my way into the asylum. To the complete opposition of my expectations, security was extremely lax. In fact, I didn't recall seeing a single guard on my way in. I kept walking through the asylum and I found the cell with the number 19 printed on the door. I cautiously opened it without knowing what was to be in front of me. After gauging the inside of the room, I let my guard down. In front of me was an extremely frail and old Agnes Delting, in a fetal position in the corner of her room. Agnes, do you mind if I have a chat with you? I didn't expect anything in return. It was public information that she hasn't uttered a single word since she was found in her home that night. After my expectations became a reality and I got no response, I turned to walk away. But as I walked away, I heard a horrific 
raspy voice come from behind me. You are too late. The hallucinations have started to set in. I turned to look at her, but she was gone. Slowly, everything around me began melting away. The process was so bright and I had to shield my eyes, which meant I couldn't observe exactly what was happening. After a few seconds, the brightness flamed out and I opened my eyes. I looked around me. Cobwebs and dust caked every inch of the now abandoned and moldy cell. Bricks were out of place, and the door behind me was off its hinges and on the ground. And then it hit me. My heart dropped. My blood ran cold. I was standing in the middle of the famously abandoned Fort Wright Asylum. I staggered out of the building. It was never real. The Agnes I'd seen there wasn't real. Nothing within that asylum was real. It was all a hallucination. I'd never felt so horrified in my life. It's a feeling I could never describe. I drunkenly opened my car door, turned on the car, and pressed my foot flat on the gas pedal. Barely conscious, I felt my phone buzz in my pocket. I picked it up. Atlas, yes, it's Mr. Clawthorn. We've just gotten intel on who the house was built by, a company called Night 4 and Co. My heart sank. I hung up the phone. I just drove. I didn't know where I was going. My vision blurred until everything faded to black. I woke up to bright lights and frantic voices. I opened my eyes slowly and surveyed my room. Doctors, nurses, my mom and dad, all in a hospital room. I looked at the door. Room 19. Oh my god, Atlas. My mom yelped. I'm so glad you're alive. I hugged my parents. For a moment, everything was okay. I was safe. I was never going near that house again. But in the corner of the room was Agnes. Curled up in a fetal position. Upon noticing her, I pushed my family out of my way and walked towards her. Agnes made her way out of the room and through the hallway. She entered a room at the end of the hallway. Room 19. I looked around. Every room in the hospital was labeled Room 19. She opened the door and I immediately followed her in. To my horror, there was nothing in the room. A complete absence of solid matter. Just void. What the fuck are you doing here? I yelled. I already told you. She said, it's too late. Everything went black again. I woke up upside down. My seatbelt was around my neck. I was back in my car, having rolled several times after hitting a tree. Someone pulled me out of the car. A paramedic. Cops surrounded the car. I had to get rid of that house before it was too late. 19 Quentworth Avenue. Destroy the house. Bulldoze it. I yelled. Sir, calm down. You've just been in a very serious accident. The paramedic responded. Bulldoze the house, please. I shouted to anyone who would listen. At least quarantine it. To prevent people from going inside. Sir, are you... But before he could finish, I'd already ran long out of earshot. I ran to the house and made my way inside. I don't know why. I don't know what I was thinking. I walked in to find Agnes and standing next to the counter. She stared at daggers at me. What you will be experiencing, she said, for the rest of your existence is an endless cycle of hallucinations that causes a person's physical body to enter a paralytic state. Well, their mind remains free. As she spoke, she pushed me into the corner of the living room. You, Atlas Elrod, are the 19th person to fall victim to the games of Night 4 and Co. I'm writing this on my phone. Friends and family have been trying to console me and snap me out of the state that they see me in for the past two hours. I've been responding, but they don't see anything. 
All they see is a frozen shell of what I once used to be. That's why we never thought the victim spoke. They did. We just couldn't see it. I'm writing this to call for help. Come and visit me and save me. You won't get a response, but trust me. On my end, I will be talking and reacting and breathing and existing. Help me.